My name is Anthony DePrinzio, and I'm one of the primary organizers for FEST 2020. I'm glad that you were able to join our conference virtually today and hope that you and yours are staying safe and healthy during these unprecedented times. 2020 marks the fourth year that we presented CESC and the second where we partnered with PRISM Group to bring you next generation breakthroughs in the blockchain and crypto industry. For those of you new to CESC, this annual conference showcases the latest developments in academic and commercial research related to the economic security aspects of open economic networks, including monetary policy, game theory, incentive design, mechanism design, among many others. Our amazing program committee has spent a great deal of time over the past year reviewing paper submissions and assembling some of the greatest minds in industry to share their cutting edge research with the community at large. We at CESC are very excited to share these developments and are elated that even with the current global situation, we are still able to follow up on our mission. And that mission is to advance developments in the blockchain and crypto industry by providing a platform for academics, researchers, and others to present their work. On behalf of our entire team, we'd like to thank you for your support and hope that you enjoy the conference. Without further ado, let's get the show on the road. Our first speaker of the day is the one and only creator of Ethereum, Vitalik Buterin. Vitalik doesn't need much of an introduction, but just a few quick points. Vitalik discovered Bitcoin in 2011, and that's when he got into the crypto space and shortly after developed the Ethereum protocol. Currently, Vitalik is leading the research group at Ethereum and is focused on making improvements to the protocol. So without further ado, we're glad to have you, Vitalik, and the stage is all yours. Okay, great. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, so today, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, kind of one of the uh, technical topics that's uh, been kind of fairly important uh, to a lot of the Ethereum research that we've been doing um, over the last couple of years. And I think a lot of the uh, developments that we're going to do in the next couple of years. Uh, so this is very relevant uh, to Ethereum 2.0, uh, though it's also a big part of uh, some uh, an effort called uh, Ethereum 1.x, which is a set of uh, kind of shorter term scalability upgrades uh, that we're uh, planning to add to the Ethereum protocol. And stateless clients are also a concept that's applicable far beyond Ethereum potentially to in Bitcoin or any kind uh, kind of blockchain. Um, in some cases, even systems that are not blockchain, though I probably will focus more on uh, kind of the blockchain and Ethereum context, at least for this presentation. Um, so start off with a couple of reminders. Uh, so we can think of uh, processing a block uh, in a blockchain as being a, a state transition function, right? So the idea here is that we think of this uh, kind of object that we call a state, where the state consists of everyone's balances. Um, in the case of Ethereum, things like a smart contract uh, code, smart contract storage, um, account public keys, basically all of the information that's needed to uh, process the transaction. Um, and then, a block uh, contains a bunch of transactions and processing a block basically means you take the some previous state, then you process a block and you get some new state, right? So like, for example, if the previous state is that Alice has 50 coins and Bob has 50 coins, the block has one transaction that transfers 10 coins from Alice to Bob, then your new state, state prime, is going to be uh, the state where Alice has 40 coins and Bob has 60 coins. Um, sometimes a block is not even valid in the context of a particular state. So like, for example, if the state is that Alice has 50 coins and Bob has 50 coins and you create a block where Alice gives Bob 100 coins and that block is not valid. But if the state had said that um, Alice has 100 coins, then the block would be valid, right? But we can kind of not talk about validity. We can just think about it in terms of transitions and in terms of what the current state is. So in um, Bitcoin, for example, there, the state is something that exists uh, kind of in the client, um, in the in, in the database. Um, so there is kind of the, the unspent uh, transaction output set. Um, 
but it's not kind of directly linked to in, blo in um, Bitcoin blocks or Bitcoin block headers. In the Ethereum case, uh, the state is stored in Merkle tree. Um, specifically, it's stored in what we call a hexary Merkle Patricia tree. And the root hash of the state is stored, and um, this a 32 byte hash of this entire data structure that contains all of the accounts, all of the storage, all of the storage keys. Um, the root of this is stored, basically stored inside of uh, the block header, right? So if you have the block header, then the block header contains a hash that, get, that gives you all the transactions. It contains a hash that gives you all the receipts. It, can, it contains the hash of the previous block, because that's how all blockchains work. And it contains this hash of the state. Um, only a small portion of the state gets read or written to in every block, right? So every block only makes a small number of modifications. The state is huge, the number of modifications is much smaller. Uh, and so the state does change, but the number of hashes that you need to recompute is that kind of much smaller, right? It's basically for every one update that you make, you only have to make a login uh, changes to the uh, um, this uh, state, the kind of hash data structure. And if a block reads one account, you only need login hashes because that's just a Merkle proof. So, Stateless clients, right? So a stateless client is a different kind of full client. Um, so this is a fully verifying client. So even if there's a 51% attack, um, there's no way that you can fool a stateless client into thinking an in, in, invalid chain uh, or an unavailable chain actually is valid. Um, but instead of the client holding the entire, like this entire set of everybody's balance of code and everything else, the client just holds the state root, right? The client just holds this 32 byte hash that represents the entire state. So if we think of the original state transition function, the state transition function that takes as input a state, uh, a block and outputs a new state, we can think of a stateless client as processing a kind of parallel state transition function where you have the state root, the block and the new state root. Now the block, by itself and the state root by itself don't give you enough information, right? So like for example, if uh, your block contains one transaction that transfers 10 coins from Alice to Bob, well, there's a whole bunch of different accounts in the state. The state root is just a 32 byte hash. So you can't just get that information from the state root and from the block. And, and so we add a witness. And a witness is basically the portions of the state that actually do get read and modified in that particular block along with Merkle proofs, right? And I'll, I'll talk later about how it could be different kinds of proofs as well, right? So basically, normal clients, it, it holds the state, takes in a block and modifies the state to get a new state. Stateless clients only holds the state root. It asks for a block plus a witness um, and it gives you a new state root um, or, or it updates the state root to store a new state root. Um, so benefits of this, right? One benefit is a uh, near zero initial state sync time, right? So if you have, say, the chain of block headers and you're willing to trust the chain of block headers, then you can start processing uh, and kind of verifying new blocks pretty much immediately. Um, clients can validate blocks out of order. So they could validate the latest block first and then move backwards, or they can only validate blo particular blocks if they hear a fraud proof or if they hear an alarm. Uh, so you don't actually have to, uh, like, process blocks in order of like first and then second and then third, because um, every block processing is just this uh, kind of function where all you have is just the, that you're plugging in is the, or that you're maintaining is this state root, you can kind of jump around and process blocks in whatever order you want. No disk access. So you don't need a solid state drive. It's, it's um, HDD friendly, um, fraud proof friendliness. So if you have stateless clients and you can also verify fraud proofs, and in an Ethereum 2.0 sharding context, uh, stateless clients are basically mandatory because nodes uh, get kind of rapidly reshuffled between different shards. So like one moment you might be on shard number 2047, then suddenly you get reshuffled to shard 45, and then almost immediately you have to verify a block from shard 45. And you just don't have enough time to download the entire state from shard 45. And so how would you verify it? Well, you would ask for um, a witness and you would verify it statelessly. So um, it's also uh, potentially more secure against uh, certain kinds of attacks, I mean, especially um, in cases where disks are fairly slow. So a lot of benefits. Some statistics, right? So 
Um, just for notation, we'll use N to refer to the to total size of the state. So this was the total number of accounts and contracts and storage slots and all, all of this stuff together. And K is the number of objects that get access in the blocks. So approximately speaking, in Ethereum blocks, N is around 2 to the 30, and K is around uh, 2 to the 10, right? So N is about a billion, K is about a 1,000. Um, the witness size, uh, so the size of the Merkle branches for all K of these objects, it's roughly in the objects themselves, plus these Merkle branches that have K times the log of N over K chunks, right? So if you're just proving one chunk, so if K equals one, then the witness size is the log N chunk, uh, where a chunk just means a hash, so it's 32 bytes. Um, but if you have more uh, than one branch, then you can make a bit of savings um, and you can kind of combine the parts of uh, the Merkle branches that are redundant with each other. And so instead of K times log N, it's K times log N over K. Um, in practice, it's about um, assuming a kind of optimal Merkle tree is about 600 bytes per access. Um, so this is just uh, plugging into this formula, um, assuming these numbers. And so witness becomes about 600 kilobytes. Um, there are grinding attacks on the Merkle tree. Uh, so basically, if you imagine an attacker just uh, generates a whole bunch of account addresses that are extremely close to each other and uh, sends like a very small number of coins to all of these addresses and then creates a, a transaction that tries accessing all of those addresses, then because you have a whole bunch of accounts really close together, but like the attacker could uh, kind of grind those addresses and instead of uh, the depth of the tree being uh, 30, the depth of the tree in that particular position could go up to say 60 or 80, right? So uh, grinding attacks could in the worst case expand this to maybe about 2000 bytes per access. So this is a roughly where stateless clients can uh, kind of get us uh, with the current technology. Um, the bad news is that the current Ethereum protocol has uh, kind of very mispriced gas schedules for this, right? So basically, the problem is that you can have a block that kind of does calls into a whole bunch of different accounts. The gas limit is 12 million. The gas cost of a call, including overhead, is 800. 12 million divided by 800 gives you 15,000 calls. And every call can call into a contract that has a really huge uh, 24 kilobyte code plus, plus uh, we don't even, right now, not, we're not even using an optimal workload tree. We're using a hex tree tree instead of a binary tree. So the witness is 3,000 bytes instead of uh, 600. So the total size is going to be 15,000 times 27,405 megabyte witnesses, which is just horrible, right? So there's um, a, a bunch of changes to this. Um, one of the important ones is code Merkleization. So we store the code as a Merkle tree instead of just this big, big chunk. Um, changes to needs to be more expensive than 800 gas and switching from a hexa tree to a binary tree. And so we can get to a situation where the worst case with this size is, is going to be a couple of megabytes. Now, so we have um, people that are actively working on some of these uh, changes. Um, and potentially, if all these things get implemented, it will actually be possible for a client that hasn't yet downloaded any state information, so a client that's just connecting for the first time to verify just any block in the blockchain um, with this extra witness size of average case about 600 kilobytes, worst case a couple of megabytes. Um, I'll also add here that uh, once again, stateless clients are not just an Ethereum thing. So in the Bitcoin context, there's something called a huge re-XO, which is basically a stateless client. Um, so a lot of uh, of broad interest in uh, this uh, in this kind of methodology. Um, challenge, right? So the problem is that 600 bytes average case, two kilobytes worst case is actually not that nice, right? Um, it's in 600 kilobytes, uh, like two to five megabyte witnesses, but right now Ethereum blocks are about 50 kilobytes. So can we try to bring the witness size down to something closer to the block size instead of being one to one and a half orders of magnitude larger than the block size. There's two paths to this. Um, one is um, snarking Merkle trees, and the other is vector commitments or polynomial commitments. A path is fairly easy to explain. It basically says that, okay, you imagine you have a witness that contains all of these Merkle branches, and you are just going to create a snark or a stark that proves that there exists Merkle branches for a bunch of values. 
So instead of providing Merkle branches directly, we provide a proof that just proves that these Merkle branches exist and they're out there. And if you do that, then you can replace all of these, most of these like, 600 data kilobytes, basically everything except for the values themselves with just one single short proof. If it's a, a Gros 16 snark 150 bytes, um, if it's a Flonk, half a kilobyte to a kilobyte, if it's a Stark, 50 to 150 kilobytes, still a huge improvement. Now, second approach, vector and polynomial commitments, right? So quick math overview. A uh, polynomial commitment is a special kind of hash of a, a polynomial. So a polynomial is this big thing. It has a whole bunch of coefficients. It can contain a lot of information. And we create this kind of hash of that polynomial where that hash has extra properties, right? So the, one of the main properties is that if you give uh, um, someone a uh, commitment of P and uh, you give them some coordinate Z, um, then or if, or rather, if the prover has the actual polynomial P and they have a coordinate Z, the prover can provide an opening proof Q. And if someone, the verifier has this opening proof, they can take that proof and they can use that to prove that P of Z actually equals A, right? So basically, if you have the hash of a, poly of a yeah, polynomial um, and you have this opening proof and you have which coordinate you're trying to prove, the verifier can actually verify that the polynomial at that coordinate actually equals that value. So you can use polynomial commitments as an alternative to a Merkle tree, right? So if you have a bunch of data, d is zero, blah, blah, d of n minus one, you can just represent that as a polynomial where the um, i element in the data just equals the polynomial evaluated at uh, point i, right? And it's actually very easy to construct polynomials like this. So um, you can use the Lagrange interpolation, uh, for example, I and mean, there's a lot of algorithms for this. Now, you might want to ask, well, why do we do this, right? And we'll talk about this. Um, first, very quick overview into kind of the two main families of polynomial commitments. Um, so case commitments, um, basically the idea here is that you have a trusted setup where you have, and this is all done with elliptic curve points, um, you have a secret number S, and your setup consists of a bunch of points, so we have the generator G, then you have G times S, G times S squared, G times S cubed, blah, 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 blah uh, all the way up to G times S to the D, and you have G2 times S, so this is in the, in the uh, G2 group. So the idea is basically that if you want to encode a polynomial um, that has some coordinates, you would basically um, take the first uh, coefficient multiplied by G, take the second, um, uh, you take the zero degree coefficient multiplied by G, you take the degree one coefficient multiplied by the points of G times S, and then the degree two coefficient multiplied by G times S squared. So what we're basically doing here, right, is that you're basically um, creating a point that equals G times um, the polynomial evaluated at S. Now, nobody knows S, uh, which is really important for security, right? That's the kind of toxic waste that you have to forget after you generate this trusted setup. But then the way that we prove, um, do an opening proof is basically if you want to prove that for some P, P of Z equals A, you prove, do it by proving that um, P of X minus A kind of has a zero at Z. And to prove that, you basically prove that X minus Z is a factor of a P of X minus A. And you do that by, well, providing P of X minus A divided by X minus Z, right? So if you can provide a polynomial such that you take that polynomial, then you multiply it by x minus z, um, so you, and then you add um, a, then you actually get your p of x, and this actually basically proves that this uh, p of x actually is a polynomial that equals um, a at this particular coordinate. And you can verify this equation with elliptic curve pairings, right? So you can basically, like here what we're doing is we're taking q, we're multiplying it by um, x minus z, um, or actually then we're subtracting A and we're basically checking whether or not you get P back. Um, um, Dinkrad, um, one of our researchers, recently wrote an article that goes into this in more detail, a lot of really interesting and great math. Um, Fry is another alternative. This is a purely hash-based uh, polynomial commitment scheme, so post-quantum secure, which is really nice, um, potentially faster to prove. The idea basically is that if you have a polynomial P, then you kind of define these two polynomials, evens and odds, 
um, that are basically one of them kind of captures only the even degree coefficients, the other captures only the odd degree coefficients. And so these are both a degree n over two polynomials in x squared. And then you just kind of randomly combine them together. And the idea is that if um, this procedure where you kind of split p in half and then you randomly combine the halves together, um, it has a degree n over two, then you know that p of x almost certainly has degree n. Um, and then you just kind of repeat this procedure recursively, right? And in order to check that kind of every step is equivalent to every next step, the prover just basically provides a whole bunch of Merkle branches and tries to prove that it's kind of true at almost, uh, or the equation is true statistically at almost all coordinates. Um, I, once again, I wrote some blog posts on Stark's very interesting topic, uh, or, or sorry, uh, including on Fry. Um, highly welcome people while trying to kind of learn more about this, but Zooming out again, basic summary, right, is that you can, in a whole bunch of ways, create this thing that's basically a just kind of hash of a polynomial that you give to someone, where you then have this ability to create these opening proofs that kind of prove that that polynomial equals a particular value at some particular position. Um, Multi-openings. So this is basically, we get to the point where we actually learn why uh, polynomial commitments are useful, right? So Let's say instead of wanting to prove one value, wanting to prove p of z equals a, we want to prove p of z i equals a i for a whole bunch of values, right? So you want to prove a whole bunch of values at a whole bunch of positions. You can do this with only one witness. Um, and the basic idea here is that instead of uh, kind of subtracting a and dividing by a polynomial that equals zero at one point, you kind of subtract an interpolant and an interpolant is this polynomial that equals the point that you want at all of the coordinates that you want. So uh, this interpolant is a, the degree less than k polynomial where evaluated at every zi actually gives you ai for every one, for every one of these coordinate pairs. And you per basically, if the, the reason why you do this is because if p equals um, ai at every zi, then p, because the interpolant equals a at every zi, p minus the interpolant is going to equal zero at every zi. And so p minus the interpolant is going to be a multiple of the smallest polynomial that um, equals, uh, z equals zero at every, at every zi, so that's z of x. So then you just have this the kind of one equation, and the verifier can just verify this one equation. right? So once again, zooming out, um, result of this is basically that Unlike Merkle branches, where you would need a separate Merkle branch for every value, with polynomial commitments, you can create this multi-opening proof, and you can prove a whole bunch of values um, that with basically just one witness, right? So you can see how this is a really valuable technology, potentially for making stateless clients better. Um, unsolved problem. Uh, so. One of the problems with uh, this scheme, unfortunately, is that um, Merkle branches are kind of have this a really nice property, or Merkle trees, which is basically that they're cheap to read, but they're also cheap to update, and it's cheap to update all the witnesses, right? So if you imagine a Merkle tree containing the entire state, then one value gets updated. Updating one value is cheap because you only have to update kind of login hashes walking up the tree from that value to the top. So this is like real, very nice for basically nodes that are trying to create witnesses. K commitments are terrible at this, right? Because if you have a polynomial and you update um, that polynom polynomial's evaluation at one coordinate, then that ends up changing every witness. That ends up changing every one of these like P minus something uh, divided by um, X minus some coordinate. So, and basically, the intuition is that uh, kind of you want, it seems as though we want to find some kind of mechanism for create, for generating these uh, witnesses where you want them to be kind of computable from data and some tree like structure, right? So you want them to be computable from data that kind of gets stored in some structure where uh, if you modify the data in one position, then you only need to make log n. I mean, we could potentially sacrifice a bit and say poly log n um, changes to the data and generating a witness. And so reading of what this kind of value also requires reading the data in a logarithmic or possibly poly log number of positions. So 
challenge. We still haven't yet figured this out. Open problem. And challenge two is the trusted setup size, right? So the Ethereum state already around two to the 30 objects. We probably want to budget for something like two to the 36. Trusted setups, we've done them up to two to the 28. And the bigger they become, the more inconvenient they become, and the more trusted they become, which is really annoying. Um, technique two, vertical trees. Uh, so vertical tree is basically just trees of, uh, po of vector commitments or just trees of polynomial commitments, right? So basically we kind of combine the two schemes together and we say, well, we're going to have, instead of having just a, a Merkle tree or just one polynomial commitment, we're going to have a tree of polynomial commitments. And so if you want to prove one element, you would basically just provide that element. Then you would provide these kind of commitments that are in the middle. And then you'd have to provide a proof that the element is a member of the first commitment, then a proof that the first commitment is a member of the second commitment, then a proof that the second commitment is a member of the third commitment. And so the witness, instead of being, say, 32 hashes long, the witness might be two points, so it might be, say, 96 bytes per element. Um, cost of updating witnesses minimal. Cost of generating proofs. Um, you need, it turns out, like, if you have uh, each of these polynomial commitments has depth of 1,024, then uh, it's uh, 1,024 times K field operations. And it turns out mm, you only need um, just 1,024 curve operations. The verification costs, K pairings, if you do it naively, which is actually kind of expensive, but with some extra work, you can push it down to three pairings, right? So this is another kind of recent approach that we've uh, tried to take to just cutting down the witness sizes. It's not perfect. Uh, so you still have like about 96 bytes per element, but that's still much less than, you know, 600 bytes or even more in the worst case. And then technique three is just a snarking Merkle trees, as I mentioned, right? So you basically just make a snark that proves that um, there's a whole bunch of Merkle branches that prove some specific set of values. Um, the benefit is that this is a kind of overlay onto a Merkle tree. And so there's no sacrifices in uh, kind of witness updating, for example. Another benefit is that it's quantum safe. Um, it's a recent numbers from Starkware with their uh, kind of new special purpose hash function, they can prove 10,000 hashes per second, which would be about two seconds to compress an Ethereum block witness. So actually quite <clears throat> within the range of viability. And um, that's on, a, I, I believe, a uh, either four, eight, or a, a basically a fairly powerful laptop, by the way. Uh, so very w well within the range of consumer hardware. Two seconds to generate a proof. Um, so seemingly, and Right. And um, also the other is this other uh, recent idea that we've had um, that um, some researchers have proposed around using this protocol called GKR, um, which basically tries to reduce the cost of hash verification down to three constraints per hash plus a bunch of field operations. So like very, very cheap hash cal calculations. So summary, I guess. Um, Stateless clients are great. Uh, stateless clients can solve a lot of problems. They can solve very big problems in terms of um, the amount of storage that um, Ethereum nodes require. Um, and so they allow Ethereum clients to sync um, pretty much instantly. They um, allow a kind of different, sy different syncing and verification strategies. They, they open up uh, kind of this entire full trade-off space that's kind of somewhere in between light clients and full clients. Um, they can work uh, without uh, needing um, like power, like disk, a lot of disk space or a lot of disk access. And there's a bunch of fancy arithmetic techniques that allow us to uh, kind of cut these uh, witness sizes down to the point where kind of the extra data that stateless clients need to download is actually not that much. But still research and still a kind of a lot of refinement required. And this is something where, you know, we actively welcome more kind of input and help from the um, academic research community. So thank you. And thank you very much, Vitalik. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just a very quick shout out to everybody. Thank you for joining us. We are at CESC. 
fourth day, obviously headlining and starting the day off is Vitalik. I hope everybody um, enjoyed his presentation and everybody enjoyed him sharing his thoughts, especially all around the uh, different techniques and everything. Um, we're just going to go into a very short Q&A. We're going to have a look at the questions. Vitalik, if you can hear me, um, I think the first question everybody wants to know, we're getting this quite a little bit. Um, is there anywhere we can share? Are you going to share the slides anywhere? Is there anywhere where people can have a look at the slides after the presentation? Uh, sure, I'll be happy to. I mean, I'll, I'll tweet them right after um, we uh, finish this. How about that? Nice. All right. Yeah, you're getting a lot of thanks from everybody. Um, the next question which we have is from actually one of our viewers um, within Brella. And John here asks, uh, what are your thoughts on the Ethereum Bitcoin bridges like Keep Network? Uh, do you think they actually benefit the Ethereum community in any way? I'm, I think Ethereum Bitcoin bridges are really valuable, and I've, I've said that many times myself. I think um, I mean, the main challenge in some of these bridges is basically kind of trust minimization. So we want to um, avoid uh, kind of creating trusted intermediaries that end up kind of holding hundreds of thousands of uh, people's Bitcoins where it ends up not being clear how secure they actually are. Uh, so I know there's efforts that are trying to do this, like I know TBTC is trying to do this and there's some other projects that are trying to do this, uh, but, you know, still more work required. Hope it keeps going well. Yeah. Um, I think one question, and thank you for the answer as well. Um, I'm going to jump, I'm going to skip uh, one question. It's a timeline question. I think we get that quite a bit. Uh, we're going to move on to something a little bit more since we're talking about the development side of things. Um, Curious question from Edward here, again, inside Brella as well, uh, where essentially the event is streaming. Uh, what's your current involvement on the development side of the protocol? Um, and I think the main question is that, are you more focused on research side or are you more focused on the development side right now, um, or still both? I mean, I've definitely always been more focused on the research side and kind of the earlier um, half of the pipeline, um, though I do think that Ethereum 2.0 has made like, a lot of huge progress uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Just, and like you can clearly see how it's moved from being a research project to being a development project, right? Like we now have the Altona multi-client test network and we're going to have phase zero uh, kind of coming out on mainnet fairly soon. So ETH2 is by its, itself has definitely switched from being a research task to being a development task. And so, you know, in terms of what that means, I'll end up being focused on, and I, there's there's definitely still some things, but it's more kind of a bunch of things in different places, I guess. Hmm, interesting. Actually, since you're talking about ETH2, um, Edward actually has a follow-on question. For a couple of people, um, I think we get that quite a bit, but um, you know, for the sake of the audience, I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, can you maybe elaborate, especially after this presentation, can you elaborate a little bit more um, about the mixed milestones in, in Ethereum, um, and maybe a timeline for Ethereum 2.0. Um, I know you've talked a lot about this already, uh, but I think let's answer the question for everybody's benefit of milestones in the next six months, basically for the rest of 2020. Sure. Uh, so right now on the Ethereum 2.0 side, we obviously already have the Altona multi-client test network, which is the kind of running with mainnet parameters. In a few weeks, um, we expect to launch another test network, um, and that test network will just have some uh, kind of updates in terms of like basically the user experience will be uh, kind of be basically the same as um, we plan it to be on main and in, um, in basic basically every way and a couple of uh, kind of fairly small upgrades. Uh, so one more test network. Um, if the test network runs smoothly for some amount of time, the next milestone is um, of course. Ethereum to phase zero launch on mainnet. Um, and that's uh, the, um, definitely looking within the six month window. Um, and then after that, I and mean, there's obviously phase one, but phase one, um, which um, includes uh, not just a proof of stake, but also like starts doing glue charting for data. That's looking definitely outside of the six month window at this point. Outside of ETH2, I think it's also important to mention um, First of all, ETH 1.x, uh, so a stateless clients, uh, kind of di different state management strategies, um, kind of shorter term Ethereum upgrades. And 
on continued ongoing work, some things coming in the next six months, some things not. So that's a kind of parallel track. Also layer two protocols. Uh, so we have ZK rollup um, already, right? So on mainnet, we have loopring and, and we have ZK sync. Um, and those are rollups uh, for a trans. Loopring is a decentralized exchange and does payments. Uh, ZK sync does payments. Mm. And so those two can both do, well, rollups in general can do theoretically up to somewhere around 2,000 to 300,000 uh, transactions per second um, on the Ethereum network. And that's a kind of load that's theoretically achievable today if everyone uh, switches to these rollups. Uh, mm -hmm. So, but the weakness of ZK rollups right now is that they're only good for like a very small number of specific use cases. So, Payments and token transfers and DEX is like probably the biggest ones. But if you want like general purpose EVM smart contracts, you probably want to look at optimistic rollup. And optimistic rollup, it's uh, definitely looking very hopeful that we'll see optimistic rollups with a, in, a, in a six month window as well. So carefully watch the teams that are doing that too. Mm. Okay, so I think since we've just asked the question, uh, somebody has asked about the question. Um, John. John actually and, and um, a couple of people also have a follow-up question. Uh, I'm just going to kind of like mesh all the entire question uh, together given that we've got about eight minutes left uh, in the Q&A. Um, is there, uh, first question is, is there a definitely a proof of stake for Ethereum 2.0? And I think the full-on question to that as well is um, when we talk about proof of stake, the other question is, um, is there any interest to adopt a wider range of uh, supported curves for ETH2 uh, to allow additional functionality? Um, so for question two, by curves, you mean like elliptic curves? Yes. Okay, so for the first question, yes, Ethereum 2 is a proof of stake system and Ethereum 2 phase zero is kind of the start of uh, Ethereum's uh, switch to proof of stake, which will take multiple stages, but um, phase zero launching is the first stage. As for multiple curve support, there are EIPs that are in progress to add support for more curves. Um, the basic challenge is that it's a kind of trade-off of, I guess, functionality versus, I guess, complexity. Um, so the existing, I mean, there is a lot that you can already do even within uh, just, um, you know, the BN128 curve that's uh, supported on Ethereum already. Mm -hmm. But if we support other curves, then you can do a kind of depth two and potentially depth three, a kind of recursive snarks. Um, and there's a lot of value in those kinds of constructions, especially if you want to get privacy and scalability at the same time which is something that like, for example, I know Aztec has uh, been doing a lot of hard work on. Uh, so I d definitely, it's, um, it's something that we are uh, kind of working towards. It's just a question of priorities at this point, right? Like I think the main reason not to focus on it is basically just because like people really want scalability and they really want ETH2 and they want kind of relief from high transaction fees and so forth. And so, like those things are definitely higher priority to for us than uh, kind of supporting so uh, like kind of advanced um, elliptic curves in more optimized ways. But yeah. like we have a, a large team, and there's uh, pe there's that people that have been very actively pushing that forward as well. Nice. Um, so kind of a fun question right now. Um, I think when it comes to Ethereum, uh, something that's been getting quite a bit of buzz in the last one month is actually the Reddit competition, uh, which I'm definitely sure you're aware of. Um, the question everybody is asking right now is that there is, um, you know, how's the competition going? Do you think, um, you know, in your personal opinion, there will be a submission that meets all the requirement deadlines, uh, all the requirements uh, by the month end deadline for the Reddit competition? What are your thoughts on that one? Um, I think so. And so I think, um, I mean, Kind of theoretically speaking, right? Reddit's um, current use of uh, tokens is, um, are, and or what they want to do on Ethereum is fairly simple, right? And it feels like it's something that you can describe entirely in terms of token transfers, which is really nice because it basically means that if they want to, they can design their entire thing on top of ZK rollup, and so it could be ready even today. Um, but and I know there's other solutions as well. So I'm definitely just looking forward to seeing what kind of uh, submissions people end up coming up with. 
Mm. Is, is, do you think um, probably in the short term, meaning that next uh, one to two months, that's one of the things that you're probably most excited about? Um, or is there any other things people should you know, keep, uh, keep an eye on out there? There's so much going on in the human space right now. So things that I'm excited about, um, Ethereum 2 Phase 0, definitely, um, ETH 1.x, definitely, um, and including, you know, EIP 1559 and all of that stuff. Mm. Um, rollups, uh, ZK rollups and optimistic rollups. Um, better privacy tools is um, another one that's coming. Uh, so I think those are probably the big ones, but I mean, there's a, a whole bunch of different things coming down the pipeline. Actually, talking about the ZK rollup, do you really think it's uh, probably one of the most uh, promising approaches? Um, in the long term, yes. Um, so in the long term, kind of the benefit of ZK rollups over optimistic rollups is that because ZK rollups rely on snarks instead of uh, fraud proofs, you don't need to have like the, the waiting period for fraud proofs. So you don't need to have a one week withdrawal period, um, which is um, bit really nice for uh, basically usability. Um, so that's a, a big benefit that I see for, for uh, ZK rollups. And then also, of course, you just don't have to worry about kind of infrastructure as much. And you don't have to worry about, you know, the risk that there will be just totally no one watching for, for watching for fraud and some fraudulent transaction will slip through. The main challenge with Optima with uh, ZK rollups, of course, is that it's you can make a zk snark without not that much difficulty for a kind of very structured specific applications but making a zk snark for general purpose computation is much more difficult um but you know, it, that is i think kind of the next major frontier that a lot of people are going to actively move towards mm. All right, uh, we're almost out of time, so I'm just going to wrap things up very quickly. Um, we are now, especially for people uh, like myself, uh, we essentially are a you know, blockchain event organizer. We obviously uh, keep our ears very close to the ground, and that's why we're very, very honored and very, very happy to have a you know, person like you and all our other speakers join us within the times, uh, which is by Blockshow and San Francisco Blockchain Week. Um, I kind of have a question for you out of fun, uh, something the team was discussing and kind of like asking me to ask this. Um, given that we're all now in the online conference world, um, interested in doing, I know, like one fine day, if we were to do maybe like a, a live, con instead of a live conference, it's a live development or a live developer workshop, live hackathon, um, which, you know, we'll get you in to read it. You know, is there something you're game for? Is there something you'd be interested in? I mean, maybe. Um, <laughs> I guess, you know, it depends what it is, depends what the format is, and definitely happy to participate in things. Yeah, mm. I know. Yeah, I kind of got paused in there. Anyway, um, thank you very much um, for everyone watching. Um, thank you as well for staying with us. Uh, we've got a long day ahead. Uh, for all of you who are looking for Vitalik's uh, presentation, uh, he'll be tweeting it out uh, slightly later. For those of you who have maybe joined us a little bit late, um, especially for myself, I'm in Singapore right now, so it's nearly 1 a.m. Um, and may miss certain parts of the Crypto Economic Security Conference, including Vitalik's uh, presentation that happens earlier. We will essentially be putting it on demand in the Brella platform within the next 24 hours uh, from now. Right? All you need to do is to go to unitize.online. If you don't have an account, sign up for it. Um, if you already have one, uh, just go into the schedule and click past content. You will be able to see Vitalik's presentation by tomorrow. Vitalik, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much for your time. And for everybody else, we will be back with you shortly with Alessandro Chiesa's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.
It started simple. A token, a symbol of hard work, of skills, for trust between people. Money was meant to be exchanged for things created and services provided. It takes many forms, both plain and shiny, honoring leaders of the past and those leading us into the future. Somewhere we lost our way. People wage wars over it, big and small, concerned more with growing interest on $244 trillion in debt than growing communities. And many people are left out, 1.7 billion invisible, left behind and underserved. But what if money were more accessible to everyone? A universal symbol for essential needs, for empowerment and connection. People, communities, entire countries prospering. What if money were all of this? What if money were beautiful? Thanks for those insights, Vitalik. It's always great to see what research you're working on every year, and we're super excited to see how things progress moving forward. Our second speaker of the day is Professor Alessandro Chiesa. Professor Chiesa is a faculty member in computer science at UC Berkeley. He conducts research in complexity theory, cryptography, and security. He is a co-author of several ZK SNARK libraries and is a co-inventor of the Zero Cash Protocol. More recently, he has also co-founded co Starkware Industries and Zcash. In this talk today, Professor Chiesa will explain what it actually means to recurse a snark, why it matters, and what approaches are known to achieve this efficiently. Thanks for coming today, Alessandro, and the stage is all yours. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alessandro Chiesa. I am a faculty member in computer science at UC Berkeley. I am also a co-founder of Starkware and of Zcash. Uh, in this talk, I would like to give you an introduction to recursive snarks. Uh, I will uh, provide a warning right away that uh, this talk is uh, going to be technical. And uh, the goal of this talk, or at least the motivation of this talk, is that in the last couple of years, there has been uh, increasing uh, interest uh, in recursive snarks in the applied and open source community. So I thought that uh, uh, with this talk, uh, it could be a good opportunity to uh, talk about, uh, about some of the science that underlies recursive snarks. So let's get started. First, let's uh, start with uh, the obligatory uh, slide on snarks. So like, to algorithms, prover, and the verifier. The verifier knows a circuit C and an instance X, an input. And the prover wants to prove to the verifier that uh, they know a witness W that makes the circuit on input X and W, let's say, output 1. The key property of a snark is that the proof for convincing the verifier is very small. Specifically, it is exponentially smaller than the size of the circuit, that means logarithmic in it. And more precisely, it is polynomial in the security parameter and logarithmic and polylogarithmic in the size of the circuit. Also, many of you know that uh, SNARGs uh, are impossible unless there are suitable public parameters. This is something that is known as the setup of the proof system. And uh, uh, many of you are probably familiar with the fact that SNARGs have different types of setup. I will not really 
to discuss these things in the stock, we just be aware that that is the case. Okay, so this is so we have some common language and notation. That is a snark. I would like to now motivate the notion of recursion uh, with respect to snarks. So let's use an example. And specifically, suppose that you want to prove the iterated execution of a function f. So that means that you have some integer t, and you want to prove that if you, let's say, apply f iteratively to the input 0, so f of f of f of f, t times, you get some output zt. OK? So one way to prove that is something that we could call the monolithic option. You invoke the snark to prove all t executions at once. Now, this can be done. Uh, however, it has some uh, drawbacks. First, uh, this may actually be infeasible. The memory consumption of prover algorithms in many snark constructions actually grows linearly with t. So for sufficiently large t, there just won't exist a machine that will be able to uh, do this, even though maybe you're willing to wait long enough. Also, the value t may not be known in advance. Maybe this iterated uh, application of the function is just some ongoing computation, and there is no specific t that you have in mind. So this motivates an alternative, the so-called recursive option. And here the intuition is that what you want to do is you want to prove one execution of f and also the correctness of the prior proof. In picture, it would look something like this. You use the snark to argue that one application of f to 0 leads to some intermediate output, say, z1. And in the second step, you apply the snark again to prove that you can go from z1 to z2 through f. But also, you prove that you verified the prior snark. So now this second proof actually attests to the correctness of z2 being f of f of 0. And you can continue in this fashion as long as you want. And the point here is that through this recursive option, you're able to overcome both of the above drawbacks in that there is no large memory consumption. You're just iteratively applying the snark prover on some smaller computation of size f. And you can keep doing this as long as you want without knowing t in advance. So hopefully, these pictures uh, point to the difference between monolithic and recursive option. And what I would like to address now is, you know, is this option secure? Is it efficient? To even start asking these questions, uh, we need to discuss what is the goal of recursion? What do we obtain when we recurse things? And one way to do that is through a cryptographic primitive that is known as incrementally verifiable computation. In more detail, an IVC scheme for a predicate omega. And so where does this predicate come from? We're talking about a function f. Well, for example, you can think of the predicate to be the predicate that controls valid transitions. So the predicate says you can transition from output zi minus 1 to zi, possibly facilitated through some weakness, if the function given the previous output and some weakness outputs zi. OK, so there's some abstract predicate that models what are valid transitions, for example, transitions according to f. OK, an IVC scheme is also tuple, like a snark, consisting of a prover and a verifier. But now the properties it satisfies are kind of tailored to the setting of recursion. So now let's try to go through them. Uh, there are some cryptographic properties. The first one is functionality. Essentially, it says that you can always make progress. It says, if you give me some data that constitutes a valid transition, so you have zt and zt minus 1 make the predicate omega happy, possibly through some witness wt. And the IVC predicate says that the prior output and the prior proof are good. Then you can produce a new proof for the new output using the IVC prover in such a, in a way that will produce an output that the IVC verifier will accept. OK? Functionality says that if you want to prove true things, you can make progress in this recursion. Efficiency says that you know, you're not allowed to just remember all the prior inputs, all the prior proofs, and just satisfy the functionality definition. It says you have to do something non-trivial. In particular, you want to restrict the cost of each progress, each step, and the size of each proof in each step to be independent of t. So for example, you could make it depend, say, on the size of the predicate, ideally even less than that. But this, for example, rules out trivial approaches. 
And last one, but least, not least, you want this to be secure. And intuitively, this means that if you have some malicious prover that says, hey, here I have some claimed output ZT and a proof by T, and the IVC prover says, yeah, this proof looks good, then it is because the prover knows witnesses, W1, W2, and so on and so forth, that lead to T valid transitions from the beginning. So you can go from Z1 to Z2 through some weakness validly, for example, through the function F, from Z2 to Z3, and so on and so forth. In other words, there is some valid sort of line computation that leads to ZT in T steps, okay? So these at high level are the proper an IVC scheme. And you can see that the syntax and uh, sort of whatever we wrote here is tailored to model this uh, sort of uh, incremental, uh, uh, sort of incremental verifiable computation. That's why it's called like that. Um, there's also another cryptographic primitive that uh, uh, um, we consider in cryptography that is known as proof current data. It is essentially a sort of generalization of incrementally verifiable computation that considers predicates that have multiple inputs. So, oopsie. Um, multiple inputs. So in this case, the predicate would receive a, not just one prior output, but multiple prior outputs. And you can think of this visually as, instead of computations that evolve over a line graph, our computa uh, they are computations that evolve over a directory cyclic graph, okay? The point of this slide was to tell you that in cryptography, we have primitives that capture the desired functionality and security of recursive snarks. And these are the, the primitives. Now these primitives and their own, they have applications. That's why we study them. Uh, one we, was already known a few years ago was that actually, if you achieve some form of recursion like PCD, you can actually obtain IVC for long chains. And this in, itself, in turn implies snarks with extremely good space complexity. Uh, to this day, we don't really know many other approaches to obtain snarks with good space complexity. Um, you can also obtain snarks for map-produced computations, where proving is itself a map-produced computation. And perhaps closer to blockchains, you can use IVC to construct verifiable delay functions, and also for succinct blockchains, uh, which have applications to ultralight clients. So in this talk, I will not uh, spend further time on applications. Uh, here are some references that we can uh, use to kind of look up these and uh, uh, these applications. There are actually more. Uh, but suffice it to say that uh, IVC and PCD are very powerful primitives, and uh, you know, that's why people are excited about them. Uh, but we have these are powerful primitives, and one thing is to define them, a different thing is to construct them. So how can you achieve IVC and PCD from SNARKs? So this leads me to the, uh, I guess, uh, the main part of the talk, which is I want to uh, summarize the foundations of what we know about how to construct IVC and PCD. Um, and specifically, I want to start by zooming in into the core of the construction of IVC, which is where you use the SNARK prover to prove that the SNARK verifier has accepted and also that the uh, predicate has been satisfied. In other words, we want to kind of transform a SNARK scheme into an IVC scheme, OK? The core of the construction is to define a computation that we're going to call it R. R stands for recursive. It is going to check that a new output satisfies the IVC predicate omega. Again, omega is, you can think about it as the transition function f. And that the prior output and proof satisfy the SNARK verifier. In pseudocode, it would look something like this. You have an instance ZT and some auxiliary witness aux t. And this computation will check that uh, there is a valid transition from ZT minus one to ZT. And moreover, if you're not in the base case, that the prior output is accompanied by valid proof. And notice here that this computation is recursive because the, in line three here, we have the code of the computation appearing inside the computation itself. Um, why? Because you know, we'll be making proofs about R, we'll not verify things about R at the same time. Now this looks circular, uh, and uh, I will not linger right now on how you, you can make this well-defined, but let's say that it is well-defined. Um, if you can make it well-defined, then the IVC prover and IVC verifier 
um, follow rather straightforwardly from the construction of R. Specifically, if you want to uh, obtain the IVC prover from the IVC from the SNARK prover, it would look something like this. The prover would first assemble the, cons the computation R from the predicate omega and the verifier V from the SNARK. It will assemble the witness and invo invoke the SNARK prover to produce a proof for the next step. And the IVC verifier will similarly construct the computation R from omega and V, and it will use the SNARK verifier to verify the uh, uh, sort of new proof relative to the new output. So syntactically, this is roughly how constructing IVC looks like uh, from a SNARG. Uh, okay, but this is just uh, kind of uh, uh, putting together some pseudocode, you know, is it secure? So this brings us uh, to a theorem from now seven years ago that says that if the SNARG is a so-called adaptive argument of knowledge, i.e. a SNARK, that's what the K in a SNARK stands for, for argument of knowledge, then the IVC scheme is secure, secure according to the definition I sketched in the prior slide. Moreover, if the SNARG has so-called succinct verification, this means that checking a proof for a circuit requires much less time than, uh, this, and, than uh, evaluating the circuit itself. Then the IVC scheme is efficient in the sense that we defined earlier. And here the intuition for why you need succinct verification in the construction that we saw in the prior slide is that if that is the case, then the recursive circuit R doesn't grow with each step, which you don't want, right? You wanna be able to have a sustainable, kind of a, 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 be able to recurse an unbounded number of times. So this holds more generally for PCD schemes, which I didn't discuss. And in some, we know it has been proven that if you have a snark with succinct verification, then through recursion, you obtain IVC and PCD. This construction has actually um, a useful additional features. For example, it preserves zero knowledge in that if the zero SNARK is zero knowledge, so is the IVC or PCD scheme. Also, it maintains a type of setup. So if your SNARK has either a predictable or transparent setup, then this type of setup will just basically be unchanged after recursion. Okay, now, the hypothesis for security that the SNARG is an argument of knowledge is a strong requirement. However, fortunately, most SNARG constructions that we have basically already satisfy it. You need to kind of work hard to prove that it does, maybe you have to tweak the construction a little bit, but basically almost any natural construction that we have can be proved to be an argument of knowledge. Uh, less uh, convenient is the second uh, restriction, the one that we need to require that this SNARG has succinct verification. There are SNARGs with nice properties that have small proofs, but do not have succinct verification. So it would be nice to somehow relax this requirement. So this leads to uh, the next slide, which is uh, last year, in a very nice paper, it was observed that for recursion, you don't really need to require the SNARG verification to be succinct. Intuitively, for recursion, it should be enough to incrementally update a state that remembers the conjunction of a validity of past proofs. You don't want to literally check them. You just want to remember the end of whether they're all satisfied, okay? And then you can verify this conjunction outside the recursive circuit. In a more recent paper, this has led to the notion of SNARGs with accumulation, which allows us to expand the reach recursion to new constructions of SNARGs. And because this is a technical talk, I will actually attempt to explain what is a, an accumulation for a SNARG. So let's try to do that. Uh, we say that a triple PVD, that is a prover, verifier, and decider, is an accumulation scheme for a SNARG if several properties hold. The first one is, is functionality. Intuitively, it is we want to make progress. So we're going to fix a circuit an instance X and a snark proof pi, and then something known as an accumulator. In this case, this is the old accumulator. The goal of the accumulator will be to remember the conjunction of the validity of all prior proofs. And if the accumulation decider determines that the conjunction is one, and also the kind of new snark is valid, then 
it is possible to produce a new accumulator that kind of folds the new SNARG into the accumulator in such a way that the new accumulator looks like it was indeed produced from uh, uh, the previous SNARG and old accumulator. And the accumulation decider agrees that uh, 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 the new conjunction evaluates to one. Okay. So in other words, you have some accumulator, you can keep throwing into it new SNARG verifications in a way that at the end, you can check whether if there, any, if there ever was a um, SNARG that didn't verify, then the conjunction will evaluate it to zero. But if all of them were good, then it will evaluate to one. Efficiency here says that, again, you're not allowed to cheat. Like the sizes of things just depend, say, possibly on the circuit. But they're independent in the number of accumulations. And security says that if a malicious prover is able to somehow produce a new accumulator that is valid, and this new accumulator is properly produced from an old accumulator, then you can infer that because the new accumulator is valid, the old snark, I mean, the snark that was folded into the new accumulator is also valid, and the old accumulator is itself valid. So it lets you kind of travel into the past. This, that's why for security. So it is a bit of a mouthful, uh, but intuitively, the intuition is that we're not verifying SNARGs. We're going to remember the end of all the SNARGs we've encountered so far. Armed with this tool, we can now modify our paradigm. Rather than proving that the SNARG verifier has accepted, we're going to prove that the accumulation verifier has accumulated. So our new goal is we're going to obtain IVC from a SNARG with accumulation which is a more relaxed requirement than SNARK with 16th verification. Again, the code of construction is to define a recursive computation, let's call it R again, that checks that a new output satisfies the IVC predicate, like before, but now it will check that the prior output and proof were correctly accumulated. And here is the pseudocode for that. You see here we have added an accumulator in the instance for the circuit, which will remember the validity of all proofs, say for i less than t. And in here, the only difference is that instead of checking the SNARK verifier, we're going to check that a new accumulator is correctly derived from the old one. And given this recursive computation, the IVC prover and IVC verifier fall immediately. The IVC prover will assemble the recursive computation from omega and the accumulation verifier. It will construct, it will compute the new accumulator from the old one, and then it will pass these inputs to the SNARK prover who will produce the proof to pass along. Notice that we're passing along not just the proof, but also not just the new proof, but also a new accumulator. Why? Because in the IBC verifier, we're going to check that the new accumulator is valid and that the SNARK proof is valid. So this is syntactically uh, what happens, how you use accumulation. And in the same paper that introduced accumulation schemes, it was proved that if the SNARK, again, is an adaptive argument of knowledge, and the accumulation scheme is sound and secure in the way that uh, we saw in the prior slide, then the IBC scheme, IBC scheme is indeed secure. For an efficiency standpoint, we only need the SNARK to have accumulation. And crucially, we do not need the SNARK verifier or the accumulation decider to be succinct. All, the only thing we need is that the accumulation verifier, which indeed appears in the recursive computation, is succinct. So this holds more generally also for PCD. And we learned that SNARK with accumulation does lead to IVC and PCD. This type of recursion also preserves nice properties like zero knowledge and setup, like the prior one. Um, good. So we've discussed two types of recursion. I want to dedicate just one slide about post-quantum security because, you know, for the uh, long-term uh, security of uh, blockchains, eventually we're going to need not just post-quantum SNARKs, but also post-quantum recursive SNARKs, which means post-quantum IBC and PCD. Hopefully it is clear that if the SNARK itself is not post-quantum secure, then we have little hope of, <laughs> I mean, it's not going to be the case that anything we build from it is going to be post-quantum secure. So let's ask the question of, what if we start from a SNARK that is post-quantum secure? 
for example, uh, essentially any of the hash-based snarks out there are plausibly post-quantum secure. The main challenge to show that uh, after recursion, you obtain a scheme that is post-quantum is the fact that a malicious prover may be probabilistic. This doesn't sound so scary, but let me explain why uh, uh, probabilistic adversaries, probabilistic provers are problematic for recursion. Let's say you start with a malicious prover that outputs some claimed output ZT and proof pi T. In the proof of security for recursion, we're gonna apply the argument of knowledge property to obtain an extractor that produces a witness for the recursive computation statement. In particular, we'll obtain a prior output and a prior proof. From this extractor, we are able to produce a prior adversary that produces the prior output and prior proof, and it will have its own extractor and so on and so forth. In this way, we're able to prove security because we obtain the chain that led to ZT. But now we have a problem. How do we know that the prior output produced by the extractor ET and the malicious prover PT minus one are the same? We need them to be the same. Otherwise, we get this disconnected chain leading up to ZT. We need that connected chain. In the classical case, uh, this is easily fixed. We just fix the same randomness, the same random string for the extractor ET and the prover PT minus one. But for quantum security, there is no way to couple the random choices of ET and PT minus one. That is because quantum circuits can generate their own randomness by basically, for example, measuring a qubit in superposition. So there's kind of nothing to, to fix across the two. So this was studied recently and the solution that was uh, uh, used to study this was to rely on a, post -quant on a suitably defined post-quantum adaptive knowledge soundness that uh, can be achieved in certain conditions. And this was shown to suffice for recursion from succinct verification, the first type of recursion we saw, and recursion from accumulation, the second type of recursion that we saw. So that we have post-quantum foundations for recursion in both cases. Okay, so in summary, for the foundation part of this talk, uh, you know, there's a lot of snarks out there. Here's, for example, some names. We know from theory that SNARKs with succinct, succinct verification recurs. In fact, not just that, but in fact, all SNARKs with accumulation also recurs. And this, for example, includes constructions like HALO, which do not have succinct verification, but do have accumulation, which is great because it lets us recurs them. Okay, so that's all I really wanted to say about um, a foundations of recursion. Um, because many of you are, are sort of uh, uh, developers and practitioners, I wanna talk a little bit about practice because we wanna try to leverage this uh, understanding of uh, a, a recursion and, uh, turn and kind of turn this into something that can be used in practice. And the first thing when you are uh, somebody working recursion, the first thing you kind of uh, are faced with is the recursion is very expensive. First of all, even in standalone, standalone news, snark proving is expensive on its own, never mind recursively. It's just a heavy weight to, to get it primitive. But in recursive use, proving is only more expensive. And not just in a vague sense, but there are very concrete reasons for why proving recursively things is more expensive in IVC and PCD. So let me explain why. So here is a pseudocode for the two types of recursion that we saw in the foundations part of this talk. One problem is that you're gonna to have to prove the IVC predicate omega as part of this recursive computation. However, and I didn't really explain this, but you know, the way straightforward approaches to resolve the circularity, right? So we have R here and R here, right? So we have this apparent circularity. Straightforward approaches to uh, kind of uh, break the circularity actually incur um, schemes in which you will have to universally simulate the uh, IVC predicate omega, which is very expensive. What does universal simulation mean? It means that for every logical gate of omega, you're gonna have some set of gates to kind of you know, figure out what is the gate, what is it connected to, and just parse it. And it's gonna have like a multiplicative blow up in cost that is uh, a, 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 you know, rather impractical. Another thing that happens is that you're gonna have to prove this not verifier or the accumulation verifier 
within their cursive computation. And for reasons I'll mention shortly, straightforward approaches to express this type of computation in the SNARK's own language are prohibitively expensive. So there are two concrete reasons, each of which on their own make recursion expensive. And any practical solution for recursion is gonna to have to do, have some way to kind of address these. So let me tell you at high level uh, what uh, in the last few years you know, uh, we have developed as ways to cope with this. First, how do we cope with the cost of proving the IVC predicate omega? One approach to do that is through the feature of preprocessing. Some of you may have heard of the notion of preprocessing SNARKs. Essentially, that means that you have a procedure that's called preprocess that in an offline phase is able to take the desired computation, in this case, recursive circuit R, and produce from it some proving key for R and a short verification key for R that will be used by the SNARK verifier to check proofs about R. What this let us do, lets us do is that now we're actually able to define a recursive circuit by passing in this short verification key, for now it's generic, and including it where we will eventually want the verification key for R to be. So it's like some additional input to the circuit. And because it's short, the circuit can actually receive it as input. And later we will set this verification key to be verification, the short verification key for R. So that actually it would be possible to pass to R a cryptographic, a short cryptographic summary of itself to use inside it. Now I will not get into the technical details, but it, one can prove that for any preprocessing snark, the cost of proving a recursive step for the reasons that I just described is essentially the same as the cost of proving omega standalone. So one way to conceptualize that is as follows. Let's say that I want to compare the cost of IVC prover to prove a recursive step of omega versus the, the cost of the SNARK prover to standalone prove omega, right? So obviously I'm constructing recursive SNARKs. I, 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 I shouldn't expect to be faster than just standalone proving omega. So let's just compare our recursive cost against the baseline of just proving Omega standalone. Okay, and let's see what happens as omega tends to infinity. Now, by construction of the IVC prover, this is essentially the cost of a snark prover on the recursive computation R depending on omega. And for preprocessing snarks, one can prove that this limit is one. Namely, as omega grows large, the kind of each extra new gate will cost you no more than standalone proving that extra gate of omega. So that's great. Like this is essentially telling us that there is no universal simulation. There is no multiplicative cost on the size of omega. That's great. And, uh, and yeah, and indeed in practice, this makes a huge difference, but th there's a reason for that. There's like some fundamental uh, 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 important properties of preprocessing at play. So this is the ma major technique to cope with the cost of proving omega. What about how do we cope with the cost of proving the SNARK verifier or accumulation verifier. Here, <clears throat> the main problem is that, as I mentioned earlier, expressing the verification in a SNARK's own language leads to overheads. So if omega is not too large and you're not careful, the size, the relative size of the, um, or the size of the SNARK verifier, accumulation verifier is going to be huge. And the, re the specific reason for why this is the case, first, it's actually the white hap white happens is pretty curious. And the specific reason for why this is the case depends on the type of reprocessing SNARK. So here's a little table. In SNARKs built from discrete logarithms like bulletproofs or pairing-based SNARKs like GLOT16 or Marlin or, or Planck, uh, we have some elliptic curve under, underneath. And there is this problem that the size of an elliptic curve group cannot equal the size of the elliptic curve of the elliptic curve base field. This comes from number theory. And this causes some, uh, a, a basically, it means that the computation of the verification is defined over a field that is different from the field that, of the SNARKs language. This causes a so-called characteristic simulation, which if you are not careful, it's extremely expensive and causes huge overheads. So one of the major approaches to uh, cope with this is to use so-called 
cycles of elliptic curves. So it's like two elliptic curves that are made to match uh, their own parameters. For hash-based snarks, the main problem is that there are many hashes in the, in the verification computation, and each is expensive when represented as a circuit. And the main approach to uh, address this is to use algebraic hashes. These are hash functions that are, have smaller circuits by virtue of using the fact that they are defined over large fields. So at high level, this is how a, a we're going to and people have uh, come up, devised uh, to, uh, ways to cope with the cost of proving the verification. And on top of this, you need a lot of other ideas to turn these into efficient designs. Um, now, these things together have led to um, constructions of recursive snarks, specifically constructions of IBC and PCD, in practice with some modest numbers. They're acceptable. They could be much better, it would be nice to have them much better, but they're kind of good enough for some applications. So, for example, if you take pairing based snarks, like for example, GOT16, which has a circuit specific setup, and Marlin, which has a universal setup, if you don't care about recursion, you're going to use an elliptic curve such as BLS12. And in this case, the size of a verifier as a circuit is going to be huge, like tens of millions of gates. However, if you used if you, if you use instead a cycle of elliptic curves, such as, for example, MNT4, MNT6, you may have heard these, the size of the verifier can be made to be something you know, rather modest and something we can deal with. Let's say 200,000 gates for GROT16 and 600,000 gates for Marlin. Now, this, using these alternative gates has repercussions that are a little bit unpleasant. For example, the per constraint proving time blows up a factor of 10. And the argument size goes up by a factor of like two and a half. But in a, you know, reasonable applications, these are costs you're willing to absorb and you we win much more in reducing the size of our verifier by switching the curve than we lose in, um, in, in these blow-ups in per-constraint proving time and argument size. In the case of hash-based snarks, uh, which have transparent setup, if one were to use a hash function that is uh, so traditional, like SHA-256, you're going to obtain a snark verifier that is going to have you know, tens to hundreds of millions of gates, something completely practical. But if you use some of the more recent uh, uh, modern designs of algebraic hash functions, like Poseidon, for a proof system like Fractal, which is a preprocessing snark, one is able to obtain a verifier that is, say, on the order of million constraints. Again, here, this has repercussions. It makes proving about 10 times uh, slower. And the argument size, fortunately, is not much bigger. But again, we're in the same situation that if you want recursion, you're just going to absorb these kind of trade-offs and you're, gonna, you're, you're happy that you have a verifier. There's not enormous. In the case of uh, a, a recursion from accumulation, this is a much more recent technique and there's lots of exciting ongoing engineering work uh, that you know, I'm not going to talk about right now. So, <clears throat> This concludes the part of the talk that is about uh, practice. So I would like to summarize uh, what I've uh, discussed in this talk. So recursion snarks is useful, uh, but you also you need to know <laughs> what that means. And that's why it is important to know that this goal is captured using cryptographic primitives, such as incrementally verifiable computation and proof carrying data. And we know of several approaches uh, to achieve these, specifically from succinct verification and from accumulation. Preprocessing, curve cycles, and algebraic hashes are important tools to improve efficiency, especially if you want to construct, uh, achieve recursion in practice, and build systems with it. This was a technical talk. Um, it was also an experiment for me uh, in that I haven't given this type of material in uh, this audience. And I'm curious to hear feedback and questions uh, about this talk. And I hope you learned uh, something about uh, uh, recursive snarks. So yeah, thank you for your attention.
Chiesa. Super interesting things that you're working on. For those of you that are just joining us, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Our speaker will be answering your questions following this presentation. Our next speaker is Professor Silvio McCauley. Professor McCauley has been on the faculty of MIT's Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department since 1983. He is the co-inventor of probabilistic encryption, zero-knowledge proofs, verifiable random functions, and many of the protocols that are the foundations of modern cryptography. In 2017, Silvio founded Algorand, a fully decentralized, secure, and scalable blockchain which provides a common platform for building products and services for a borderless economy. He is also the recipient of the, recipient of the Turing Award, Godel Prize, and RSA Prize. Today, Silvio will be talking about how Algorand guarantees blockchain interoperability via its decentralized solutions that do not rely on any trusted third parties. Such solutions are technically challenging, but crucial to preserve the decentralization that is a key value for all blockchain systems. Thanks for joining us today, Silvio, and the stage is all yours. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. So Algorand's solution to the blockchain interoperability. So let me start by thanking uh, the organizers for inviting me. I think I like uh, Chesk and I'd like to be back. Let me continue with actually congratulating the organizers to have the guts uh, in, uh, in such an, uh, a global situation to organize uh, uh, yet uh, one more time such a civilized encounter. We needed uh, more of these than less. And uh, finally onward to all of us with science, pandemic or not, life continues and we want to make it better. Great. So here is the agenda for today. A quick recap about Algorand. Then uh, let's uh, discuss interoperability, what uh, our expectations are from it. And then uh, we distinguish two kinds of uh, interoperability, which we call core chains and decentralized token bridge. And I will guide through it. All right, Algorand. Well, first of all, everybody knows what the blockchain is, a decentralized database, readable by anyone, writable by anyone, inalterable by anyone. The potential is, is immense because who does not like a database which is inalterable? Who does not like transparency? Who does not like generating trust among people who barely uh, know each other? The applications are unlimited. But what has a challenger blockchain world from the very beginning is the big gap between our aspirations and the technology. And uh, it is good that there is a gap because we want to keep you know, our aspiration higher and higher, but at some point in time, unless we sustain it with real technology, they remain a pie in the sky. So as a proof of it, you know, somehow the aspiration were disconnected from the technology, I just want to quickly recall the famous um, uh, Buddha in uh, Trilemma, right? That in a blockchain, you cannot have simultaneously decentralization, security, and scalability. If this were true, we're really terrible and is not acceptable because do you want to get rid of security? Are you kidding? Do you want to get rid of decentralization? Why do you have a blockchain? Do you want to rid, get rid of scalability? What is the blockchain going to do? Helping friends and family? The trilemma is not acceptable and fortunately is false. So in fact, the Algorand managed to be decentralized, secure and scalable at the same time. And by the way, it has also some good properties, such as a full transaction finality. In other words, every block that appears on Algorand remains on the chain, no matter what. So if you are paid and your payment appears in the latest block added to the chain, ship the good because you know in Algorand that that block is going to be there forever. There are no forks and disappearance of blocks that you have to worry about. Another good thing is layer one smart contracts. So these are smart concepts that actually are not done at layer two. They are not fragile. They are not you know, somehow expensive. They are not um, slow. They are done every five seconds like an algorithm block. At the same layer, they handle all consensus. So they are as secure and as fast as an ordinary payments. 
And then we have our own smart, smart contract that finally a totally different design. And by the way, we have all kinds of other properties. So let me just here recall with the layer one smart concepts quickly. And uh, what are they? First of all, they are, they are smart contracts. And they are handled at the consensus level without slowing down the block generation and with the same efficiency and security of ordinary payments. Let me give you an example, atomic swaps. Most useful tool perhaps <laughs> in trade. You have an asset that I want. I have an asset that you want. And now you want to swap. Now, the point is that in a blockchain, like Algorand, I can give my asset to you in a few seconds, but then I'm going to say, please, please, please give me your asset. So nobody wants to go first. How do we solve this problem in the real world? How about a trust and mediator? Well, no offense. Why? Because it's costly and it's also rare. You live in Thailand, say, I live in Boston, Massachusetts. What are the chances that we know a third party that we both know and trust? How about traditional smart contracts? Well, you know, they are slow, they are costly, and they are fragile. No day passes by that, you know, somebody loses millions of dollars on a smart, layer two smart contract going rogue. Well, how about hash time locks? Well, they are slow, and they are also vulnerable to DOS. Never mind why, but it is a fact. So then what do we do in algorithm? We swap in a single transaction, okay? So in other words, I post something on the blockchain knowing that if and only if you do the same, which I don't know if you're going to do, but if you do, bingo, the items are swapped. So what is good about a, a single transaction is that there is no cheating, right? Because it's not that I assign you first and then I depend on you. It's a single transaction, I cannot cheat. You get what I, you want if and only if I get is no error because it's done at the layer one at this uh, end uh, and it's really a form of ideal trade. That's what the trader wanted to be. And by the way, these layer one smart contracts do encompasses only atomic swaps, not at all. You can tokenize an entire building in layer one without having a layer two smart contracts. You can collateralize on, you can run auction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There is, as it turns out to be, a lot of room for layer one smart contracts to grow. All right, enough about um, uh, blockchains in general and Algorand, let's focus now on interoperability. Okay, no chain is an island. What does it mean? That uh, it is always true that the world outside is larger than the world is inside. Who has said it? I don't know, but so therefore I attribute it to me. So that is why no matter how good and rich your ecosystem can be, the world at large is a bigger and better place. And if you don't do it, when you, you, can, you are the first prison, prisoner of the blockchain that traps you from the outside that there is going to be. Not a good place to be. All right. Then you want to interoperate. Among whom? Well, chains that runs the same consensus protocols and chains that runs different consensus protocols. The first type of interaction, we call it co-chains, and the other ones, a tool allows such interaction, we call it the decentralized token bridge. Let me drive through it. So let me tell you about algorithm co-chains. What is a co-chain? First of all, it's an independent chain, okay? So you run your own consensus, Algorand verifiers do not interfere with it at all. You are in charge of your own destiny. You are a private chain, which means that the world outside cannot see your transaction at all. Perfect privacy. But inside, you need a blockchain, you need a consensus mechanism. What consensus do you run? Algorand. That makes you a co-chain. And by the way, why do you want to run Algorand? Oh, for three great reasons. The first one is, as we said, is scalable, secure, and distributed. So I think it's a good idea. If you want to look for a good consensus, you don't want to look farther than that. But the second one is that you enjoy these layer one smart contracts and these auctions and a layer one, and that is actually good on its own. Don't you want 
your own members of your own ecosystem or your own blockchain to have a large suite of smart concert with the same ease and security of ordinary payments. Of course you do. And the third thing is interoperability and interoperability between whom and whom. The first form of interoperability is between a co-chain that you see there in blue, a blue co-chain and the main chain in black. And so you may want to transfer a blue asset, an asset that you own to the main chain. Why do you want to do that? Or oh, simple, because that day there is going to be an auction. And when you put an asset in an auction with a lot of bidders, a lot of participants, the price you get is much higher as the number of bidders grow. So if you want to put it in a public permissionless algorithm where the entire world can bid, you are better off to sell your asset there. Okay, you sold it, and now what? You repatriate the assets in, in your own core chain. And I want to tell you that highway, four lane, eight lane highway in each direction, they are very, very fast, very fast to transfer your asset to the main chain. And once you sold it, very fast to transfer the money back. Excellent. Now, there is a, going to be another type of interaction in which is somehow co-chain to co-chain, but there is still a main chain in the middle. There is a blue chain with asset blue A, a red chain with asset blue B. And what do they want to do? First of all, they transfer the asset to the main chain, and they actually choose to transfer to some specific public key that they choose. This public key has random and use it only once to give you some privacy. So that you say, this asset I want to be on in the Algorand main chain to public key blue PK. The other asset, red B, to public key red PK that you just made, each one of us makes these choices ad hoc. And now, because these are super highway, in a few seconds, our assets are now associated to the public key that you control red PK in the public key that I control, blue PK, and there they are. And now, by means of our legendary atomic swaps, we swap them. Okay, that's a few seconds in layer one. And then what do we do? We repatriate the assets by giving to the same public key that we control in our respective blockchain. So, you transfer to the main chain, you swap them there, and you repatriate the new goods that you have acquired. Meanwhile, the main chain has actually a good thing. It records theta, where the asset blue B is and where the asset A is. So if somehow I go nuts in my blue chain and I try to transfer A again, mm, the main chain says, well, I know Silvio, dear Silvio, that now this asset A now is red, it belongs to the red chain. You are not allowed, you cannot transfer, you cannot sell it, you cannot, it's not yours anymore. Very good. So, okay, so we have here an ecosystem, people run Algorand inside, and, uh, but they are separate chains and they can, of course, have the best of breed uh, consensus protocol inside and they can operate very quickly with uh, uh, through the Algorand main chain with everybody else. And I claim that they can do it in a decentralized way. Why is this claim plausible and believable? Well, it, ultimately, because chains that use the same consensus protocol can interpret each other's block. Because the syntax is the same. Once you specify who the verifiers are, I know how a block of yours look like, and you know how a block of mine looks like, because it's the same structure of the blocks that the main Algorand chain uses. Excellent. Okay, I got it. In other words, this notion of a co-chain is like main chain becomes a hub for all the private co-chains that are around. All of them independent, but you somehow interconnected. Is a hub. Wait a second. The hub here it is, is a in this picture, is connected to everything, very big pipes connected to everything else. And you say, is this a new idea? A new idea? Of course not. There is, uh, <laughs> there is a lot of people 
who want to do the same thing. And um, um, uh, somehow Polkadot is one thing. Cosmos is another thing. Algorand wants to do a thing. If you really want to join the crowd and even implement this hub idea, you better take a taxi because the line is long and it's going to take some time to get there. But let me ask, are all hubs equal? And let me give you a hint. No. A hub is only as good as the infrastructure that it offers. So the notion that you can go and parachute assets to a common center, that's okay, that is the same. But then what do you find in the center if that matters? So let me give you an example about airline hubs that everybody knows. Assume that you have a hub in which you have actually mechanics to serve your planes. You have hangars where your planes are going to be worked on. You have hotels when your crew misses and they have a plane that needs to rest. You have hotel um, restaurants, uh, the whole bunch of infrastructure. In another hub, you say, well, you get the free ice cream. Well, let me tell you, it's pretty clear that you choose this hub. So remember, the idea is the same, but somehow it is the hub <laughs> that makes, gives the value to this uh, hub idea. Okay, so... We believe that the hub is where the tech is. And uh, we have a lot of tech, very powerful random functional, layer one smart console, cryptographic sortition, quantum residency, player replaceability, vault, random access, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that we hope we find very comfortable leading in the sub or interacting whenever you want in this main center hub. Okay, now decentralized token bridge. We have understood the Visco chain, interactions, interoperability between chains that run the same consensus protocol as Algo and the main chain. What is the centralized token bridge? Well, first of all, now we want to somehow interoperate with public chain with different consensus. How different can be the consensus mechanism in public chain? Very different. In fact, scarily different. So, proof of work. Here is the idea of the main consensus. The first one to solve a very hard cryptographic riddle chooses the next block on behalf of all of us. Delegate proof of stake. Oh, choose 21 people. Hopefully they will be honest and they will choose the next block on behalf of all of us. Well, is it essential? decentralized? I don't know that, but never mind. Bonded proof of stake. Delegates who put money in the table, host hostage, and they are the ones who choose the block. And then now you have a pure uh, proof of stake that algorithm chooses in which a somehow token is randomly selected by magic among all tokens. The pub, this token must belong to some public key. This public key by magic becomes known to all users. This public key must belong to somebody. And that somebody proposes and propagates a new block. After he or she has done that, a thousand tokens are randomly selected by magic among all possible tokens in the ecosystem. Their key becomes known to all users and uh, their users agree, their owners agree uh, on the block proposed by the first users. All right. So what is the problem? That the problem that help us making the possibility argument that this is going to work in a decentralized manner in the case of CoChain no longer works here because it's no longer true with so much diversity among consensus protocol that we can interpret and recognize and verify a block of each other. And then what are we going to do? Oh, the first thing we're going to think is to say, oh, by the way, here is a block. It can be as simple as having you know, something. That, what is a block? Something that Ash gives you a bunch of zeros. And here is on um, the other stream, you put something, say, oh, here is a, a proof that I want a lottery that allows me to propose a block, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's a kind of idea. So what to do? The first temptation is centralization. Because when we don't know what to do, we think centralized. So we imagine we have here a central party who is going to help us interoperate. And the central party proudly declares I am trusted by you all. So you say, and assume now, let's make it concrete. The, cent the, the central party tells you, an asset the blue A has been transferred from the blue chain from the red chain. Trust me that is no longer as this assets in your blue chain. 
trust me, that is nowhere else except in your red chain and you're willing to buy, ready to buy it and bid the starts $100 million. Well, what are you going to do? Before I put a, start the bidding on $100 million, do I know that the asset no longer exists anywhere? Unfortunately, remember that all this uh, is very opaque, whatever happens in the blue chain to me is a kind of a dark cloud that I can't see inside things at all. So I say, well, I hesitate to participate into the auction. So what? Do you dare to distrust me? As a matter of fact, yes, you centralized swine. I distrust you. Next idea. Oh, very great idea. Now we have not one party, but seven party, and even majority of them somehow walk for, say, out of the same. I, I'm honest. Now, this reporting that an item really has been deleted on one chain and transferred, oh, maybe I should uh, use it. And uh, but by the way, this uh, party, they seem to be midgets. We are not midgets. We are the seven dwarfs, right? Dopey, sleepy, grumpy, and the rest. And why are the seven dwarfs? Because remember that in a blockchain that really works, okay, <laughs> it should secure trillions of dollars in assets. And there are going to be some really big players, some very big asset transfers back and forth. And who are these seven midgets who want to help us? And the fact that they post some money that they are at risk of losing if, uh, if they say the truth means nothing. Because when uh, the money is so high, the ability to bribe the people and let them lose the piggy bank, it has, the piggy bank doesn't give you any assurance of honesty here. So what is uh, our philosophy? Our philosophy is very simple. If somebody wants to transfer an asset from a blue chain to the red chain, two things are going to be true. First, that somebody already trusts the blue chain because he has kept her asset here so far. And B, he must trust the red chain because he wants to transfer there. And our philosophy is that this party should not need to trust anybody else. Period. Not one midget, not three, not five, not seven. So what do we want is a decentralized token bridge. So let me tell you what is the tech required for doing this. At the end, we need two main tools. One, we need the blue chain to have smart contracts and the red chain to have smart contracts. And by the way, if a blue chain does not have any smart contract or, you know, it doesn't even have the interoperability inside. So the notion that we should demand that interoperates with the outside is a little bit perhaps uh, too much. And uh, the second tool is compact certificate. And what are these compact certificates? These are reciprocally parsable. Is it to interpret representation of the will of the entire blockchain? Don't trust the media to tell you what block, the blue blockchain has been done, has, has been doing, or the red chain has just done. You want the word of the entire blockchain. Okay. So let me tell you a little bit on this more about compact chain certificates. Compact chain certificate, we are going to do some magic. They start easy. Somehow you started taking a commitment to all balance sheet of the blockchain, public key, number of tokens each blockchain has. And as you can imagine, beep, this commitment is very, very small. Here it is. Then, because we want to represent the will of the entire chain, we collect the signature of 80% of the stake of the chain. The commitment tells you what, who, where the stake is. And now that you know, we just sign, 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 sign. 80% of the stake should sign. Well, guess what? Now, the commitment was small, but collecting so many signatures now becomes great. So what do we do then? in the last phase is that we do a convincing signature reduction by shrinking this number of uh, so many signatures to something as few as 64 
signatures, okay? So by magic is that even though the signatures are only 64, by magic, you know that they represent without error uh, uh, the will of the entire blockchain. Okay, that is compact change certificates are, and they are impl and that's how they are implemented. So implemented is in two phases. The first phase, Algorand, we shall implement individual solutions based on fancy algebraic construction. And uh, our next implementation is going to be fancy use of what? Of hash function only. And why hash functions? Because two reasons. First of all, they have another bonus that they are quantum resilient. And second, tell you the truth, is that every blockchain understands um, hash function because every chain hashes the previous block. All right, so stay tuned. We are going to bring a token bridge uh, to you in the next uh, few months. We are uh, already started you know, coding things up. And um, in finishing, let me what, tell you what my take is. My take is that blockchain are sophisticated goals. And sophisticated goals require sophisticated technology. And now about technology. I really believe technology is quintessentially humans. Every time, ever since we came down from the trees to produce our first tool, we became more human. And actually technology is going to be really crucial to realize our human aspirations. Let me tell you, our world, is going to be, is becoming increasingly complex. And we need the more and not less technology to solve this complexity and keep us alive, even as a species. So technology has been our past, our present, and, and will be our future. So long live technology and a good day to all. that presentation, Professor McCauley. Always great to hear about the developments happening with Algorand. For those of you that are just joining us, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Our speaker will be answering your questions live following this presentation. For our next talk, we have two speakers. The first is Gert Yap Glassbergen. Gert is a self-employed software developer working with the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, currently focused on proof of work and mining related research. The second speaker is James Lovejoy. James is also a member of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative and works on a proof of work security project studying the safety of various cryptocurrencies from 51% attacks. James is also a maintainer of the Vertcoin project, 
a Bitcoin clone focused on ensuring mining is accessible to the masses through ASIC resistance. In this presentation, Gert and James will talk about systems they've built for detecting transaction reordering events and mining pool misbehavior that have been deployed on 23 different cryptocurrency networks. They will explain the systems they've built and the results they have observed so far. Thank you to both of you for joining us today and the stage is all yours. Hi everyone, uh, welcome for tuning in. Uh, thank you for tuning into this session um, around uh, detecting attacks against proof of work. Um, we'll be talking about this for the next 25 minutes or so. And uh, we is uh, myself, my name is uh, Gert Jaap. I work uh, with MIT's Digital Currency Initiative. And uh, my primary focus for the past 11 months or so has been uh, a project called Pool Detective, which we'll be detailing more in uh, the coming presentation. Um, uh, with me today is James Lovejoy. James recently graduated from MIT, and he did his master's thesis with uh, the Digital Currency Initiative as well um, on uh, the Reorg Tracker, which he'll be talking about in just a minute. Um, so let me introduce the Digital Currency Initiative real quick. Uh, we're a research group uh, based out of the MIT Media Lab, and there's three things that we do. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, we're um, uh, attached to universities, so we're educators. Uh, we try to build um, capacity in this industry by teaching courses and also advising our students on, on these topics. Um, we're also conducting research, uh, so we contribute research and open source uh, development, addressing some of the problems that are still in the blockchain space uh, around scalability, privacy, and also, uh, and that's the topic of this talk, security. Uh, and obviously having a strong brand and a history of standard setting and a neutral platform are also good uh, conveners. Um, so let's uh, introduce the topics that we're going to cover uh, today. Uh, we're going to start with uh, James, who's going to introduce you to uh, the Reorg Tracker, which is a system that uh, detects chain reorganizations and double spends. Um, and then uh, it's my turn to talk to you about Pool Detective and what Pool Detective is and does. Uh, is it records and analyzes the behavior of cryptocurrency mining pools. So first off, we're going to hand it off to James to talk you through the Rio tracker. James. Okay, thanks, Hot Yap. Uh, so what we're talking about today uh, is the Rio tracker, which was my master's thesis project this last year at the DCI. Um, what it's dealing with is studying 51% attacks. Now, proof of work has been around as a consensus algorithm for just over 10 years now, uh, first used in Bitcoin, uh, but now used in uh, many of the coins uh, across the industry. And if you read Satoshi's white paper, uh, his security argument uh, is pretty hand wavy. He essentially says that, you know, 51% attacks should be impractical and really a miner should not want to do it. But more recently, economic researchers have been looking into, well, if we take miners from a rational economic perspective, you know, is that really true? And Ultimately, the current theory says that actually, you know, 51% attacks should be far from impossible. Uh, it says that they should be cheap. Uh, and it comes down to this theory from uh, microeconomics, which states that uh, at market equilibrium, uh, the marginal cost becomes equal to the marginal revenue. And what this means for proof of work is that the cost of a reorg uh, should equal the value of the block rewards for doing that, that reorg. So at market equilibrium, hash rate is abundant and minor profit is eliminated, meaning that an adversary could break even uh, without even having to double spend. And this was introduced in actually three separate papers, one by Eric Budesh, uh, one by uh, Hasu and a few others, and one by uh, Raphael Auer. So naturally we wanted to study these because we wanted to see, you know, how does the theory uh, hold up in practice? And it seems that you know, for coins with a very small network hash rate, there's actually plenty of hash rate available for run. This is because lots of coins share mining algorithms. So if there's a large coin, 
Uh, and then several smaller coins, often only a very small percentage of the network hash rate has to shift uh, from one coin to another in order to be 51% or even 100% of that network's hash rate. Uh, additionally, sort of new players in the game, such as NiceHash, have created a rental market, meaning that it's actually possible for an adversary or anyone to only have to pay the marginal cost of their hash rate. They don't have to worry about the fixed costs or maintaining mining hardware, making attacking far more practical. And coins have been attacked in practice and money has been stolen. Uh, and this is sort of an excerpt from some of the news articles that came out before we performed this research, suggesting that a number of coins, you know, Burtcoin, Verge, Ethereum Classic, Bitcoin Gold, uh, have all been 51% attacked. Uh, one of these articles even calls the 51% attack rare. So we wanted to see, you know, how true is this? Uh, are they rare or not? So which coins actually exist in a liquid hash rate market? Uh, it turns out quite a lot. Uh, over half of the coins that we studied are actually existing in such a market right now, where the black, the black line, line in the middle represents 100% uh, of that coin's network hash rate. So for more than 50% of the coins, uh, there's far more than 100% of their network hash rate available for rent on NiceHash. And in the worst case with Expanse, you know, there's over a thousand times that coin's network hash rate available for rent at any one time. So why do we need a real tracker? Uh, well, these events, they're transient. So people often say, well, you know, can't you see the attack in the blockchain? And the answer is no. You know, you need a, an active observer to be monitoring the network to check whether or not an attack occurs. Uh, also, up until now, we've been reliant on victims to tell us about whether they've been attacked. And as you can imagine, you know, if this results in insolvency or a loss of user funds, victims are often not super interested in revealing an attack has taken place. We also wanted to see if we can demonstrate that 51% attacks are a real risk to the market and quantify how much these attacks cost and try and calculate realistic confirmation requirements that exchanges should be using for these coins. We also wanted to investigate whether there are any mitigation strategies that coins could use to try and protect themselves against attacks. So what are we detecting here? Uh, in the normal operation of a blockchain, uh, the subsequent blocks refer to a single previous block and the chain is extended contiguously. But in the case of a reorg, one set of blocks uh, and another set of blocks both reference the same fork block. And one set of blocks can be replaced by the other when uh, one set of blocks has a higher total work than the other one. So what an attacker might want to do is include a transaction in the original set of blocks that deposits to an exchange. Then once that exchange has credited the deposit, they reveal a second set of blocks that replaces their deposit transaction uh, and in fact makes it invalid such that the exchange cannot later include that deposit transaction in subsequent blocks. So the attacker is able to keep both their deposit and whatever coins they had on the exchange, which they can then withdraw um, or exchange for coins. So what did we do? Uh, we ran coin demons for 21 different proof-of-work cryptocurrencies. Uh, and we also tracked Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, for which we used remote APIs. And then we tracked reorgs on each of these coins for a period of 10 months, and then correlated the attack events we discovered with market data from NiceHash and price data from CryptoCompare. So this is a block diagram of our system design. Essentially what we had is uh, all of the coin demons or web APIs for the different coins responsible for talking to those coins peer-to-peer -peer networks, and then tracker processes for each of the coins which uh, determined whether or not uh, a reorg was taking place. And if a reorg had taken place, it saved both the original set of blocks uh, the replacement set of blocks and the fork block to a database for later analysis for double spent transactions. So what did we find? Well, we found that uh, attacks do certainly happen. And in the worst case on Vertcoin, uh, we detected an attack that was 600 blocks deep, uh, which is the equivalent of over 24 hours worth of blocks being removed uh, from the, the primary chain, uh, which, as you can imagine, is pretty catastrophic and lots more than the six blocks that most people tend to think about when they think about Bitcoin, at least. 
Additionally, we were able to compare, uh, does the marginal cost actually equal marginal revenue in practice? And what we found is at least within sort of one order of magnitude, that certainly seems to be the case. And that, you know, using the block reward as a proxy for the cost of a reorg seems to be uh, a pretty accurate estimation. Uh, there are certainly some outliers which can be explained, but that's out of the scope of this talk. So in terms of, you know, the attacks we discovered, we detected attacks on a number of different coins, which included double spans. As you can see, the sort of deepest reorg there is sort of 25 hours worth of blocks being removed on Bitcoin. As well as on Bitcoin Gold, you can see the cumulative amount of double spent value reaching over half a million dollars in the end. So uh, certainly a significant amount of money is at stake here. Additionally, we found strong evidence that nice hash is being used uh, by adversaries to launch attacks. We were actually forewarned of the attack on Bitcoin before it was deployed because a miner discovered that they were being provided work by nice hash uh, to mine on Bitcoin for secret blocks. And additionally, when we observed the market conditions on nice hash during the time of the attack, we found that there was a pretty large spike in available hash rate capacity, as well as price coinciding with the start of the attack uh, and the end of the attack, i.e. when we believe the attack was starting to be generated and when the end of the attack um, was deployed, i.e. the blocks were revealed to the network. Additionally, we discovered counterattacks. So the uh, deep reorgs that occurred on Bitcoin Gold included repeated counterattacks. So what happens is uh, a defender, after the attacker had revealed their blocks, showed up and extended the original fork to displace the attacker's fork. The adversary then responded by extending their malicious fork to once again restore their malicious fork to the primary chain. And finally, the defender once again extended the original fork, restoring the original fork to the primary chain uh, and thwarting the attack. And this confirms a theory that was developed uh, at the DCI by a Harvard student, Dan Moroz, uh, that states that counterattacks really should deter attacking in the first place once there's a credible threat uh, of a counterattack. We also looked into how asset prices change uh, after an attack. There's a lot of folklore in the space that suggests that you know, post-attack, it would be catastrophic for the coin's reputation, and thus the price of that coin would decrease significantly. But we found that often that's not the case, or at least it's not the case within a short period of time after the attack, at least giving the attacker enough time to uh, withdraw their funds and make a profit on their attack. In fact, for one of the attacks on Expanse, the attack coincided with a large exchange pump where the price of that asset increased over seven times, meaning that the attack was incredibly profitable uh, for the attacker, even without including any double spans. So in terms of future work, uh, it would be really great to deploy the real tracker as a commercial product. Right now, uh, it's just a research tool. It's not really suitable for um, sort of mass usage, but clearly, given that these attacks are becoming more and more frequent and lots of money is at stake, it's clearly required that some kind of monitoring is, is needed. Additionally, we don't know who the attacker and the victims were, so it's important to try and find that out because if it's exchanges that are being attacked and they're losing user funds, it's important for users to be aware of that. Secondly, we need to be able to interpret state changes between forks and account-based coins. Uh, it's Assuming an attack one day happens on an account-based coin, there are a lot more complex interactions between different contracts, so it's much harder than just seeing which outputs are double spent between different coins. And finally, given that we've seen that counter-attacking is potentially a, uh, a method to sort of uh, pre prevent these attacks from occurring, we want to be able to implement an automated counter-attack system for vulnerable coins so that they can defend themselves in the event of an attack. Thanks, over to Maya. Thanks, James. Um, okay, so let's talk about uh, the pool detective. Uh, and before we start to talk about pool detective, let's talk about uh, pool mining. So uh, when you buy a state-of-the-art 
uh, Bitcoin miner, uh, the beauty of the Bitcoin network is that you can um, uh, run a Bitcoin full node, um, install a little bit of software and then uh, be mining on the Bitcoin blockchain all by yourself. Um, now, the problem with this approach, however, is that uh, due to the vast amount of computational capacity that the Bitcoin network currently has, um, your state-of-the-art Bitcoin miner will probably take somewhere between 20 and 30 years uh, to find a block, um, all of which time you'll have to like pay the electric bill for running the miner. And so um, this is a real problem for miners, which they solved uh, by introducing mining pools. Um, and what mining pools do is they distribute the work that needs to be done to find a block um, over a large population of miners that therewith share in the workload. But once the mining pool has found a valid proof of work, uh, they also share in the rewards. So what a mining pool does for a miner is instead of waiting really long for a really big payout, they receive very small payouts much more frequently. Um, and so it reduces the variance of the rewards. And what the pool does in this perspective is they coordinate the work, meaning that they will ensure that no two miners do the same work because that's obviously wasteful. Um, and once the block reward is received, the mining pool will custody that reward um, and will then account for which miner did which amount of work and distribute the rewards based on each of the miners' individual contribution to the total pool resources. And uh, these mining pools communicate with uh, miners using a protocol that is called a stratum. Now to illustrate uh, the power that mining pools have. I'm going to show you this uh, pie chart that shows the distribution uh, of hash rate amongst pools. And what you can see here is that uh, the eight largest pools on the Bitcoin network control 80% of the hash power that is active on the network. Um, and so that means that eight entities, be it persons or companies, uh, control what 80% of all these mining hardware um, is, is working on. And that gives them uh, a fairly serious amount of control. Um, because mining hardware is really, really efficient at um, running proof of work functions. So doing uh, hash functions really efficiently, uh, cranking out as much of these proof of work functions as possible for the lowest amount of energy possible. Uh, but what these devices cannot do is validate whether the work they receive is actually the work that they want to work on. So they cannot do any analysis on uh, the work they receive. And that's a problem uh, in the sense that this risks the mining hardware uh, doing whatever the mining pool tells it to do. So if the mining pool gives the miner work that it doesn't expect, then the mining hardware is going to execute that job regardless. Um, and so what Pool Detective aims to do, and we started this project about uh, 11 months ago, is we're positioning ourselves between the pool and the mining hardware, and we record what the mining pool is telling the miner. Uh, at the same time, we also position ourselves in the peer-to-peer -peer network of the cryptocurrencies that we monitor in order to see uh, the moment at which new blocks are found by listening to the peers announce blocks to each other. Um, and then we store all this data in a large database and we analyze this data for unexpected behavior. And when I talk about unexpected behavior, um, what we look for are these five things that we set out when we started the project. Um, first of all, uh, we look for evidence of selfish mining. And in selfish mining, a mining pool will tell um, the miners that are mining on that pool about a block that they found, and they will start looking for the next block. Uh, but they will not announce the same block to the other peers. And the problem there is that 
the mining pool will have an unfair advantage in finding the next block because essentially he has a monopoly uh, on that, uh, given that he's the only one knowing about the block. And research shows that this gives the mining pool a unfair advantage, uh, making them receive more rewards than they would when they would be mining honestly. Um, so we want to look for evidence of this, um, and so far we haven't found any evidence of this, but we're still we're still looking. Another thing is uh, because the devices, the mining hardware, is in, incapable of determining whether uh, the work it receives is um, of a valid chain uh, of the chain it expects. Um, a mining pool can send work for another chain that uses the same proof of work function. For instance, uh, if you're mining on a Bitcoin pool. Uh, you could receive work for Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV and your mining hardware will simply execute it because there's no way for the mining hardware to tell that that's happening. And we found one instance, we found one pool that is sending us Bitcoin Cash and SV work when we expected Bitcoin work. Uh, we're currently uh, waiting for that pool to respond to our findings and then we're going to make a publication about this somewhere in the, in the next few weeks. Um, Another thing that mining pools can do is uh, once they switch from one block to the other, uh, the first thing that they can do that they're sure is valid is mining a empty block on top of the one that another pool found. So before they have been able to validate the block, they can mine an empty block. The problem is if they do this for too long, the risk of finding an empty block is higher, meaning that the total average throughput of the network will decrease because an empty block takes out potential transaction capacity. Um, and so we want, to, um, we want to compare how empty blocks uh, are being served as work by the different pools, whether they all do it the same way, uh, whether uh, pools are really slow in switching from an empty block to a full block, uh, but it's still going on. Uh, another, a little bit more out there is um, mining pools uh, are able to um, uh, conceal their true hash rate by uh, sending miners work for a block that pays to an unknown address. So the pie chart that I showed earlier attributes blocks to mining pools by looking at which address they pay out to, or for instance, marker data somewhere in the reward transaction. And uh, a mining pool could simply use a different payout address that is unknown, uh, meaning that the mining pools hash rate for that part of the work will show up as unknown, um, meaning that nobody is able to tell what the true hash rate is. Um, because mining pools are meant to not have a too large share of the network, while at the same time having a higher share means higher uh, income for the pool. Uh, so it might be a possibility that they're doing this, so we're, we're looking for that. The last one um, is about underpaying miners, so if you send a particular amount of work, you expect a particular amount of payout. Uh, but so far we've concluded that it's hard to determine whether uh, mining pools underpay miners because you need more data than the data that we have observed. We, you need the data that the mining pool has about the other miners. Uh, and so, so far we haven't been able to draw any conclusions on that front. Um, so very, very basic how the system is designed. The core of the system is a reverse stratum proxy where um, instead of having one pool and you distribute the work to multiple miners, which would be a normal stratum proxy, um, you can, uh, it's a reverse proxy where we connect to a bunch of upstream pools and we distribute the work to a single uh, miner that we have. Uh, and so we have a single miner for each of the algorithms that we monitor and we uh, make it do the work of multiple pools at the same time. Uh, another thing that we have is uh, a modified full node software that allows us to monitor what happens on the peer-to-peer -peer network in terms of uh, block propagation. Uh, so we can see when blocks are discovered and we can see when uh, the work uh, to build on top of that block is received so we can detect things like uh, selfish mining. Um, in order to detect when blocks are found more accurately, we're also running this software on five different places uh, on the globe. Uh, to make sure that we're close and connected to uh, the full nodes that find the blocks or are close to the full nodes that find the blocks, meaning that we're learning about the blocks as fast as we can. Now, the system has been running since November 1st. Uh, we're currently monitoring 31 pools on 11 cryptocurrencies. This number is ever increasing. 
So we're looking at you know, which pools are important in certain currencies and we're adding new pools as we go. Um, these are the pools that we're monitoring for Bitcoin, which covers about 92% of the Bitcoin hash rate, uh, which is significant and important to have a large share in that. Uh, there's 10 altcoins. Also here, there are coins that share the proof of work algorithm, uh, which might allow us to uncover when pools send uh, wrong but compatible work. Um, and another aspect is um, including rental markets. So what James said around um, rental markets being used for attacks, if we mine on the rental markets as well, we can uh, see the work on blocks that ends up in an attacker chain and combined with the price data, that would be a smoking gun to these markets being used for uh, attacks. So currently we're analyzing for selfish mining, uh, the timing of empty blocks, and whether we can relate work to blocks reliably without having to rely on a known list of addresses per pool. And we're also building an API to expose this data uh, to the public uh, for other people to build on. Uh, so the next steps for us are, we're going to expand this API, uh, we'll be releasing a blog post soon to introduce this project in more detail, which you can, which you can obviously read more about it. Uh, we're releasing a YouTube video on the Pool Detective to explain it in more detail. Um, and uh, maybe we're releasing also a public front end for people to explore this data. Now, if you want to learn more about the Pool Detective or the Reorg Tracker, you can visit the website uh, of the DCI, which is dci.mit.edu. Also, if you want to learn more about the DCI in general, that's a great place to start. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter, either the DCI account or uh, me personally or James personally. And with that, uh, we're wrapping up. So thank you for watching this uh, presentation. If you want to learn more, um, please feel free to visit the website or contact us on Twitter. Thank you. Thanks for those insights, Gert and James. It's super interesting to see the different attack vectors within the cryptocurrency industry. It's really important that we focus on this topic. For those of you that are just joining us, if you have any questions for our next speaker, please leave them in the chat box. The speaker will answer them live after this presentation. So the next person to talk is Taj Drya. Taj is a member of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative and is co-author of the Bitcoin Lightning Network primarily focused on novel scalability solutions. During this presentation, Taj will be speaking about Utrixo, a novel hash-based dynamic accumulator that allows fully validating nodes to be run with much less data storage at the cost of somewhat increased network traffic, allowing much lower cost devices to participate. Thanks for joining, joining us today, Taj, and the stage is all yours. Hello. Uh, I'm Tad Shreja. I'm going to talk about Bitcoin nodes, uh, decoupling trust and storage with Utrexo. Uh, so quick intro, I'm Tad Shreja. I work on Bitcoin at the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. Uh, previous work I've done is uh, co-authored the Lightning Network paper, uh, Discrete Law Contracts, and currently working on Utrexo. Uh, so quick outline of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about what is a node, you know, what are these things called nodes in Bitcoin and how they work. Uh, I'm going to talk about the history of Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin history, state, and verification, how those fit together. Uh, verifying the state of Bitcoin with minimal trusted data. And then Utrexo and their design and properties. 
Uh, so nodes, what's a node? Well, from Latin, notice, not. I don't know if that really applies, but you know, in graph theory, it's sort of the, the dots that are connected by the lines, right? These, these things in the middle. Um, and in Bitcoin and Sentinel networks, these are the endpoints. These are the computers running Bitcoin. Um, what does a node do? Well, mainly sends and receives transactions. And it, the hope is that everyone agrees on who owns what, right? So you send these transactions to move coins around and Ideally, when it works, everyone agrees on who owns what. Uh, so how do you do this? Well, there's a bunch of things that nodes do specifically. They propagate messages, send coins, serve blocks, uh, check proof of work, check transactions, receive coins, and, and mine. Um, and I sort of sorted these in the easiest to hardest. Uh, so propagating messages is really easy from a computer science point of view. You don't have to actually have much memory or storage. You don't need to know what a signature is. People just send you messages and you sort of send them around to people. Um, in practice, it's more complex, um, but you don't need to actually validate. Um, sending coins is actually easy. So if you have the information needed to send a Bitcoin, uh, signing is, is very quick. You don't actually need to know much about the system to sign and broadcast a transaction. Um, Serving blocks, so if you're a full node and you give blocks, an archive node to give blocks to other people, again, it's actually really easy. You don't have to verify anything. When people request a block, um, and you request it by hash, you could just send the block out and have no idea what it means. So it's sort of like being a web server at that point. Um, checking the work to see if a block has the valid proof of work, uh, a little more complex, but computationally quite quick. And then you get to the hard part, right? Checking transactions and signatures in order to receive a coin or, you know, whether the, the only difference between checking the transaction and receiving the coin is who ends up being the beneficiary, but you got to check them all anyway. And then mining is sort of on top of once you've checked all the transactions you can mine. Um, so verifying transactions is the hard part. People are sending coins. Um, and are these transactions okay? So you need to know so many things about these, you know, so much data goes behind whether a transaction is valid or not. A transaction in isolation, you can't tell, right? Because it's, do these coins exist um, at the right places? And there are enough of them. And what are the keys? And are the signatures okay? And there's so many different verification checks. Script op codes, interpreter, clean stack, well, you know, so many things. Just looking at a transaction, a transaction can be very small. It can be two, 300 bytes. Looking at it in isolation, you don't know if it's valid. You need in practice today, you have to have gigabytes and gigabytes of space to, to verify what a single transaction's validity is. Um, and this is, gets to sort of state versus history, right? So the blockchain itself is history, um, but you only need the blockchain to get to the current state of who owns what, and that's the chain state or UTXO set. Um, so keeping track of the current state is hard. Um, and you can't directly share it with others. So if you say, oh, I've got this current UTXO set, let me give it to you. Um, there's no messages to do that, really. There's no way to export your UTXO set because you can't verify it, right? I know that here's all the list of who owns what, of this address has this, you know, this UTXO has this coins, um, but I can't share that. I have to share the actual blocks, the actual history. Um, so keeping track of the history is easier Right? If you just want to archive the blocks, you don't actually have to compute much. And it's only really done to help others. The only reason you need to store blocks is to give them to other people and convince them that your current state is the correct one. Um, can you somehow get someone else to do the hard part? Right? Can, can we, we can throw away the history. Right? So pruned nodes have been common for many years where you play through the history and then delete it. Can we do the same thing with the state somehow? The answer is yes. Um, there's a new node type that I'm working on it's called UtreXO. Um, it's, I would call it a full node. It fully verifies, but it does not contain the full state of the system. Um, so you verify everything that a full node does, but you don't keep track of the whole state of who owns what. So you can't look up the coins on your disk. You don't have a database at all, really. Um, so instead, the people spending the coins or when someone's giving you a transaction, they need to prove that those coins exist. Um, it makes spending coins a little harder, but it makes other things quite a bit easier. So the design is, instead of keeping track, right, the, the ledger of who owns what, which is built by the blockchain of who sent what where, uh, instead of keeping track of this whole ledger, 
you really only have to keep track of your own coins and a proof that they exist. And then you sort of keep a hash of everything else, right? So all the 70 million other UTXOs in Bitcoin, uh, UTXOs are sort of where Bitcoins live, the unspent transaction outputs. You just keep this hash of that and it's very small. Um, and then when people want to send coins, they prove that their coins exist by giving you a proof that their coins are in this hash that you've already got and verified. Um, so we use an accumulator, which is basically a cryptographic construction where you can sort of throw data into it. You can't get the data you throw in back out, but you can prove that you threw something into it. So it's sort of this, imagine this bottomless box and you can throw as much data as you want into it. You can never get any you know, throw as many pictures, PDFs, images, throw whatever you want into this thing. But unlike a hard drive, you can't pull out. Um, you can't get any of the data back out, but you can prove that things have been thrown in. And in this case, uh, we also need to be able to delete things, right? We don't want to be able to double spend or spend the same UTXO twice. So when you verify that something is in this accumulator, you also want to remove it at the same time, which is nice. The only time you need to um, delete things in Bitcoin is when you're proving them and vice versa. So it's, I'll go briefly into the um, actual design of how this accumulator works. It's quite simple. It's basically a bunch of Merkle trees and they sort of move around in an interesting way. Um, and the, these nodes, these UTXO nodes, they only need to store the roots of these Merkle trees. Okay, so let's say you want to add node, add items to this accumulator. So in a normal Merkle tree, if you only know the root, you can't actually add a new node and recompute the root, right? Because you don't even know how many things there are. If maybe there's a hundred things in here and you want to add one, well, it's, it's, it's not clear to do that. So what you do is instead have a, a forest of perfect trees. I'll show you this. Okay, so let's say you have a forest, a single tree with four leaves. And then you have got one root there. Um, you only need to know the root. Let's say you want to add a leaf, okay. So now there's five elements. Um, you actually have to keep two roots now. So you keep one that has four in it and one that has a single one in it. Let's say you add it again. Um, now you have six elements. These new two on their own level can form their own tree. So again, you have two roots to represent six elements. Now you add, again, you're at seven, you have three roots. One that, got, one that has four, one that has two, one that has one, powers of two. And then you add eight, and now you can combine these things. So when you're, when you're in this situation, you only know these sort of orange ones, but knowing just these orange ones, you can combine them, right? You can combine these two to get that, combine those two to get that, and combine that to get the top. Now you've got eight, and now you're back down to a single root that you need to uh, keep track of. So you can sort of see at a glance, you're gonna store log two, right? right I'm sorry, log base two. So log number of elements. Uh, in practice, it's uh, log base two over two. Uh, because sometimes you don't have to store. Um, so yeah, so that's that's adding elements, and that's not that complex, and it's been you know discussed in other papers. Okay. Um, however, adding is not too bad, but um, yeah, you add sort of on the right, and then you sort of batch things together and bind things together as necessary as, as you can. Whenever whenever things are sort of on the same row, you say, okay, I know these two things on the same row. Add them, you know, hash them together in a standard Merkle tree construction, and then you're going to have, you know, log uh, log in over two uh, roots. Deleting is a little more tricky. Sorry, maybe a lot more tricky. Um, <laughs> what's interesting though is that if you sort of combine deletion and proving, it it works really well. Um, and in Bitcoin, it's all it's great because the case is you only need to delete things as soon as they've been proven, and vice versa, right? When you're proving that a coin exists, the only reason you need to prove it exists is so you can delete it. Um, so I'll show the sort of intuition. Um, you've got these, so here's an example where you had uh, seven elements, right, and three roots. And you say, okay, I want to delete element two. Uh, the proof for element two is gonna be three and eight, right? So standard Merkle proof, so the siblings all the way up to a root. And if you know three and eight, you can say, okay, well, I'm deleting two. I'm gonna move six, right? Six is this one that's off on its own. Um, six moves to where two was. And now I recompute. I can recompute nine because I know three, three was part of the proof. I can recompute 12 because I know eight. Eight was also part of the proof. So 
now I've got a new 12 where six has sort of swapped in for the thing that got deleted. Um, this is great. I know the proof was exactly what I needed to recompute the root with this new substituted element. And similarly, um, yeah, then you discard and you're done. Let's say another example where I have exactly four nodes and I want to delete the same, this node number two. Um, in this case, I don't have any, anything that can swap in. So it's like, how am I going to do this? Well, the proof is again, three and eight. In this case, I say, well, nothing's going to take two's place. However, I do know what three is. I'll delete two. And if you look at it, well, I've got two trees now, right? Eight exists. Eight can be its own tree. And three exists. Three is its own tree. I'll just delete that. Delete that. Cool. Now I've got two trees. Um, so the intuition is that you've got these proofs. And if there are basically these, are, these two cases sort of take these two examples actually work all the time because you either have an even number of uh, leaves at the bottom or an odd number. In the case where you have an odd number, uh, that odd one swaps in to the thing that got deleted. If you have an even number, uh, the sibling of the, the even one that was, the, the sibling of the node that was deleted ends up being its own tree. Um, and so you, you know, there's, it works. <laughs> um, and you can batch these deletions together and be, it's quite efficient. Um, so things sort of delete, and then you always have this log n over two number of root, uh, roots, which ends up being a few hundred bytes, uh, always less than a kilobyte with the current Bitcoin code. Um, even if you got up to, I think, 4 billion or 8 billion UTXOs, you would never exceed a kilobyte of uh, storage space. So um, the downsides. So now you got these proofs, right? So you need Merkle proofs for potentially all the inputs. All these UTXOs that are getting spent need to be proven that they exist. And not just that they exist, but what they are, right? How many, how many Bitcoin is there? Um, and what is the PubKey script and, and all the other aspects can go into this hash at the bottom of this accumulator tree. And then the question is, who makes these proofs? Well, the nodes themselves can make it. Or the other issue is, what if you're getting transactions from someone who hasn't upgraded and hasn't used this software and they don't care about it, want to? Well, you, so you need a bridge node, a node that stores all the proofs and can tack on any proof uh, instantly and push it over to a node that wants these proofs. Um, so that's one of the hard parts of doing this is you need to make a bridge node. Um, bridge nodes, it works, right? It's, it ends up being a couple gigabytes. Uh, you can run it on a regular laptop. It's not too intense. Um, but you do need some of them to sort of provide these proofs for the network. And those, those proofs can then be propagated peer to peer. So you only need a few bridge nodes to support potentially many um, Utrexo nodes. The other downside is there's more to download. Um, that's the big performance hit here, right? It's, it can be potentially a lot faster because you don't need to do any disk access. All the data you need to verify is right there. Um, but you do have to download more. Um, so in most cases, this is faster. Um, but if you're really bandwidth constrained, it's not. Um, and in the worst case, you can download potentially more than twice as much data. So right now, the Bitcoin blockchain is about 300 gigabytes. This could potentially make it 600, 650. It, it's a lot. Uh, but that's with the naive, with no with no optimizations. It ends up being that. And you can get that much lower, as I'll show. Um, so how do you minimize this extra download overhead? So you can cache the proofs. Um, I won't go into the, the diagrams, but you can see that you've got these big Merkle trees and elements of them are moving around kind of. Um, every block, things change, right? Every block, you're deleting a node, you're moving things around. But most of the tree doesn't change, right? Even if you're moving some leaves around, let's say you have right now 70 million UTXOs, you might be deleting a few thousand of them, three or 4,000 in a single block. So the vast majority are unchanged. Um, and so what you can do is you can cache parts of the tree that don't change. Or really what you're doing is you're remembering parts of the tree that recently changed. Because as you can imagine, things that most recently changed are likely to change again. Um, if you just have a new UTXO, a new output that's just been created in a transaction, it's quite likely it will be deleted and spent very rapidly. Um, in fact, we can do better than like most recently used. You know, a regular caching algorithm will say, okay, well, these things have cre been created recently. I'm going to keep them in RAM or, you know, not flush them to disk. Or in this case, keep them in RAM and not require a proof. Um, but we can do better because the, block the whole blockchain, if you're syncing up the blockchain, it's known beforehand. Um, so the node you're downloading come from can sort of give you hints and tell you, here's what to keep in your cache because this is going to get spent next. 
um, the whole history is known beforehand, so you can have this optimal caching. You can look into the future. Um, a fun graph that sort of shows the lifetime of these UTXOs. Uh, I couldn't put zero because it's a log scale graph, but one here means that this is the number of UTXOs that lived a single block long. So they were created in block N and then spent in block N plus one. And that is the most popular, really second most popular. So the most popular was zero. Um, and then one, two, three. Interesting, there's a bump at six. Many people wait six confirmations and then spend their coins because well, it was mentioned in the paper. Uh, another bump at 100 because miners have to wait 100 blocks. Another bump at 433 and mm, 1,000 and so on. But you can see, you know, this is a the power law kind of distribution where many of the coins, many of the UTXOs live a short amount of time. And then many of them, you know, as it, it trails off, will live uh, a long time and so aren't getting spent. Um, but this is great. You know, you see a graph like this, you're like, awesome. This is so, you know, optimizable. If I have a good caching, if I just remember 10 blocks ahead, I get, you know, something like half of all uh, transaction inputs. So, and result, uh, what you can do is the more memory you dedicate to caching these proofs, uh, the, the less proof you have to download total. So, you actually need something like 11 something gigabytes to not need any proofs at all, which is worse than just holding the whole UTXO set. So once you're getting into, you know, six, eight gigs, this whole, the whole point is somewhat lost. Um, but what you can also see is that right in the beginning, you drop real fast. So if you only have a few hundred megabytes of memory to dedicate to caching, you will significantly reduce the number of, uh, the amount you need to download. So download over, you know, let's see, Something like, uh, and this is the look ahead. So the actual way we do it is, you know, look ahead 100 blocks, look ahead 1,000 blocks. Um, uh, this is a bit old data, but the new stuff looks about the same. So the idea is if you can dedicate a few hundred megabytes to, to memory cache, then your um, download overhead only ends up being 40 gigabytes, 50 gigabytes, something like that, which, you know, is still a lot, but that's alongside the 300 gigabytes of blockchain data you need to download. So in comparison, it's like, oh, this is 15% not a huge overhead um, and gives you the benefit of, of, you know, not needing to store anything at all. You're well, less than a kilobyte. Um, the other thing is it's not a soft fork or hard fork. If there's no consensus, no problem. Um, so miners don't need to know about this. People might be using this right now. I mean, you can use it on testnet right now. It works. Um, I definitely don't, uh, don't use it on mainnet yet. <laughs> um, so you need to start with bridge nodes and archive nodes to keep all these proofs. But it's nice, it's permissionless innovation. You're not gonna have any um, arguments over starting this because people can just require, you know, use this new software which requires proofs and have bridge nodes to just provide these proofs. And whatever transactions they're making, it's really easy to strip out the proof and send it over to the old software, right? The old software will take these new transactions with proofs and just, you know, remove the proof. Um, so what is their build? You know, what can you do with this? Well, the obvious benefit is your full node is now tiny. So instead of taking up a lot of space and having a lot of disk IO, it doesn't. Um, it also leads to a lot of cool things you can do. So when the state size of your system is so small, it'll fit on a QR code. And so you can copy it around easily. You can do a lot of cool things. You could, for example, um, sync your full node using this on your desktop computer at home. And you trust your desktop computer, you know, it's yours. And then uh, copy that entire state to your cell phone. And instead of having your cell phone work for hours or potentially days and download hundreds of gigabytes, it's just no QR code and it transfers the phone. Your phone's now synced up. Um, and this is not you losing any trust. You know, you could potentially do that today, right? You can go into Bitcoin and copy your whole chain state folder from one computer to another, but it's for something gigabytes and, it, you know, it's not practical to... To do it's not not really supported. Um, you could also yeah so oh wrong slide um, so you can you could do that with this much easier. Um, yeah it's it there's other things you could do you can make you split up the consent the valid validation so maybe you have a couple computers and you take turns or like you you know this computer does the first three hundred thousand blocks this computer does the next two hundred thousand this computer does the end and they can sort of run in parallel and transfer states to each other um, very easily. Okay, so that's basically the 
gist of the talk, um, the idea, maybe you can have full nodes on phones. Like it does help. You still are using the same amount of CPU and bandwidth, potentially more, but it does solve a lot of the issues. So a good thing to think about this, uh, like a Raspberry Pi, Pi plugged into your router, it's perfect for that, right? You're not bandwidth constrained. So an extra 15, 20% of bandwidth, no big deal. Um, but a Raspberry Pi is really disk IO bottlenecked, right? You've got to write to this little micro SD card um, and having a database on that is, is painful. So with this, it stays in RAM um, much faster, easy to run on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, we currently have code. It's working. Uh, you can download it, compile it, try it on uh, testnet. Um, we have weekly calls discussing development of this. So it's up on GitHub. And uh, more open source contribution is definitely welcome or other questions. Um, so that's the end of this recording. And I will take questions now. Thanks. Thanks, Taj. That topic is super important in the cryptocurrency industry, and I'm super interested to see how this progresses. For those of you who are just joining us, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Our speaker will be answering them following this presentation. Our next speaker is Quan Quan Liu. Quan Quan is a PhD student at MIT and a research assistant at the MIT Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory, CSAIL for short. Today, she will be speaking about a new communication efficient consensus protocol using verifiable delay functions that is secure against adaptive adversaries and does not require the same strong assumptions present in other protocols. This protocol achieves liveness and safety with high probability against adaptive adversaries using some polynomial and log n multicasts. The stage is yours, Quan Quan. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Quan Quan, a PhD student in MIT CSAIL. Today, I'll be presenting some work that was completed with Tej Tria and Neha Narula while I was interning at the MIT Digital Currency Initiative this past summer. More specifically, I'll be presenting our work on verifiably delaying adaptive adversaries in consensus. I'll be explaining what each of these terms mean in the following few slides. Just very quick to start, I will define consensus. The consensus involves schemes or protocols meant to ensure participants reach agreement in a decentralized network. Some desirable properties of consensus include, of course, having everyone agree on the same value. Suppose you have the following set of participants which propose the values A, B, C. These values can be anything, for example, blocks you may want to add to the blockchain or functions you want to execute in a distributed database or code base. If everyone talks to everyone and is honest about their proposals, they can simply decide on a value like the lexicographically first value, which in this case is A. Furthermore, we want the additional property that if everyone starts with the same value, they also agree on the same value. For example, if everyone starts with B, they should agree on B, not A or C. In a real life distributed system, not everyone participating in consensus is honest. Thus, we also want the property that all honest players can reach agreement even in the presence of adversaries. Here, even if there is an adversary, all the honest participants should reach agreement on the value B. Two properties by which we measure the effectiveness of a consensus protocol are liveness and safety. Liveness is defined as a property that progress is always made in the system. This means that, for example, blocks are continuously being added to the blockchain. Safety is defined as a property that all honest players agree on the history of values committed to the chain. For example, all participants of a crypto system should agree on the history of transactions that were performed. 
Throughout this presentation, we assume the synchronous model in which agreement over values proceed in rounds, and there is a fixed maximum amount of time messages can be delayed. In light of the applications of consensus to large crypto systems, we want a consensus protocol that obeys liveness and safety in the presence of millions of participants. This is far too many participants for everyone to be able to send messages to everyone before these messages flood the network. Thus, an additional desirable property for consensus protocols for these systems is that we want only a small number of honest nodes to speak before consensus can be reached. Furthermore, adversaries are more motivated in these systems to perform targeted attacks. Since only a small number of participants are speaking, adversaries can, for example, launch attacks only on the speaking participants. A valid strategy, then, is to observe the network for messages sent and then attack the important players in the consensus protocol. Thus, we also want protocols that are robust against these strong adversaries. Finally, some existing crypto systems all already achieve the two desirables above. However, each has some caveats, which I will mention later. Specifically, in the context of protocols based on proofs of work, we want to create a protocol that has the two desirable properties above, but avoids energy wasting proofs of work that can be parallelized using special hardware. We'll first start with the first property. One way by which current crypto systems deal with only having a small number of participants speaking is via cryptographic sortition as used by the Algorand crypto system. Cryptographic sortition is a procedure by which all participants in the protocol elects a small committee at random. Then the con consensus protocol is run among the small number of participants, which makes a decision and then informs all other participants of their decision. Some characteristics of cryptographic sortition as used by Algorand include having a small number of proposers, which propose blocks, and also having a small number of voters, which vote on the blocks proposed by the proposers. In this case, if the number of proposers and voters are polylogarithmic in n, where n is the total number of participants, the total number of messages sent by these proposers and voters to everyone will be O of n polylog n, which is a much smaller value than n squared when you consider n to be on the order of millions or billions of users. Another important characteristic of cryptographic sortition is that each individual decides committee membership secretly. This can be done via cryptographic primitives called verifiable random functions, or VRFs. Although membership is decided secretly, committee members can inform others and prove their membership later on. Such ideas are used in a variety of crypto systems, including Algorand, Definity, Filecoin, Witnet, and others. Thus, this concept of cryptographic sortition allows us to satisfy our first desirable property. Now we'll talk about the second property. Note that from this point forward, I'll only talk about the remaining properties for protocols that satisfy the first property. First, very quickly, traditional consensus protocols mainly considered static adversaries. So what are static adversaries? Let me quickly define that. Suppose we have a set of Byzantine nodes these Byzantine nodes are decided before we run our consensus protocol, hence the name static. Then we run our consensus protocol and reach consensus. But large monetary gain has led to stronger adaptive adversaries. They first observe the network before attacking the crucial players. Initially, there are very few or no Byzantine nodes. Then the protocol is run, Suppose the protocol elects a leader, then the leader sends a message. By the time the leader sends a message, the adversary would have known that the highlighted player is the leader. 
So after the leader sends the first message, the adversary pulls together all his resources to mount an attack against the server of this leader. For example, the attackers could choose to DDoS the leader or bribe or hack. Any number of such attacks may work. Then the corrupted leader can perform malicious actions immediately, potentially violating both the liveness and safety of the protocol. Now we'll take a look at some case studies and observe how adaptive adversaries can break the protocol in each of these cases. In the first case, adaptive adversaries can violate the liveness of protocols which have predictable leader schedules. You can corrupt the leader before they are elected and have them never send out a proposal. Even if the leader schedule is not predictable, the adversary can corrupt the leader right after they send their first message. For example, they can corrupt every elected leader and then send many different proposals, making voters unable to decide on the same proposal. This would also violate liveness. Finally, if there is a small committee, the adversary can corrupt the committee right after election and send votes for every proposal or some subset of the proposals to different participants, thus potentially causing the participants to believe that different proposals are committed. This would violate safety. So cryptographic sortition solves the first problem with the predictable leader schedules. But by itself, it does not solve the problem of corrupting leaders and committee members after the election. Player replaceability solves the problem of corrupting a leader or committee member after election by having each person speak only once before the next committee is elected. To ensure player replaceability, many current systems use the key erasure model which makes participants erase their current keys and generate forward secure new keys before announcing their leader or committee membership. Thus, even if an adversary corrupts them, they cannot send a new message using the old keys because these keys have been erased. To give a bit of background on the model, in the key erasure model, it is assumed that keys can be erased at will, arbitrarily, from a replica storage without any recovery possibilities. Such an assumption is difficult to realize in real life since complete erasure on hardware and in software is difficult to accomplish. For example, hardware failure could prevent a key from being fully erased. Similarly, fault-tolerant software backups and human errors in software could also prevent full erasure. Furthermore, there could exist even an incentive scheme to retain and sell old keys. Thus, it seems important to explore alternatives to key erasure to solve the problem of corrupting leaders and committee members after election. Recently, a number of researchers used vote-specific eligibility instead of the erasure model to determine votes for a specific subclass of consensus called Binary Byzantine Agreement, or BBA. In BBA, participants either agree on the digit one or zero. So the set of possible proposals a leader can make consists only of one or zero. In their protocol, one can mine a vote by passing into the VRF or cryptographic sortition function, either one or zero, and the round number. Honest replicas mine a vote for one of one or zero. Adversaries can mine for both, but it is difficult to obtain enough votes for one or zero, probabilistically speaking. The committee membership is then tied to a successful mining of a vote. The natural extension of this protocol then is to pass in block proposals to the vote function. So pass in arbitrary block proposals to the vote function in order to mine a vote. 
However, the adversarial strategy is then to try an arbitrarily large number of transactions and blocks to attempt to create a block that obtains a disproportionate number of adversarial votes. This situation then dissolves into proofs of work in which the adversary will parallelize the grinding of various blocks and thus the greater the computational power of the adversary, the greater the ability to get more votes or to grind more votes. Consensus to herding presents a solution to this issue by assigning scores to transactions by age. This essentially ensures that older transactions are included in a committed block and limits the ability of adversaries to grind through many new blocks. However, it appears that the safety and liveness of such a scheme is tied to this temporal ordering of the blocks. And it is unclear how such a scheme can work with other priority functions on the blocks, such as determining priority based on transaction fees, which are used in real life crypto systems. Thus, although previous work provides guarantees for these two items, they are not quite the optimum ways to provide for these desirables. So let me just give a quick recap. We want a protocol that protects against adaptive adversaries without using the key erasure model and also preventing against a vote grinding or block grinding. Now I'll talk about um, our solution. So the intuition of our solution is the following. Each block proposal takes some number of time steps which must be performed before the proposal can be sent out. This number of time steps can be performed even by parallel adversaries and they must be performed even if the adversaries have uh, parallel abilities. Rounds take some fixed amount of time guaranteed by our assumption that message delay is fixed in a synchronous network. Thus, we make it impossible to perform the time steps necessary for two different blocks before the round rolls over to the next round. So let me just quickly restate that again. Um, we are able to ensure this property because since rounds are fixed, it is impossible to propose two different blocks by performing the necessary number of time steps, time steps before the round rolls over. You just don't have enough time, even if you have uh, access to parallel processors to perform the necessary time steps before the round rolls over to the next round. Thus, this is intuitively a way to commit to your block before you send it. And an adaptive adversary does not have time to commit to a different block in the same round. In our protocol, we use a cryptographic primitive called a verifiable delay function or VDF. Such a function requires say, D sequential time to compute even on a parallel computer, but the output can be quickly verified by anyone. Instead of giving the full cryptographic definition of BDFs, I'll just highlight some key properties. First, honest parties take the same amount of time to compute the BDF, not much more than D sequential time. Second, adversaries must spend at least D time, even if they can parallelize the computation among polynomial processors, arbitrary polynomial processors. Third, an adversarial algorithm cannot compute an output that is not equal to the intended output. This means that outputs are unique given a unique input. Finally, this is very important. Verification of the computation is fast. So if you have a solution to the VDF and you send the solution and its proof to everyone else, they can verify that you computed the VDF correctly 
in a very short amount of time. So here is a simplified visual diagram of our pr protocol. Our paper contains a full detailed description of our protocol, as well as the proofs for its properties. We use five different phases in our protocol. In the first phase, the leader, which is determined randomly via a call to a VRF, computes the VDF associated with the block it wants to propose. Suppose let that block be M. Then it sends both M, the block it wants to propose, and the computed output from the VDF to everybody who's participating in the consensus protocol. Then each participant of the next voting committee computes the VDF associated with their vote. There are log n, a log squared n members of the voting committee that is also determined randomly via queries to VRFs. So after computing the VDF associated with their vote, they then send both their vote and the VDF output to everyone. So you proceed like this by electing three more committees, uh, proceeding for three more rounds until everyone has received at least two log squared n over three votes on a particular block. And these log squared n over three, two log squared n over three votes, uh, must hold for the same block for all three of the voting rounds. So that's it. Um, so in conclusion, by using VDFs and the number of other observations necessary to the implementation of our protocol, we propose a new consensus protocol that satisfies all three properties and hopefully will lead to efficient, safe, and secure protocols in practice. And I'm happy to take questions now. Thanks, Quan Quan. Super interesting information that you shared today. For those of you that are just joining us, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them in the chat box. Our speaker will answer your questions live at the end of this presentation. Our next speaker, who is last but certainly not least, is Wasim Al Sindi. Wasim is the managing editor of the Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series. Prior to joining the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, Wasim conducted and managed academic research in the physical sciences, curated avant-garde arts events, and published open source experimental electronic music. Today, he will be speaking about the Crypto Economic Systems Journal that I just mentioned, which is a new inter interdisciplinary peer-reviewed publication from the MIT Press, focusing on all contexts and approaches to the nascent field of crypto economics. By addressing the strong need for accessible and independent venues which rigorously scrutinize new research between academia and practice, the journal ho help, hopes to help this new field mature and develop in a grand collaboration across fields and continents. The stage is yours, Wasim. Hello everyone, my name is Wasim al Sindi, and today we're going to go on a, a short trip uh, to explore a new cryptocurrency research publication, uh, the Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series. So this is uh, a work that's been initiated 
collaboratively by the MIT Digital Currency Initiative at the Media Lab and MIT Press. And we're here uh, today at uh, CESC, Crypto Economic Security Conference 2020, uh, which uh, is part of the Unitize online event, uh, which grew out of San Francisco Blockchain Week. So very happy to be here and uh, to give you uh, a rundown on the story so far for our um, initiative. And so uh, this is uh, the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. And I always like to start by framing the problem. And in my opinion, one of the main problems we have is communication. Communication is hard uh, for humans, especially. Uh, and so let's think about how a conversation happens. Let's take a step back and think about that. So for me to have a conversation with you, I have to have neural impulses, downregulate those into small mouth noises. You hear or see those the small mouth noises or the syntax, uh, you know, the written syntax with which they correspond. And then you have to understand, try and decode that given, you know, language, grammar, context, nonverbal cues and all the rest. So this is hard at the best of times. And it's much harder when you have something, uh, you know, nuanced, technical, complicated and interdisciplinary. So this is one of my favorite memes on the screen here. And what it says is a baklava wearing a balaclava while playing balalaika on black lava. And so those words all sound different. So I'm sorry, they all sound similar, but they mean different things. But the converse can also be true, where you have words that sound very similar, but they mean different things. And also, you know, the meaning of words is contextual. Epistemology is a social endeavor. And so different fields use the same words in different ways and vice versa. So this is just kind of a preamble to the semantic wasteland that we find ourselves in, uh, even at the best of times. So. Here's a nice um, schematic that represents a few different things that uh, it's always uh, nice to do for framing and to unpack. And so this is a kind of network node architecture in a way. So this is, you know, cryptocurrencies are literal networks. You know, people run client software. That means that your computer becomes a node, speaks the same protocol as other computers, and then you can transact or share information and so on. So as well as being literal networks, cryptocurrency networks and, and you know, blockchain related networks are also you know, uh, figurative, abstract networks, networks of information, networks of value, and um, you know, ways of interconnecting uh, uh, disparate entities. Um, but what's also going on in this picture is two hands shaking. And two hands shaking is the symbol of trust. Now, I know that in the COVID scene in 2020, handshaking is discouraged, but I think this, uh, the symbolic importance of the handshake uh, will, will live on. And so uh, cryptocurrencies are, and, so, and blockchain uh, uh, technologies are trust anchored networks. These are trust minimized environments where the, the blockchain and the network architecture does some of the heavy lifting so that uh, people may not need to trust an intermediary or a third party. So that's one of the very important things that I'm sure everyone's aware of, but it's always helpful to, to recap. And so cryptocurrencies are also global and borderless. And um, this means that there's often friction between the existing financial regulatory and you know, post-Westphalian nation state system uh, and this radically permissionless or radically borderless, um, you know, sometimes anarchic set of uh, technologies that we call cryptocurrencies. Um, and so maybe we need to uh, reimagine the kinds of institutions and the kinds of power structures that we have. And the cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology could help us do that. And so um, as well as thinking of these things as stacks of layers, you can also, as, as um, network uh, node graphs, you can also think of them as stacks of layers. And so on the left is um, a stack of layers representation of a cryptocurrency network um, that we developed after, based on some work by Vitalik Buterin in 2017 in their paper called The Meaning of Decentralization. And so we just added a little bit to that, particularly the monetary layer, uh, to uh, foreground the economic characteristics of these networks. And um, what's nice about using stack of layers models like these kind of OSI derived um, uh, concepts is that they enable us to do what you might think of as differential discretization. So we have a lot of words inside the credo of blockchain, like um, you know, blockchain itself, cryptocurrency, decentralization, permissionlessness, trust minimization, and so on, mutability, and so on. And these words can be very hard to define uh, in and of themselves, but it's quite helpful to have uh, something to hang a definition off. So, for example, I might uh, frame permissionlessness as something that occurs primarily on the um, social and political layer, where no subset of participants in a network are prevented from using uh, that particular uh, ledger. Whereas censorship resistance might be thought of as more of a protocol layer phenomenon, not pr completely, but, but, but partially. And um, then, 
you know, you can then use this kind of a stack of layers framing and go kind of abstractio ad absurdum to what I've got on the right here, which is what I call an ontological meta stack. And this is, you know, the different epistemes, different kind of knowledge traditions in, in academia and intellect and how they might be related in terms of, uh, you know, the scale on the Z axis might be increasing complexity or something like that. So I'm always wondering what comes next. So things like complexity science and systems engineering appear to be quite modern kind of um, meta epistemic um, uh, fields, which are quite syncretic and, and synthetic. They bring together a lot of different things. And so I wonder what are the meta disciplines that, that come after this? It'd be very interesting to see. So here's your friend of mine, uh, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, my former uh, high school buddy. Uh, and what he's doing in this picture is he's diffracting white light using a, a, a transparent prism into its constituent wavelengths. Um, and what we need to do with cryptoeconomic systems is actually the opposite. I'm sorry, Isaac. So what we need to do is we need to synthesize uh, the insights from technical fields such as cryptography, protocol engineering, distributed systems with the um, epistemic knowledge from economics, law, and social sciences, and even philosophy. And so this is, um, this is one of the goals that we have uh, as we build this, this journal to help mint this new field. And so let's talk about the state of things today. Let's have a progress update on uh, where we are with um, scholarly publishing, journals, and, and all the rest of it. And so I'm afraid to say things are not great in the world of scholarly publishing. And this article that was in The Guardian a little while ago, I highly recommend to get an idea of a sense of the history and progression of, of events to, to that have led us to where we are today. And so um, I'll very briefly recap the history of scholarly publishing. Uh, the Royal Society of London is the oldest learned institution in the world, and it also um, houses the oldest journal, which is called Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And that was also the first peer-reviewed journal. Um, indeed, the editor, George Gabriel Stokes, at one point, was the sole reviewer as well as editor, and before this became more of a kind of um, panelised uh, committee um, uh, endeavour broad-based endeavour. And so fast forward, and we have all these scholarly societies, like the Royal Society, so um, think about uh, American Medical Association, the Royal Society of Chemistry, and so on. And these would start journals uh, for the public good, essentially, not to make money, to cover costs. And what happened in the post-war period was that uh, some uh, enterprising public sector magnates saw an opportunity to outcompete these kind of... Um, uh, altruistically um, assembled scholarly publications. And uh, that's kind of how we've, and then these things consolidated, and that's how we've ended up with this, um, what you might call a publisher oligopoly, where you have this kind of half a dozen international conglomerates, uh, really with a chokehold over a great deal of uh, academic literature, to the point where um, you may be an academic and you may have public funding to do your work, and then when you publish that work in a journal, neither you nor um, members of the public that funded that work can access it. And so something seems to not be right there. And so one, this is one of the uh, many things that we're trying to address with the, with the journal. And so I'm going to go through these uh, bullet points in order and we can discuss um, some of the interesting things uh, that, um, that we've noticed. So one of the things here is on preprints and scooping. Now, this has particularly um, come to the fore in the last few months because of coronavirus, where the need for rapid publication of work prior to peer review, which can be a very slow and time-consuming process, uh, necessitated um, this shift in, in importance and, and, and adding gravitas to preprints and unreviewed work. And what has also led to is an increase in retractions and, um, you know, issues being found with the way that work is being done, disseminated, uh, calibrated, measured, and so on. And so this is really kind of um, the world at large, the larger world, seeing how the sausage is made with scholarly publishing and with scientific research. And you know, as with every sausage being made, it ain't as pretty as the end result. So um, I think, but I think it's important. I think it's important that people are getting wise to these things. And so one of the other things that we need to um, address in academia, one of the chief problems we have is this so-called publish or perish culture, where academics are under immense pressure to continue to publish in as high uh, uh, reputation journals as they can, but really the, the reputation is to publish, the, the incentive is to publish as many papers as you can in, in lots of different venues. And that will help you get promotions, tenure, prestigious appointments, and the like. 
And so I um, mentioned peer review already. Peer review is the human verification process that's at the heart of many academic and scholarly traditions. This is essentially a paper comes into a journal. This then paper gets sent out uh, anonymized, double blinded, so that the author and the reviewer don't know who each other are. And then uh, several experts in different, you know, in, in the same or different fields will take a look at this paper and evaluate it based on a set of criteria as set out by the editorial board. And so um, we're going to talk a little bit about how we're doing our peer review, but there's an awful lot of discussion about whether peer review is necessary at all. And so that's an interesting topic to discuss. Um, one of the other things that's very interesting, I'll get to later, is publishing economics. And this is something that um, is really coming to the fore now that this um, movement of open science and open access is gaining steam. And the final thing to talk about is uh, author's rights. And so, you know, very often these traditional publishers will take copyright. They will take control over um, the literary output of, of academics. And um, this is something that can lead to some perverse incentives that we're trying to avoid. So we're trying to be minimally invasive with um, how we accept uh, the, the, the conditions that we impose on published papers. So those are the, the, the things that we're trying to address, uh, particularly with crypto economic systems. And so let's talk about the story so far. And the story should always start with why. Why should we create a new journal? At present, there's no neutral, interdisciplinary, open access and high quality peer reviewed cryptocurrency publication venue. And that's because this is a new field. You know, Nakamoto's paper only came out well, less than 12, 12 years ago. And so in the, um, s s in the uh, academic timescale, this geological timescale of, of the university, this is actually just a blink of an eye. This is, um, you know, a couple of postdocs or a few PhD students. So, um, you know, we are still at very much at the beginning of, of, of all of this. And um, one of the things that uh, falls upon us is to create some of the infrastructure to help the field mature and uh, develop. And so one of the things that's very important to say is that, you know, we're building between the MIT Digital Currency Initiative and the MIT Press, we're building essential non-profit research infrastructure uh, for the Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series. And so I want to take a slight diversion to give some of the kind of uh, theoretical uh, background to how a journal might work inside a, a knowledge ecosystem, such as a, you know, a field or a set of fields. And so this comes from some work by uh, two of our program committee members, Jason Potts and Eleanor Rennie, and um, they wrote a paper several years ago called A Journal is a Club. And so this is based on the economics of club theory, uh, where we apply the idea of a journal as a knowledge club, which is jointly producing a shared resource or a local public good. That's, you know, the, the, the peer reviewed research, the, the verified outputs. And uh, what's happening, you know, the part of the process of this is that there's a, you know, group formation. So there's kind of a community forming, and that's something that we're very much you know, um, keen to, to help foster and develop. There's a series of rules. You know, the journal has various um, um, specifications, requirements, and so on, and expected benefits. Now, in this case, these benefits are non-financial because it's a scholarly endeavor. So the primary advantage is prestige, and the prestige is conferred by the exclusivity of the you know, opportunity to publish in the journal. And so one of the other, some of the other characteristics of, um, of uh, a club are that participation is voluntary, it's non-anonymously crowded, so you kind of know who's around. It's exclusive, so not everybody can, can get in. It's globally partitioned, and it's rationally constructed. And so those are just some of the kind of bits of background to, to how a club might work. Now, what's a bit different about a journal is that the papers that come out of the peer review process that are accepted are both the current outputs of the process, and they may also be the future inputs of the process into like you know, subsequent papers and, and, and research and so on. One other interesting thing to say is that um, producers and consumers in this case are not distinct sets. So the people writing the papers overlap quite heavily with the people that are reading the papers. Um, you know, this is you know, a relatively small field. So I think that uh, at present anyway, so I think that the overlap is probably quite tight at the moment. Um, but the real kind of nub, nubbin of this, the real point that we need to get to is that the shared good here is mutual attention to an idea. You know, the ideas in the papers and the kind of epistemic formation around crypto economic systems that we're trying to help foster here. And there's a little table here which people use to kind of map out where, where club goods uh, live in the, in the sphere of, of different kinds of production. And so depending on the amount of rivalry and the excludability, you have either private goods, club goods, common resources and public goods. And so club goods are in this situation where there's low rivalry but high excludability. Okay. 
moving on. Now, a little bit of the human background. And so uh, Crypto Economic Systems is a, a human endeavor. We have uh, quite a large team of people working behind the scenes to, to make all of this happen. And so we have three editors, uh, Neha Narula, who's the director of the MIT Digital Currency Initiative, Andrew Miller, who's an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and myself, Wasim al Sindi, also working with MIT Digital Currency Initiative. And we have a, a very imminent, eminent board of advisors uh, to help us to uh, um, navigate our way through this uh, this novel territory. And they range from um, uh, noted economists at Chicago Booth to um, inventors of cryptographic constructions, uh, Turing Medal winners, principal researchers at big techs, and uh, you know, former regulators and um, experts in the Bitcoin and Ethereum code bases. So it's really quite a range, and, and we're trying to help to synthesize and create links between academia and practice here. And so let's talk about the crypto economic system story so far. I'm just going to take a water break. Uh, Gab, you can try to edit this out. Okay, and now let's talk about the crypto economic system story so far. And so um, we kicked off in earnest with an uh, invited summit in October of last year at the MIT Media Lab with approximately 250 attendees and 60 talks, workshops and panels, really trying to kind of collectively um, brainstorm the open challenges and unsolved questions and the roadblocks and barriers to the maturation of, of this, this um, a nexus of, of, of disciplines as a new field. We then um, engaged on our, uh, uh, our first peer review season over the winter, received 80 papers uh, submitted um, and sent a subset of those to our 42 member peer review program committee across uh, disciplines. And from those, we selected 26 papers for our first flagship conference, Crypto Economic Systems 2020. And that took place at the MIT Media Lab uh, sorry, at uh, MIT, in early March, just before everything shut down for Corona. So this was you know, one of the last conferences before uh, the world really changed. So we're happy that we, we managed to, to, to um, uh, squeeze it in in time, but we were also uh, very mindful of any potential public health uh, implications, and we're very happy that um, very few of those seem to have arisen. So I just want to give you a very brief whistle-stop tour of the kinds of ranges of papers that we, we accepted and that were in the Crypto Economic Systems 20 program. So we had papers on uh, political economy, uh, ethics and ethical surveys, uh, the impossibility of, um, of resolving the existing financial system with uh, you know, automated and smart contract oriented ones, and taking systems engineering and complex science, complexity science perspectives to crypto economic systems. And so um, we are in the advanced stages of preparing our um, first issue, the prototypical issue zero of the journal. And I just want to show you a preview of how that is looking on our platform, which is called PubPub, which is a, a beautiful a digital substrate for, for publishing all kinds of things. It's very experimental and, and forward thinking. And that is uh, arising out of a collaboration between um, MIT Press and MIT Media Lab as the Knowledge Futures Group. So they do some great work over there, particularly with PubPub and Underlay. So um, I want to now shift gears and we'll talk about some of the um, you know, structural um, issues and things that we've encountered and that we're trying to, to address. So one of the challenges with interdisciplinarity and also multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, transversality, is that um, the existing structures, particularly in academia, may not reward them in the same way that, that um, status quo research is, is is rewarded. And so I like to think of universities, each department or faculty in university, as a little tower, a little ivory tower of its own. And the incentives for, for staff members are to climb the little ladder in that ivory tower. And that's how you get your professorship or your, you know, you join the deanery or, or whatever, whatever it is you're looking for. And so the incentives are a little bit asymmetric. So it's more incentive aligned for people to stay in their lane, so to speak, than to kind of uh, be transverse. Although that, that is probably changing. The other thing to say is that there's a lack of harmony in the, in the publishing traditions between fields. And so, uh, for example, in a law, law reviews are tend to be run by students. In economics, we have, if, you want to, if you're particularly in the American system and you're looking for tenure, you are trying to publish in one of half a dozen monolithic journals that has existed for 50 or 100 years. And in computer science, reflecting the speed at which the field moves, um, uh, work tends to be um, 
foregrounded at conferences first and then um, uh, published his proceedings after the fact. And so we have all of these different kind of incompatibilities. And there's another uh, concept which is uh, outlined in the abstract on the, on the slide there, which I, I think is very interesting to explore, um, which is for, from a, a philosopher called Nathan Ballantyne at Ford, Ford University, and that's epistemic trespassing. So this is the idea that, uh, you know, we live in this age of interdisciplinarity now. So we're all epistemic trespassers. We're all judging fields and matters outside of our expertise. And that's fine as long as we acknowledge that. But there is a tension there between epistemic trespassing and expert culture, which uh, obviously universities are particularly um, ingrained in. So that tension remains to be seen how that tension will be resolved. I hope that a new generation of interdisciplinary thinkers and researchers will, will emerge. And um, I see myself in, in, in that mould as well. So one of the interesting things that we've noticed is that um, this idea of anti-disciplinarity, this idea of, you know, imagine the network node map I showed you earlier. Each of the nodes, each of the points, is an episteme, like mathematics or chemistry or computer science or economics. And then the edges, they represent interdisciplinary, interdiscipl interdisciplinary approaches. Multidisciplinary approaches are superpositions of multiple nodes. And anti-disciplinary approaches are in the voids. So you're kind of looking where people don't go. Um, but what we find is there's a varying amount of tolerance for antidisciplinarity uh, in different fields. And so this is something that's very hard to, to harmonise. But again, I hope that the, um, you know, as culture develops and time goes on, this thing will get easier. And there's also a question mark about funding. So funding, uh, especially in universities, tends to be determined by uh, committees on, on grant-giving bodies. And that is influenced by things like government policy. Um, and so it may be that those are... Um, leaning traditional, leaning conservative, and it makes it harder to fund more adventurous and interdisciplinary research. Okay, I want to talk now a little bit more about peer review. And so publishing cultures vary across fields, as we said earlier, and interdisciplinary service may not be uh, as recognised in, in, in accordance with the previous um, slide's findings. We also find that practice and theory, ac academia and practice, have very different interactions across fields as well. And uh, what we're trying to do is find ways that we can um, mitigate this tragedy of the common situation with peer review. Can we incentivize peer review? Can we help people um, make it a priority? You know, everyone's very busy, especially experts in academia and industry, and it's uh, very hard for them to give up a lot of their time to, to engage in this laborious uh, uh, peer review verification process. And so we're trying to find ways that we can um, incentivize or, and uh, you know, respect their attention and their time. But at the same time, we're trying to find ways that we can improve the peer review process, speed it up, make it more transparent and make it function better. And so we're also looking at ways we can expedite peer review. Um, and so, yes, we're very open to ideas on, on all of those things. So happy to hear any thoughts you might have. One of the other things we're looking at and uh, what we've, uh, we've uh, employed so far is an is a a variant of open peer review where we want to publish an output from the review process. So what happens normally is uh, papers will get sent to a conference or a journal, they will get reviewed, and then the reviews will get sent to the authors at the time of the outcome, and then that's pretty much it. The reviews basically go in the bin. And so this seems like a very um, inefficient way of, um, of re respecting uh, the scarce re reviewer attention, which is a valuable resource. And so um, we want to also encourage transparency. So we want to use uh, this, the, these review outputs as a way of, of, of seeding debate in the community. And I think that's very important for us to, uh, as a field, as an industry, a nascent industry, to build legitimacy. We also like to encourage debate, which I think um, is, is already, um, we've already been succeeding at that as a result of the conferences and the review phases. And we also, you know, we want to set higher standards. We always want things to, to be better and stronger and more legitimate and more credible. And so here's an interesting idea that we've been exploring, which I'd be very interested to hear anyone's ideas on, suggestions. And this idea of peer-to-peer -peer review, or mercenary peer review, as some people call it. The idea being that we can go back in time, look at any paper, any time period, any discipline. We can uh, uh, take perspectives from different fields. We can uh, look at papers in, in a new context, in a new light after time has passed. And we can maybe pick out uh, errors or inconsistencies or shortcomings in those um, you know, for, for, for additional clarity for, for the research, uh, the corpus of research going forwards. So happy to hear any suggestions on that. And I just wanted to show you a little bit of how the sausage is made, because I think this is very interesting for, for um, even academics that engage as reviewers. They may not be seeing these kinds of statistics. So uh, this is some of the results that came out of our first peer review phase. On the uh, left, you have 
um, reviewer average scores, and on the right you have paper average scores. And what we noticed is that, um, so the way that the review process works is papers come in from the call for papers, we assign them to reviewers, then the reviewers write their reviews based on criteria that we give, and they give them a score, a quality score between one and five, where one is a reject, two is a weak reject, three is a weak accept, four is an accept, and five is a strong accept. So this is like, you know, from one to five, how strongly, uh, how um, uh, the reviewer views the quality of the paper. But what we found was that there was a, a heterogeneity and an isotropy between um, the scores that people from more technical backgrounds would give and people from other backgrounds might give. And we call this, you know, loosely disciplinary bias. And so uh, we're trying to find ways that we can overcome that and, and calibrate for that. And so we did some kind of statistical analysis and we used that as a sanity check to make sure that any uh, borderline papers and public uh, borderline papers and submissions uh, were given a, a fair um, a fair go if their reviews tended to be on the harsh side, for example. So I want to say something about the interaction of academia and practice here. Um, you know, cryptocurrencies did not come from the academy. The, you know, the Nakamoto white paper got dropped on a PDF server in 2008. And much of the work that predated it came from practice rather than academia. And so in many ways, academia is playing catch up here. And part of the reason for that is uh, in academia, the incentives in the culture are to be very thorough and slow moving, whereas in industry, uh, the incentives are aligned to move fast and hopefully not break things. So, um, and I don't think I need to tell anyone um, right now in the COVID scene, when all, every campus, every university campus is closed, that there are increasing structural, economic and ontological problems at universities. Like, you know, what is the point of a university in today's age? And uh, maybe publishing uh, can be one of those things that, you know, helps to build a bridge between uh, uh, academics and industrial experts and helps to give the university a, a new place in, in the 21st century. Uh, one interesting trend, uh, you know, in the converse to that is that big techs such as Microsoft, Amazon and Google are starting to snap up very high quality researchers that might otherwise be, um, you know, professors or, or senior researchers. And there seems to be an increasing uh, compatibility of the kind of research track career uh, that is, you know, maybe even rivaling or surpassing the quality of the career that you might have in academia there. And so, and also, just lastly to say that things like reviewing papers, we call them scholarly service, and there may be different appreciations of that outside academia. So, for example, if you work at a company that doesn't really um, engage in the process of, of, um, of uh, scholarly publishing and knowledge production, um, then the management may not appreciate uh, the amount of time and effort that's required to keep this kind of peer review uh, endeavour going forwards. So, I just wanted to show you something that takes a step back and give you some historical context, some light-hearted historical context about academic service. So academics and, and sorry, scholarly service. So academics and industrialists are very busy people. There's many pressures on their time. And um, asking them to do service may mean that they have to take their eyes off something else. But this is an ongoing problem. So this is a tweet going over some historical issues that were etched into a cuneiform tablet 2,700 years ago by a group of Middle Eastern astronomers who were complaining that um, their time was being split between administrative duties and research duties. So this is an ongoing problem. And so I just want to say, you know, wrap up by saying something very quick about open access, which is close to the idea of, of open source and um, the idea of the publishing economics around that. So article processing charges, where um, journals charge the authors for submitting, are, are pretty bad. They, they lead to all kinds of perverse incentives for the journal, where um, people are setting up now kind of scam journals, predatory journals. And as a result, open access has a bit of a bad rep around academics at the moment. And so this is a vicious circle that um, it falls upon many of us to try and uh, to break out of by producing good quality open access uh, publications. And there's a very big problem with the economics of open access, uh, where um, uh, you pay a fee at the start, regardless of whether that uh, paper is rejected in 15 seconds or accepted. And so there are all kinds of problems and suggestions for how to unbundle that. And so I just want to leave, the, uh, leave you with uh, the final questions about whether we should set up a preprint server, how we can manage concurrent submissions, so papers can go to more than one uh, venue, how to do conflicts of interest, uh, managing submission management platforms. We're looking for event hosts, which obviously is a bit difficult at the moment, but I'll mention it anyway. And we're also bootstrapping through a fundraising and ecosystem uh, 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 funding drive. And so I want to thank you for your attention and draw your attention to Journal Issues Europe, which comes out soon, and the call for papers for Crypto Economic Systems 21, which will be announced shortly. And so my name is Wasim, and you can reach me at editor at cryptoeconomic.systems. Thank you very much for your time. 
Open, trade where you want to, when you want to. Huobi, your trustworthy crypto exchange. Thanks to everyone for tuning in for the security and cryptography track of CESC 2020. Next, we will be presenting the economics track, which will be hosted by Guido Molinari from Prism Group. With that, I'd like to pass it over to Guido. I hope that you all enjoy the rest of the day. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Guido Molinari, managing partner at Prism Group. Uh, and welcome to the economic stream at the Crypto Economic Security Conference, CSC 2020. Uh, very excited about the conference that we are hosting this year. And before I go into today's agenda and tell you a little bit about the great lineup of speakers we have, I want to remind you that, you know, as this conference is being broadcasted live, you will be able to ask uh, questions to the speakers. Uh, you'll be able to just type your questions and the speaker will see the question and be able to um, reply right away. Um, also, uh, please, you know, if you're going to tweet or, you know, post anything, uh, use the uh, official hashtag of the conference uh, at Unitize 2020. Um, so without further ado, um, a little bit about us, Prism Group. Um, we are, as I said, the co-host of this year, CSC. Um, Prism Group, we are an economic consulting company. Uh, working at the forefront of blockchain technology. We have been in the space for about three years, working both on permissionless and permission network. Uh, we were co-founded by a group of Harvard-trained economists and that uh, came from a mixed background of technology companies, consulting, and academia. Uh, we're very blessed to have among our senior advisor a Nobel Prize-winning economist and professor of Harvard University, uh, beyond our solo engagements, we do have joint offerings with leading firms in the space, including Flipside Crypto in the economic analytics um, um, space uh, with the offering of the Crypto Economic Analytics Suite that we launched earlier this year at Consensus, uh, with a leading security review firm Trello Bits, uh, a joint offering in economic security, and uh, with uh, the development shop Simba Chain, uh, developing jointly with them government solutions. Uh, as a firm, we've long been very, very um, connected to both the academic education world and the research one, and that's why we're so excited about bringing the lineup of speakers we have this year at CSC, because we truly believe that there is great value in connecting practitioners that are working every day in the industry and building these amazing new networks, and academics and economic researchers from both the private and government sector that are looking at solving the great economic questions that still remain. Um, just to mention a couple of the initiatives we've been involved on the education side, we have uh, worked on the MIT Management Sloan School Executive Education course. This was launched by, at the time, Professor Catalini at MIT. Uh, Christian is now, as many of you know, uh, the head economist at Novi and was the co-creator of Libra and is going to be one of our speakers today giving us an update on Libra 2.0. Uh, we've also worked uh, with Columbia Business School on their um, uh, executive education course and we have actually Professor Professor Igigar from, uh, from Columbia presenting today a very interesting paper on the economics of permission networks, so really thinking about uh, the you know enterprise consortia that are being created. Um, on the research side, we have ourselves presented research at many institutions, and we're very pleased to see researchers from several of these today with us at CSC presenting their latest paper. Um, so without uh, more um, on that, I would like to present you, this is the roster of speakers of today's uh, CSC economic stream. Uh, as I mentioned, a really an amazing group of leading economic researchers from private 
academic and government institutions. Uh, we are very, very pleased to welcome back a few of the speakers from last year, from CSC 2019 that we held in San Francisco. Uh, among them, uh, Dr. Christian Catalini from now Novi, formerly known as Calibra. Uh, Christian is going to present uh, a, about economics of Libra 2.0 following their recent you know, new white paper published in April of this year. Also among the speakers that are returning to CSC this year, we have Professor Rod Garrett from the University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, Rod is going to present uh, his latest paper on why fixed cost uh, matter for proof of work based cryptocurrency and share some of the insights around that uh, that are contrary actually to man many of the previous research paper published by other academics. Um, we also have coming back uh, Professor Marco DiMaggio from our business school. If you guys remember last year, Marco presented about the economics of stablecoin Terra, where he has been a co-researcher. Terra is a leading stablecoin um, protocol based in South Korea. Uh, also coming back uh, is Professor Richard Holden, who was one of the opening speakers last year at CSC 2019. And this year is going to uh, connect from Sydney, Australia, and present his latest paper on the law of economics of blockchain. Uh, we're also very, very pleased uh, that a number of new speakers are joining us this year at CSC 2020. Among them, um, we are very well, uh, very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Garth Bachman from the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, Dr. Bachman is going to present his um, paper that he recently uh, uh, published together with Dr. Gene Fleming, also from the Federal Reserve Board, on global demand for basket bag stable coins. Uh, this is the first paper coming out of Federal, the Federal Reserve Board looking at uh, blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, and we're hoping to see more in the future. Um, also um, coming this year to the conference, uh, connecting from Cape Town is Professor Kopier, Kopier Georg. He's going to present some of his applied research that he did with the South Africa Reserve Bank and some you know, findings from that on CBDC, so practical consideration when issuing a CBDC as they have um, in the experiment in South Africa. Um, also presenting this year are uh, Professor Barry Aiken Green uh, from UC Berkeley uh, that will be discussing Libra and its discontents, so giving a different perspective from, from Libra, and we look forward to hearing his findings. Um, we also have as I mentioned in the introduction, uh, Professor Garrett Inigar from Columbia University. Uh, Professor Inigar is going to present a paper he uh, recently published with uh, Fahad Sahale, who was one of the presenters at last year's CSC. And the paper is on the economics of permission blockchain adoption. So thinking about really the enterprise side, also thinking more on the enterprise side of things is going to be the presentation of Professor Hannah Albarda from New York University. Um, Hannah is going to present our paper that she recently published on smart contracts, IoT sensor and efficiency, and really looking at how important is linking IoT sensor to smart contracts, so solving really that oracle problem that we have often uh, seen um, as an as a, as a issue in enterprise blockchain. Um, and uh, last but, but not least, uh, we are very happy to see Professor Diksha Gupta from Carnegie Mellon University joining us this year and presenting our paper on initial coin offering as a commitment to competition. Uh, and uh, concluding the you know, list of speakers, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Stephanie Herder, one of the founding economists at Prison Group. Uh, Stephanie is going to present some of our recent findings from the uh, joint um, uh, analytics product that I mentioned that we have developed with Flipside Crypto called the Crypto Economic Analytics Suite. And she's going to talk about how to measure the economic health of, net of blockchain networks and thinking in, in that regard uh, about topics such as the level of decentralization of blockchain network, the driver of um, token price, and the level of fairness in rewards. Um, so, and you know, uh, I, I'm your host for today. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our first speaker. But before that, if anyone wants to learn more about the work that we do at Prism Group and you know the type of um, research that we publish, I welcome you to visit our website, www.prismgroup.io, or feel free to contact us at our email or follow us on social media. And we do have a monthly newsletter that uh, so, uh, summarizes some of the latest research um, uh, that gets published. And you, know, you can subscribe at the following link. Thank you very much and looking forward to welcome uh, our speakers now.
I'm very pleased to welcome our first speaker of the CSC 2020 economic stream, uh, my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Herder. Uh, Stephanie is a founding economist at Prism Group, and she's going to be presenting uh, a, our findings on measuring the economic health of blockchain networks coming from our recent product uh, recently launched together with Crypto, Crypto the Crypto Economic Analytics Suite. Uh, Stephanie, welcome. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to CESC 2020. Uh, my name is Ste Dr. Stephanie Herter. I'm a founding economist at PRISM Group. Uh, we're an economics and governance advisory for specifically for blockchain projects. And then today I'm going to be talking about how do we think about measuring the economic health of blockchain networks and blockchain-based projects. So at PRISM Group, we've worked with dozens of permissionless and permissioned blockchain-based projects. Um, and throughout our work, we get questions over and over again across platforms um, having to do with what we would call the economic health of the blockchain systems. These questions are things like, what are the levers driving my token price? Is it entirely speculation or does my uh, token have fundamental value? Um, are my mining rewards fair and sufficiently distributed, right? And are, am I rewarding validators or miners in proportion to the resources that they're contributing? Um, is my platform user-friendly for consumers? And I don't mean from the UI point of view, which is obviously important, but from the economic value point of view. Um, and so we've thought a lot about how do we think about measuring these and how do we think about measuring them in a way that's potentially comparable across different projects. And as I said, we view these as questions of economic health. So economics has um, many different, different definitions, but we really think about it as um, the study of choice. So when you're thinking about economics and especially microeconomics, what you're thinking about is how are people who in this case are using your blockchain platform interacting with the system and what decisions are they making? And are these decisions in line with what you want them to do? Uh, these decisions can be you know, as simple as, does a customer of your project return and use it again? Or um, are miners and validators colluding or anything like this? These are all choices that they're making. And we think about economics as studying the reason why we make these choices. And when we think about what leads to economic outcomes, there are really two different sets of behaviors and parameters that we focus on. So the first is a user's individual preferences, right? So I am a person and I have a stockpile of GPUs. I'm trying to figure out how to make a return on them. Um, maybe I have specific constraints regarding my access to capital, regarding my access to um, low cost electricity, and my goal is to make some money from mining. And this is going to interact with the economic design of the particular platform. What do your block rewards look like? What are incentive mechanisms? What are market mechanisms that you've introduced? And together, um, these create economic outcomes. And so it's important when you think about, you know, most projects, either explicitly or implicitly, have some set of economic outcomes that they want, right? It could be that they want 100 validators. It could be that they want 50 dApps. Um, it could be that they want their consumers to interact or their users to interact with them every month for a year, whatever it is. Um, these are really a combination of the preferences and constraints of the people who are coming to use your platform and the economic design that you've chosen. And many of you who have seen our talks will be well familiar with this framework. This is the house. Um, and these are the levers of economic design. And I'm not going to dig too deeply into this. But at a high level, there are many more levers that impact economic outcomes on your particular project than you would think. So a great example for this, it, um, you know, for example, a lot of people in blockchain are thinking about the DeFi space. And DeFi um, projects tend to use a lot of auctions, right? They need a pricing mechanism. They want it to be relatively adaptive so that they use an auction design. And it turns out that there are books upon books upon books of how you can design auctions and how the change in the design can impact the change in the behavior of the people who are participating in the auction. A really great example that I like is that 
Um, it turns out if you're familiar with eBay, you know that eBay auctions end after a finite period of time. It used to be that Amazon would have similar auctions for decentralized sale of goods, but those auctions would continue until somebody stopped bidding, right? There was no preset end time. And it turns out that this has a huge impact on how users and customers interact with the platform. Um, and that's just one sub bullet. So the takeaway here is there's a ton of different design decisions that impact the system and the economic environment you provide and therefore um, what people who interact with your project will choose to do. Um, and so when we think about evaluating the economic health of a blockchain project, and this can be a protocol too, this doesn't have to be a consumer facing DAP, this can be something quite technical. You know, we start with, you know, is your project achieving the outcomes that you want, right? Let's sit down with the team and articulate what is it that you want your project to do? What do you want people to do? What do you want users to, how do you want users to interact with each other? Um, we get a lot of questions about benchmarking. And this is one of the reasons that we've started to think more about how do we um, think about key metrics, which is what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the talk. Um, how do the outcomes, you know, we get asked all the time, how do the outcomes on my platform, the decentralization, the token rate of return, the staking rewards, compare to other platforms? And then finally, how do we think about changing the design to improve uh, maybe those metrics that we don't really love that much, that aren't really up to what we wanted? And so one of the fundamental challenges in answering some of these questions is that many of them require a common metric or a common way of measuring to be able to compare across platforms, right? If you're thinking about um, decentralization, which I'll talk about in a little bit, or staking rate of return or fairness for validator rewards, it's not enough to just say, well, here's what I think this is, and therefore by my personal standard, you know, my, my platform is doing great. Um, it's incredibly helpful to have a commonly understood set of measures that help you gauge both over time and across different projects, whether you're achieving what you set out to do. And this is something that's very, very common for national economies, right? So here I have a, a screenshot from one of the data products for the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. They produce a report every six months, um, which takes which puts together, assembles, and publishes a set of basic economic health metrics. And you can see them here. They're things you've heard of. They're things like gross domestic product, inflation, mm -hmm. unemployment rate. And they're able to collect them for the vast majority of nations in the world. And each of these metrics has its own problems. None of them is perfect. Obviously, there's been a lot of discussion about the pitfalls with GDP. Uh, the unemployment rate has problems. But just the act of putting understandings of how are these different metrics defined and how are they put together and how do they compare is a great way to start a conversation about the relative health of different countries and different countries' economies. And one of the things you'll notice about these different metrics that are used for countries is that all of them include some kind of behavior or choice decision made by people. Right. So they have to do with, you know, it's a combination. For example, let's take the unemployment rate. Obviously, there's the state of the labor market, but the unemployment rate is a function of the hiring and employment decisions that businesses are making, as well as the decisions made by people in the labor market. So it's a combination of the surrounding sort of economic fundamentals, as well as decisions made by participants in the system. Um, and that's what gives it such force. It really is an economic outcome that combines both of those levers that I talked about, the economic fundamentals as well as the decisions that people are making. Um, and while there's been a lot of progress on metrics in the blockchain space, these types of outcome-based measures aren't really popular yet, right? So there are a lot of different projects that are working on dashboards and metrics, um, here I've taken a screenshot from uh, the Coindesk crypto economics suite, but this is by no means, you know, comprehensive. But here, for example, if you look at some of their network uh, metrics that they're using, there are transaction counts that's very helpful. There's transaction fees. But for example, if you wanted to say, you know, is my 
consensus process working well? Is my consensus process decentralized? Are my block rewards doing what they're supposed to? This doesn't really answer any of those questions that we hear over and over again, right? So we're thinking about how do we, what are the economic um, outcomes that we need to measure that really take into account people's decision making and also answer the questions that we hear from platforms over and over and over again. So let me talk through an example to add some concreteness. So perhaps if you wanted to list so sort of the fundamental goals of blockchain as, a, as an industry or a set of projects, you know, saying that they want to achieve decentralization, if it's not the first, it's among the top goals that mo almost every project, you know, lists. And when we talk to projects about, you know, when you say you want to be decentralized, what exactly do you mean? We get a huge number of answers. So we had um, one client who was building a protocol and said they wanted to have a highly decentralized consensus process. And we said, what do you, what does that mean to you? And they said, well, we need at least a hundred validators. Um, another one that I actually like is um, a project team said that you know, we're decentralized if we, the founders, could disappear and the platform would still run. Another definition we hear is no one entity controls the system, right? And these are great answers. And I think particularly the second one is a great framework. But if you wanted to actually sit down and say, okay, let's measure how decentralized, let's say, uh, the consensus process is for different protocols and see how they measure up. None of these answers is really getting you anywhere in terms of being able to quantify and compare. And this is a problem that um, we worked with the open application network, the OAN with. Um, so the OAN has a token called Aon. Um, they launched as a uh, proof of work network. Um, and originally, you know, just had a standard proof of work consensus mechanism. And what they found a few months after launch was that their consensus process was very, very centralized. So they basically had three mining pools that were providing all of the block production. Um, and this was not what they wanted. So they went through the process of developing something called the unity consensus mechanism, which alternated between proof of work and proof of stake. The, one of the main goals of introducing this new consensus mechanism was to expand the number of uh, different participants who were able to produce blocks and gain block rewards. So we worked with them on the design of this. And one of the questions that they had for us back in the fall and when we worked with them again in the spring was, okay, we feel like we've decentralized our protocol um, but how do we know that block production is now more decentralized? Is there a way that we can actually measure whether the consensus process and specifically block production, which is what we care about when we think about distributing power and influence, is actually more decentralized than it was before? Um, and there are a number of different ways that we measure this, but one of the uh, measurements that we focused on was called the HHI. And this is a standard measure when you study the economics of an economy and you're trying to understand to what extent is a particular industry run by a monopolist. Um, and so we've taken the HHI and adapted it to make it a little bit easier to use. But the basic idea here is that when you have an HHI of one, it means that your entire industry is run by a monopolist. In the terms of consensus and block production, this would mean that a single address or a single miner was, was producing all of your blocks. Like you only have one. As you move towards zero, you become more highly decentralized. And so you, um, you know, the goal, if you're saying you really want to be highly decentralized, is getting your HHI as close to zero as you can. And this is a metric that you can compute using on-chain data, right? You take the past X number of blocks and you compute the particular formula and you can tell from, you know, the... The, just the history of block production on chain, exactly what this metric is. So it's something that's both comes from economics, has a long history and a long intuition, um, but also is relatively easy to compute. And so in working with the OAN, and one of the motivations for this project was that um, together with the OAN and Flipside Crypto, which is a, a leading blockchain data company, um, we developed a dashboard 
for the OON to think about measuring some of these, these questions. And I'm gonna go back and forth between the dashboard um, and my, my slides. So you can see here, here's the dashboard, we'll be coming back and forth. Um, but what we have here is actually this metric. So we worked with the team and we computed this particular metric of centralization for their block production. Um, and here we have the HHI. And again, uh, the closer you get to zero, the more decentralized your block production is. So if you're very close to zero, um, it means that a wide variety of different participants are getting to produce um, blocks that are added to the main chain. Um, if you're getting close to one, it means you have relatively fewer mining pools or staking pools or validator pools, whatever you wanna, whatever your particular protocol is using. Um, and so what we found when we worked with the Aon was that um, we were able to quantify just how much their decentralization had improved by changing consensus mechanism. So this purple line here is their measure of centralization or decentralization for proof of work only. So this is the consensus protocol that they had before. Um, and once they added in proof of stake to their proof of work, they were able to decrease their decentralization or improve their decentralization down to this green line. So they dropped from 0.3 to 0.4 down to closer to 0.1. So this looks like a substantial improvement. Um, and so the other question that they had for us was how does this compare to Ethereum and Bitcoin? And because we have a standard well-defined measure of how decentralized is block production and mining, we can compare it to this is the actual number for Ethereum, it's about 0.17, and this is the actual number for Bitcoin, which is about 0.09. And so you can see that the change in consensus mechanism um, took us from um, relatively centralized block production down to something that's more competitive with Ethereum. Um, and just having is well-defined, economically motivated, um, measure that could be computed and compared gives us a lot of information, right? I mean, this gives us a benchmark of what does Ethereum look like? Um, one of the things that, that we noticed having gone through this was that even the numbers for Ethereum and Bitcoin um, are still not super decentralized. So this is, Bitcoin's number is approximately equivalent to having 10 block producers. Like if you had 10 block producers in a row and each produced a block in order, you'd get about the same number there. And Ethereum is closer to having five or six. So even though this is far more decentralized than the OAN and they've improved, um, it's still not 100 miners, right? 100 miners would be very, very close to zero. Um, so another thing this having this standard metric highlighted for us was that there's still a ways to go in decentralization just in general across major projects. So going back to slides, um, I think this is a great example. Um, and you know, having worked with a particular project to think about what exactly do they wanna answer and why is it important to them was very helpful. Um, and to, again, as I mentioned, um, one of the things we've been working on at Prism Group is moving towards this shared standard set of economic metrics, right? Well, how can we put together a set of metrics that apply across projects that let us address those key questions that we have in the front, had, um, that I talked about in the front of the presentation. Um, so we are working with Flipside Crypto, again, a leading data analytics platform. They specialize in chain walking, which is uh, the collection and standardization and analysis of on-chain and sometimes off-chain data. Um, and we've built a tool called the Crypto, Crypto Economic Analytics Suite, that answer some of these questions. Um, and when we think about economic health, specifically in a blockchain network, one of the key things we're trying to get away from, which you see in a lot of um, metrics that are commonly used, is that the metrics that are used in the industry tend to focus only on the token, right? You hear about token market cap, you hear about circulating supply, you'll hear about change in prices but you don't hear a lot about sort of how do you think about measuring things like decentralization of block production, which are fundamental to security, but not necessarily token related. Um, so when we're thinking about how do we measure economic health, and we think about uh, the value of whatever the platform is to different groups of stakeholders. So obviously there's token holders, token holders get lots of attention, um, but there's also validators. 
right? Are validators being rewarded fairly for their contributions? Does any particular validator have excessive market power? Um, are the incentives that are being provided strong enough to keep and attract validators who had security to your particular project? And then for users, if I'm a user using a token with a means of payment token, you know, how convenient is it for me to send money? How much am I paying in fees compared to the amount I'm sending? Um, is the pricing mechanism for the fees working? All of these different things are, you know, is our fees excessively volatile? These are all um, economic outcomes that materially impact whether people actually find value in using a particular blockchain project. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the other standard metrics that we are working on um, that we've thought through and we think are very helpful um, in applying to particular projects over time and then also comparing across different protocols. So for the token economics, what we, you know, what everybody wants to know is what is driving token prices, right? Um, and if you see movement in token price, is it entirely driven by speculation? Is there fundamental value driving this? Is this changing over time? Um, so getting at a, an economically motivated token price decomposition is really, really helpful to a lot of projects. In particular, and this was something that we was emphasized a lot when we were working with the AM team is if you're thinking about develop, if you're a founding team thinking about developing and moving forward or a particular project, it is really difficult to manage a token whose entire value is speculation, right? If you're trying to think about what is the size of the block reward and tokens that I'm going to give to attract validators or miners, Having a token whose price is jumping all over the place because it's entirely speculation driven makes your life a lot harder, right? It's also harder to manage the expectations of investors if your entire token is speculation driven in its price. So this is something that has a lot of, of secondary impacts on uh, different stakeholder groups. So when thinking about measuring economic health of a token, um, one of the things we did before jumping into what's driving the token price was we wanted to set up a system or a set of metrics that would allow you to compare a token to a regular currency, right? So for any major currency, the euro, the dollar, um, the central bank, in this case, it's uh, the St. Louis Fed uh, for the dollar, but this occurs everywhere, maintains um, databases of different metrics, right? So of the total currency in the economy, um, how much of it is at different levels of liquidity? That's M1, M2, that those are different levels of liquidity of, of currencies. What's the, what's the currency velocity, right? Right now in the US, we are suffering from a severe economic recession due primarily to a reduction in velocity of the dollar. Um, and then digging into what is basically the equivalent of GDP for a particular token, how much actual economic activity as opposed to speculative trading is occurring, um, and how do we measure sort of the total value in terms of goods and services sold that a project um, is currently taking place. And this allows you to really start to think about these tokens as a currency, right? Which many cases, that's what the token wants to be. The founding team wants the token to be a currency. So let's start to look at its numbers like we would do with any major currency. And then once we have these different pieces, um, the exact decomposition of a token's fundamental value is going to be depend on what the token is used for. Every token is a little bit different. Um, but for example, you have a token that's a means of payment. Um, so the value, the fundamental value of the token in terms of its economics are going to depend on whether, how, much, how often it's used to pay for goods and services. You could have staking returns, which add to the fundamental economic value of a token. There's a whole bunch of different um, uses that any token can have. So the exact formula and algorithms that are used to figure out speculative versus non-speculative activity are a little bit different. Um, however, for Aon, we have a combination means of payment and staking token. And just digging in here, let me briefly switch over back to the dashboard. When we took a look at what was driving the fundamental value of the Aon token, we actually found that they had done a really great job building up their economic fundamentals. 
Um, so this navy blue line is their 90 day trailing token price. And we found that probably 70% of their token um, price could be attributed to users wanting to use the token to interact with dApps, to buy goods and services, as opposed to speculating through an exchange. Um, and there was also a modest contribution of staking. So they offer staking rewards on the order of a couple million dollars a year. Um, and that was providing not a huge, but a, a almost a cent bump to their token price. And this green line, this green line here was the speculative remainder. Um, so what we found as we worked with the AN team was that they had actually done a really good job. And they're a team that's very focused on developing their DAP ecosystem. So perhaps it wasn't surprising um, that this was, you know, their token is relatively um, fundamentals driven in its price. Um, but as I mentioned, this gives them, um, this lets them know, first of all, that their strategy is working and it gives them more levers to think about how do they control the token price as opposed to um, finding out that your token price is 90% speculation and uh, there's really nothing you can do aside from, you know, social media activity um, to manage the price in a way that's useful for you. And finally, just briefly, as I mentioned, you know, we talked a bit before about decentralization in block production, um, but there's a lot of questions regarding uh, validator and miner influence that don't tend to get captured in standard industry metrics, um, but are really useful to have and to compare across different platforms. So the types of qualitative questions that we've turned into numbers are things like, does a single block producer have disproportionate influence? Are the, are the mining rewards sufficient? Is the allocation of rewards across miners fair? And in that, um, are miners who contribute more resources such as hash power or staking and proof of stake network getting proportionally more rewards as part of the consensus process? And so these are some we've thought through, and these are some of the metrics that we've developed. Um, if we had more time, I'd walk through how they're put together and the example we put together in AN. Um, but these are numbers that can be computed using on-chain data that give a, a better idea that really can be compared across different projects. And let me see, I think I have time for one more. This is one of my favorites. Um, when we were working with the Aon team back in November of 2019, one of the questions that we got from their team all the time was, are staking rewards big enough, right? Are we providing a competitive return? And in this case, it's not just compared to other projects, it's a compared to other investment opportunities, right? If you're thinking about a staker who's deciding whether to stake tokens or to cash out and go get return from something else, you want to understand are you giving sufficient return to attract the capital that you want? Um, so we built a set of metrics measuring real and nominal incentive power. So this is the rate of return that a staker gets in this particular case in the OON for staking their tokens. And we have it in USD and we have it in Aon currency. And what you can see is that this has changed over time, but the equilibrium staking return for a staker in this system is right around 5% in real terms. Um, and what's so interesting about that is this is basically exactly what you would want. Um, so if you think about the you know, benchmark rate of return to capital, it's typically between five and 10%. Um, and what's unusual about blockchain platforms and this one in particular is that the rate of return to staking is determined in part by how many people are staking, right? So if you're offering 20%, you're gonna get more tokens staked the rate of return is going to go down because the total amount of rewards is fixed. So what you can see here is that in equilibrium, the staking return has really balanced out to about 5%, which is exactly what you would expect. And so one can imagine that it's not going to go much below this because 5% is sort of the, the minimum return you need to offer. And if the team were to increase the amount of rewards given in staking, you would see, you would expect to see um, an increase in participation, this would go up sort of temporarily, 
um, and then come back down as more people choose to stake their capital to get some of the additional rewards. And again, this is something that, you know, this is a metric that not only can be computed for a blockchain platform, but can be computed for any asset. And so it starts to add quantification to this very fuzzy question of, am I giving enough rewards and what is the return to being a staker on my platform? Um, and I think I won't have time to go through these, but just the last set that we, we thought about or what it was about ease of use. And if I'm a consumer who wants to use a token, particularly as a currency, um, how does it compare to PayPal? Right. If I'm constantly having to worry about changes in fee transaction fees where I can go to PayPal and know exactly how much I'm going to pay, that's not very attractive. So how do we think about um, making sure that this is the platform is cost effective, that there's not excessive volatility um, and putting numbers on these so we can quantify them compared not only to blockchain projects, but to alternative currency transfer systems like Venmo, like PayPal, which eventually many blockchain projects want to be able to compete with. So these are some of those. Let me go through this. Yep. And to end, I just want to, um, you know, end on a particular note. I think, as I mentioned before, when we thought about decentralization, one of the things that was most interesting to us as a team um, was not only thinking about the particular project we were working with, but thinking about the state of the industry. And I mentioned this before, but it was really surprising to us that for all of the discussion of decentralization and heralding Ethereum and Bitcoin, which are obviously pioneering platforms, that there's still a ways to go in terms of achieving decentralization for the industry as a whole. Most of the projects um, that we've worked with, that we see, are much more centralized than the aspirations of their teams and the industries would want them to be. Um, and going through the process of computing these metrics, of thinking critically about them, um, really hammered that home for us. And so I think, you know, not only are projects like this very useful to individual founding teams, but they help set expectations for the industry as a whole and point to where there needs to be additional work. So anyway, as I mentioned, um, I'm Stephanie Herter. I am a founding economist at PRISM Group. Um, we do economics and governance advisory for blockchain projects. Um, if you would like any additional information about the dashboard product that I showed you, which is now on offer, or anything about anything I talked about, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting to hear those findings, and I'm now pleased to welcome back uh, Dr. Christian Catalini. Uh, Christian last year was with us uh, and presented the economics of Libra 1.0. Uh, now, uh, almost a year later, as we all know, Libra had major changes. A recent white paper published in April 2020 describing some of these, and Christian is going in his presentation to talk about the economics of Libra 2.0. Welcome, Christian. Hi everyone, it's a pleasure uh, to be back here uh, to discuss uh, an update on, on Project Libra. Uh, I'm Christian Catalini, one of the co-creators of Libra uh, at Economist at Navi and uh, a professor at MIT currently uh, on leave. <clears throat> Feel free to post your questions uh, in, in the live uh, chat. I will try to answer them uh, as we go. First, the distinction. So uh, as you know, Libra uh, is not an independent organization. 
uh, where Facebook is actually only one of 27 members. Uh, that means about uh, you know less than 4% of the governance and, and voting um, of the entire organization. Uh, there's a number of different entities contributing to the growth and success of the ecosystem. Uh, on the other side, Novi is a digital wallet that will be provided by Facebook uh, and will integrate co with the Libra payment uh, system. So I want to draw the distinction since it will be useful uh, through the content of the talk, <clears throat> which will actually focus on the economics of Libra. Uh, as I mentioned to you uh, and those of you that attended last year, uh, the journey has been really a journey around developing a new model uh, for trust in digital platforms. And this really goes back to work uh, that I had done with my co-author, Joshua Gans, on really thinking through, you know, what does it mean uh, that you can use blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies uh, to, to develop new forms, um, new forms of uh, interaction, economic interactions, uh, and new models for, for market design uh, in digital platforms. Uh, at the time, we were focused on kind of two dimensions, uh, two key costs, the cost of verification and the cost of networking. Uh, the second one is, is, is really closely related to, to the efforts behind Libra and essentially building distributed governance uh, on, uh, on an infrastructure that can support uh, payments uh, and also later financial applications uh, on a global scale. Now, there, there's at least three main objectives in the economic design of Libra. Uh, the first one uh, is to build trust in an efficient medium of exchange and the payment network. And it's often talked about uh, across a number of, of different topics from uh, macroeconomic policy and others. <clears throat> the second one is you know, the, the resulting market uh, on top of the Libra protocol uh, and ensuring that there is competition and interoperability at the core of everything the, the network stands for. Uh, the last one I want to also expand on today is really the trust in the governance and future evolution of the network and some of the journey that we've done uh, since uh, the original uh, white paper. There's a number of key updates in the economic design of Libra uh, from, of course, uh, the introduction of single currency stable coins. I'll expand on that uh, in a second uh, to kind of changing the future transition to permissionless uh, while at the same time trying to replicate the core economic properties that we, um, I think all of us appreciate in permissionless networks uh, within, within the Libra framework. Uh, there's also a number of improvements to the Libra reserve and this is kind of really spurred by uh, extensive feedback that Libra has received uh, from reports like the G7 stablecoin uh, report or the FSB work on, on global stablecoins. Now, let's start with the trust in the efficient payment network. Um, <clears throat> as I was mentioning, now there's two types of Libra coins. There's the single currency stablecoins. Think about something like a Libra dollar, Libra euro, Libra pound. Uh, but also the network is retaining a concept of a multi-currency coin, uh, LBR, uh, although it's fundamentally changed from the one uh, of the original white paper. The new LBR was, will be essentially a digital composite of some of the single currency stable coins available on the network. And I'll tell you a bit more on how that works. <clears throat> so on the single currency stable coin, uh, this will actually enable a number of additional use cases. Um, as you may know, the original goal was to support cross-border payments like remittances, uh, but with the introduction of single currency stable coins, a number of domestic use cases in the relevant markets also become possible. Like in the original uh, white paper, each one of the single currency stable coins will be fully backed, so one for one. Uh, and I'll get actually uh, to some details on how it will be over collateralized uh, to really absorb potential losses uh, on a number of potential risks and, and dimensions. And uh, you know, how people, uh, users, consumers, and businesses will interface with the reserve will really be supported by a competitive market for uh, resellers and exchanges that will be buying and selling these coins uh, to and from the reserve. Now, over time, this new approach also allows maximum flexibility to central banks around the world to, to think about how they want to integrate with something like the Libra network, uh, how this can support uh, you know, their efforts in upgrading payment systems, and more broadly, the journey towards uh, hybrid CBDCs, synthetic CBDCs, or wholesale CBDCs. The goal is really one where, you know, as soon as some of these public sector efforts become available, Libra could stop operating the relevant reserve and replace it with the public sector asset. So really think about Libra as this layer on top of whatever the public sector will do in these spaces that enables a range of new functionality and a range of new features for low cost, you know, low frictions, instantaneous uh, payments, both domestic where the single currency stable coins are available and cross-border when they're not yet, uh, you know, uh, 
on the network. <clears throat> now, the multi-currency Libra coin, um, it's it's kind of re redesigned in, in this uh, in this new version of the white paper. Uh, it is now essentially just a digital composite. Think of it as aggregating together in fixed nominal weights, so fixed amounts, uh, some of the single currency stable coins uh, available on the network. Now, because each one of the single currency stable coins is fully backed, as a result, the multi-currency Libra is also fully backed. It's also not really a separate asset from the single currency stable coin. It will not be minted and burned by the reserve. It will be just stapled and unstapled by some of the participants operating on the network. Now, this design is actually similar to the special drawing rights maintained by the IMF. And over time, the goal is really to pass oversight and control of the composition of, of the multi-currency Libra coin potentially to a uh, neutral third party, uh, such as the IMF or the group of central banks uh, involved uh, in, in that particular uh, composition. Now, since it's not a peg to any single currency, as the value of any one of the components moves, the value of the multi-currency LBR uh, will move with respect to uh, any local currency. Here on this slide, you're looking at some of the potential flows. So if you imagine maybe two countries, let's say the network has a Libra dollar and a Libra Euro, uh, and someone is trying to send money from the US to Europe, that transfer could start in Libra dollars, would go through likely a wallet exchange or financial intermediary to perform the conversion. Uh, this is not happening actually on chain. Uh, and the receiver would receive it in, in Libra Euro and you know, potentially they could spend it on merchants, local goods and services um, in, in their own country. Now, if the receiving uh, country does not have a single currency stablecoin on the network yet, they may decide to receive this in any one of the uh, currencies available on the network, including the multi-currency LBR. Why would they use maybe the multi-currency LBR? Is because you can think of it as a neutral low volatility option uh, with the respect to a number of potential jurisdictions. Uh, and it, you know, in flow C, you're looking at two countries that do not have a single currency stablecoin on the network yet. That flow could start in LBR, could arrive in LBR, so no conversion needed. Uh, and of course, you know, when the, the person receiving, for example, that remittance flow wants to spend it, they would convert it into local fiat using a cash in and cash out uh, provider. So as you see, this new design is much more flexible and enables a range of, of kind of new use cases on, on how the network could operate in, in different uh, jurisdictions. The, the other effort uh, that's currently underway is really adding additional protection in the design of the Libra Reserve. And here we're really trying to break new ground into the design of stable coins in general. Uh, the G7 stablecoin report, as well as the FSB report, raise a number of issues and questions around what happens when you know, a stable coin is experienced extreme market situations, uh, very much like you know, what, what happened uh, after the COVID outbreak or in 2008. And so the structure and administration of the Libra Reserve is now designed to really mitigate those threats and, and, and allow for value preservation uh, of coins over time. Uh, here, we're really importing the best practices from the financial sector. Think about the Basel framework uh, and, and other relevant uh, frameworks that are used to really think about a number of potential losses that something like a stable coin could incur. Uh, this could be losses from credit risk, uh, market risk, so changes in interest rates, or operational risk. Like any, any endeavor, uh, there's always uh, dimensions of operational risk. And so this is something that we, we did a lot of work uh, in, in the last months, um, working towards a framework that can really provide strong guarantees uh, to coin holders and businesses operating on the network. <clears throat> now, of course, all of this really starts with transparency and auditability. Uh, the reserve needs to be not only audited on a regular basis, but that information about the backing <clears throat> needs to be transparently communicated in, in uh, you know, practically real time uh, to the public. So that will be a really important dimension for building trust in, in, in the coins. Uh, there's also, as I was mentioning, work on, on really the regulatory capital requirements and regulatory buffers. The intuition here is that the buffer that the Libra reserve will, will maintain will grow as both the assets uh, grow in risk, maybe because there's a change in market condition, or as the reserve size itself uh, grows in time. Without getting into too many of the technical details, this is pretty standard, but like yeah, there's this gonna be a component of a pillar one requirement that Libra will be expected to maintain at all times and additional capital buffers uh, under a pillar two. Uh, you know, how will the network fund uh, these requirements? Well, you know, like any other business, to retain earnings or through capital that's raised uh, from, from its investors. 
Now, often people ask, how will Libra uh, be able to support, uh, you know, stable coins in currencies that face negative yields? Um, you know, we can think about a Libra Euro, for example. Well, the, the short answer is that it will have to cover these costs through additional revenue streams. It could be additional transaction or other fees that are introduced on, on the network. If there is positive interest on the reserve asset, of course, that can be used to cover OPEX and other expenses uh, of the Libra Association and really ensure that the network operates smoothly. Uh, think about you know, supporting validator cost and, and other uh, dimensions of that type. And uh, as before, Libra coin holders will not receive any return, uh, positive return uh, from, from, from the reserve. Now, there's a lot of additional work uh, that is currently underway uh, from really ensuring competition and transparency in the market for designated dealers. These are, after all, the key interface between the ecosystem, VASP operating on the network, like wallets, exchanges, and others, and the reserve. Uh, and also defining a traditional recovery and resolution plan, uh, including things like a standby administration dealer and really processes for handling redemptions under uh, very extreme uh, market conditions. Uh, we're also working on other dimensions like substitution risk, uh, you know, when it comes to emerging economies and really thinking about how can countries take the best advantage of uh, flows like remittances without worrying about interference uh, with monetary policy. The broader idea is really to support integration with public sector efforts in this space. And, and really the future uh, that we're trying to build towards is one where as soon as I was mentioning, the public sector uh, is either upgrading their RTGS systems or opening up some of those interfaces or is exploring anything that uh, looks like a synthetic CBDC, retail CBDC or wholesale CBDC, uh, Libra can integrate with those uh, efforts and, and stop even operating uh, a reserve. Uh, again, the focus of the network is in delivering payments and functionality around payments and financial services, not uh, running a reserve per se. But that's kind of a necessary step in, in, in this space where these assets are not fully digital and programmable uh, on the public sector side uh, today. Now, I, I mentioned this actually in, in my presentation last year, but another key dimension and one of the reasons why we landed on this particular uh, design for, for Libra is that we want to ensure that there's a thriving and competitive market for financial services and, and payments on top of it. And we really want to avoid vectors of concentration. As you probably know, many, many of the uh, consensus algorithms and pieces of consensus algorithms used today lead to different types of forms of concentration. For, for example, in proof of work, uh, you have concentration in mining. Uh, in proof of stake, you have concentration because of uh, initial seeding of capital among some of the participants. And so here we're really trying to strike a balance where when you think about why are there Libra Association members, well, they're really important for driving, uh, of course, utility and use cases in the network, but they're also solving the classic nothing at stake problem uh, that traditional proof of stake networks uh, typically face. Uh, these entities are bringing their reputation on the line and by running validator nodes, they're ensuring that the network is safe in some of the phases where you could think it's actually the most vulnerable. Uh, now, what's really important is that this network uh, keeps staying extremely competitive and it's not a wallet garden. Uh, the model is really that of the open technology standards uh, of the internet. And I'll expand more uh, around this in a second, but it's extremely important that there are open and transparent membership criteria, uh, both for, you know, uh, for providing validator services and eventually also for governance. The goal here from an economics perspective is really to ensure extremely low switching costs for consumers and businesses relying on the network, low barriers to entry and, and extremely high interoperability. At the end of it, uh, building interoperability is probably one of the most important missions uh, of these projects uh, if you wanna get a financial inclusion. Uh, you know, we believe that com more competition would lead to lower prices, uh, better quality, and, and also the development of a number of new services and business models that are difficult to, to predict today. Now, in the last part, I want to talk a little bit more about one of the most complex dimensions of trust, which is trust in the governance and future evolution of, of the network. As I was mentioning before, you know, Facebook that incubated some of the original ideas around this project is only one of 27 members. So can, can only exert one, one vote out of, uh, of 27 in total. And this will keep expanding, uh, of course, over time. And uh, as I mentioned also in the past, an independent and strong association is really a key prerequisite uh, for the success of this project. Um, founding members, of course, are needed to drive utility and adoption, uh, secure the network by running validator services, uh, and really bootstrap this kind of market for delegation and reputation uh, around the project. 
Uh, the economics are really similar to those of standard setting organization. And the goal is really one of distributed governance. Uh, that will encourage you know, individuals and organizations to build on the same ecosystem uh, rather than you know, reinforcing and increasing fragmentation, which is a known problem in payment and financial services. Uh, another key objective of the association is also, of course, avoiding a tragedy of the commons where everybody tries to build uh, on layers on top of, uh, of the base layer, the shared layer by everyone, and doesn't contribute enough resources back uh, to the investment in what really constitutes uh, a public, public good and shared infrastructure. <clears throat> now, we began the Libra journey uh, by describing a shared vision, and, and this, of course, would have needed a new technology to transition the network to a fully permissionless, uh, permissionless one. And uh, that vision was really inspired by some of the key economic properties of permissionless networks. So what, what happened uh, is that one of the concerns that we heard from regulators about that vision was that you know, we were introducing a number of um, additional provisions, some AML to compliance, uh, to really ensure that the network is safe and is good at fighting financial crime. And regulators were concerned that if the network were to fully transition to permissionless, those provisions could be removed. And so you wouldn't be able to guarantee the health and integrity of the network uh, in a fully transitioned way. Now, what we discovered through this process was also that we believe it is still possible to replicate the key economic properties of permissionless systems uh, through actually traditional market design and auction design and essentially through an open, transparent, and competitive market uh, process uh, for the provision both of network services, again, think about entities that want to run a validator, but also for governance uh, and, and membership in, in the association. And, as you may know, Libra you know, is building on, on BFT uh, through hot stuff. And um, you know, the, the BFT consensus protocols have, have a number of advantages uh, in terms of throughput, latency, and, and you know, the no need for wasteful computation, for example. Uh, there's additional good features around finality. Uh, but at the same time, you know, as an economist, one of the things that uh, worries me the most about BFT is that, of course, the security depends on the quality and the incentives of those initial validators. You're essentially trusting them uh, with the operations of the network. And uh, as we know, incentive alignment around all of these issues is, is and can be very hard. Um, now, the network, of course, is, is a public good. It's a shared infrastructure. And so you often run into a tension between some of the short-run objectives. Think about the needs of the network in its early days when you're trying to bootstrap it and, and increase utility versus more long-run objectives. Uh, so allowing for uh, additional uh, validators or additional governance members to come and compete with the existing one. Uh, and so the next steps of the Libra process are really trying to drive a balance to, uh, to really ensure competition for services and governance within uh, a framework where you know, nodes and validators will need to be compliant. Now, the good news is that we can really learn from market design and other uh, economic systems that really face similar problems uh, where you do have you know, a trusted set, but you're also trying to introduce market forces uh, within that set. <clears throat> we believe that competition is a prerequisite, again, for building you know, a highly interoperable, efficient, and especially innovative payment system. So at any point in time, new entrants need to be able to compete with the existing players within the Libra ecosystem for not only the provision of payments and financial services, this is both to businesses and consumers, <clears throat> but also the opportunity to run independent validator nodes uh, to contribute to security, reliability of the network, uh, and also you know, to um, uh, introducing uh, less correlated uh, failure risk. Uh, the, difficult, the most difficult one on, on the dimension of competition is really active participation in the governance and the evolution of this project. So the, you know, the first two, um, so the first actually, the first one uh, is already uh, achieved by the fact that, again, the entire network is modeled after an open technology standard, but items number two and three really require working on this market-driven process that will allow new qualified members uh, to enter and compete with the existing ones. And this is really a novel uh, concept that we're bringing, I think, to this space. <clears throat> so what may this look like, right? Um, uh, again, together with the, the non-transitioning to permissionless, these become really the key step for ensuring uh, that you do have um, an open and transparent and competitive market uh, for, for resources and, and for governance. Uh, this applies to both the phase of expanding membership in the association and also renewing membership. 
and I'll give you a little bit more details um, in a second. The goal is really to offering new entrants the ability to compete on, on all of these dimensions, uh, while at the same time ensuring that Libra Association can meet and uh, you know upheld its values on, on regulatory expectations on issues like you know AML and compliance and, and so on. <clears throat> so when you think about expanding membership, you could imagine a process, and again, this is still uh, work in progress with, with the membership, uh, where uh, there's a series of open calls, and you know the association declares how many uh, membership slots will be available in each round. There'll be some objective dimensions like. Uh, the application could cover things like basic information about the applicant uh, to really ensure that it meets the compliance bar, uh, as well as technical information. <clears throat> Would the applicant be able to successfully run a secure and stable validator node? And then more nuanced dimensions like economic performance. Is this an applicant that will really contribute to the further growth of the ecosystem? Uh, and of course, you know, to ensure that there's funding for OPEX and other dimensions of the association, uh, there could also be a financial contribution in this. You could use this information to, to essentially calculate a transparent membership contribution score. Uh, this is used often in, in other kind of application processes. Uh, of course, these terms, uh, you know, for calculating such a score uh, should be public before an open call is run. Um, and this is actually used in a number of allocation mechanisms today. Uh, this would ensure that you know any potential entrant can use this information to decide if they want to make an investment in the Libra network and, and kind of start becoming a validator or maybe even becoming a member uh, of the governance or not. Similarly, you could use a similar process, which is essentially using auction design uh, to rank potential uh, slots and entrants, also to kind of renew the membership set and ensure that they can really keep innovating and, and advancing uh, over time. Of course, all of this, these decisions would have to be made taking you know, in, into consideration any antitrust or any competition issues, uh, as well, of course, the regulatory compliance requirements, which are really the entry point uh, for participating in, in a network of, of this type. Now, I wanna spend uh, the last few minutes to kind of go back to the broader mission, uh, which is really to enable equal access uh, to financial services. Interoperability, lower cost, lower frictions, uh, I believe can make a massive progress, uh, both in domestic markets, but especially in cross-border. Uh, too many people today uh, really don't have access to basic uh, payments and financial services. And the irony is that often uh, there's large segments of the population, so one in nine people globally, are often supported by funds that they're receiving through a remittance from family and friends. Uh, the, the aggravating factor is also that people with less money tend to pay more uh, for financial services today. Uh, and, you know, the World Bank estimates uh, that you've probably heard before uh, is of a, approximately a 7% cost for sending money across borders. So that means that if you're sending $200, you know, approximately $14 are lost uh, to the intermediary. Not only are you're, you're, you're spending a lot of money in some of these cross-border flows, uh, but transactions also take time. So these are not immediate transfers. And in some cases, it can be multiple days before someone receives uh, money on the other hand. I believe the, the COVID situation has made this even more salient, where you've seen a number of governments struggle even in, in stimulus payments or in getting money in the ends of their citizens uh, within a reasonable time frame. And the situation is likely to be more aggravated as we enter kind of a very long and potentially painful economic recovery phase. Uh, now, the good news, uh, which I would mentioned also last time, is that, yes, there are approximately 1.7 billion people uh, without a bank account, without access to low-cost <coughs> payments and financial services, but a large number of these have access to a mobile phone, and the majority of that subset has access to some form of data. And so there's a lot that can be done by bringing a network that's truly interoperable, that favors competition, and can allow a number of startups across the globe uh, to enter with new services and, and new options for uh, consumers. I look forward to your question and thank you very much for your attention.
Christian. That was very interesting and we look forward to Libra launching its MVP later this year. Uh, it is now my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Cooper Georg. Uh, Cooper is a professor at the University of Cape Town where he holds uh, the financial, um, uh, financial Stability Study Research Chair uh, uh, sponsored by the South African Reserve Bank. Uh, Coupier is going to talk about practical consideration when issuing central bank digital currency. Uh, Coupier has been very actively involved in uh, this work together with the South African Research Bank and uh, also in his role as um, an advisor sitting on the Economic Advisory Council of the Algron Foundation. Welcome, Coupier. Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Coupier Bjork and I'm an associate professor at the University of Cape Town. Had the good fortune and pleasure to be involved in a couple of uh, central bank digital currency projects, both from a policymaker perspective as well as from an industry perspective. And my talk today is going to share some of the insights and the discussions and the conflicts um, that we had in these in these discussions uh, with you. And I hope it's going to be useful for the audience. So let me start with arguing why we need a central bank digital currency. And there's a, a very big sort of argument being made within central bank communities that asset tokenization is actually something that we would like um, to encourage because there's new business models, there's new monetization options, um, there is new innovation happening. So just to sort of lay the groundwork and, and make sure we're all on the same page. And the asset tokenization, I understand the process of issuing digital tokens or coins to prove ownership of an underlying asset um, that is represented digitally on a distributed ledger. So this sets it apart already from uh, centralized digital currencies um, that are also springing up left and right in, in central bank communities um, and focus really on those that, that are issued on a distributed ledger. The benefit of asset tokenization is that it can lead to faster settlements. Um, if you look at interbank payments, um, it is a very slow uh, process compared to the speed of transactions that you can have in a decentralized system, which, has not, which, which is not because of the nature of real-time gross settlement system. They are very fast um, in, in their technology, but the entire ecosystem around the settlement system itself uh, slows the process down and increases the cost. So by using, um, uh, using tokenized assets, we hope that we can enable faster settlements reduce the transaction cost and increase transparency. And that increase in transparency is a, is a little bit of a double-edged sword. It's clearly one of the advantages that, that blockchain brings, but as I'm gonna, gonna argue later, it also comes with a couple of, of challenges. Um, think about just interbank markets as an example, when two banks uh, transact with each other regularly and all of a sudden um, market always was sort of uh, over the counter and nobody could see exactly who is transacting. Um, now there's a market, two banks transact, and you would expect based on their past history of transactions that this Monday morning there should be another transaction between the two and this transaction doesn't happen. And then the bank that would have received the transaction goes on the interbank market to try to replace the liquidity that it didn't get from the first bank with, with some other liquidity. Now the market knows that this bank has an increased demand for liquidity, so the price um, that, it, that the bank will be quoted um, to obtain interbank borrowing will change. So the transparency that we've created by sort of making the ledger fully visible can translate into price effects on the, on the market, which is highly non-trivial and it's not well understood yet. One of the biggest arguments for um, asset tokenization and moving to distributed ledgers is the cash on ledger problem. So if we have a cash lag in a delivery versus payment transaction of a tokenized asset, so think about a, a digital security of some sorts um, that you want to transact between two counterparties, even if the digital security is on a distributed ledger, and even if that distributed ledger is, um, is very fast, has a high transactions per second, TPS, uh, the settlement for the payment of this security, unless it happens also in some form of, of crypto asset, um, has to be done through the existing payment system. 
which means it has to be done through the correspondent banking model. It has to be done through a fairly slow process. So this takes away a lot of the advantages of having distributed ledger to settle digital assets and the trade of digital assets. Um, so one of the big arguments for central bank digital currency is to say, well, we want to solve this cash on ledger problem because we recognize that there are new business models around digital assets um, that are actually economically beneficial, um, that can lead to new uses that we, we, we haven't seen before. And this innovation is something that, that is to be encouraged. So we need to solve this cash on ledger problem, or otherwise we will not um, reap the benefits of asset tokenization. So the solution that has been that has been put forward is to actually just issue central bank money on a ledger to have a perfectly stable coin which represents central bank money, which represents um, a form of legal tender. Um, and the approach that is taken by sort of different countries uh, usually takes one of, of three forms. So either you, you have already your existing real-time gross settlement system in most countries. Um, some countries, they prefer a fairly centralized approach where you have digital payments, but you don't necessarily have sort of a ledger, like a distributed ledger to, to under, um, uh, as, 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 a, as, a, as a settlement layer underneath it. Um, so you have the centralized camp, but then more and more central banks are exploring both wholesale and retail central bank digital currencies. And I'm going to talk about both um, a, little bit late, a little bit later. Both differ in sort of scale and scope. And uh, it's not clear yet sort of what the benefits of each are. We are just at the beginning of our understanding of, of what, what we can, uh, how we can benefit from, from these different types of, um, of CBDCs. So one of the one of the big sort of arguments why asset tokenization can be interesting is when you look at existing securities. For example, um, this case could be real estate. You could uh, you could uh, securitize these assets on a distributed ledger, and you can take away some of the lump sum risk that households tend to have in their portfolio. If, if you're a normal household um, that just bought a house, you will have a mortgage on your house and that house as an asset is a huge lump sum risk in your personal portfolio. So ideally, you would like to securitize this and sort of sell off smaller parts of your house. Um, and, and you yourself would like to invest in a more diversified housing portfolio. Real estate investment trusts are existing financial institutions that do exactly that. Um, however, they usually come with high setup costs and especially in an emerging market like in South Africa, um, it's actually a huge problem for large parts of the population to participate in this kind of financial institution. So they are excluded from the market simply because they can't cover the relatively high setup cost. And the hope is that if we use sort of digital assets um, of digital representations of physical assets, we can reduce this, this um, sort of initial cost and make these assets more available to a broader part of the population helping them to achieve financial security. So this has always been in all countries. This has been one of the big driving force where sort of central bankers understand the benefits of, um, of tokenized assets. Well, then there's sort of the more, a little bit more in the, on, on the fun side of things, but nonetheless, a very important aspect of creating digital collectibles. I just picked CryptoKitties because it was one of the first ones um, and it's fun, but there's something in this digital collectible uh, that I think is a is sort of prominent of a future that is to come. Digital collectibles have work because they don't require privacy. So having a set of digital collectibles, in the, in the, in the past it was your baseball or your football cards, uh, today it's your, sort of your, your crypto kitty that, that you have. Um, so sort of having recorded who owns which digital collectible, which unique digital collectible, um, is not particularly uh, sort of sensitive. So you can have this shared register of who has which digital collectible, and it's for the first time that you have a digital object, digital art, that you make unique by using the blockchain. And by making it unique, by having it registered once and having it owned by one person or a group of person, but by having it once, you can create a price for these digital assets because 
in a normal system, in a centralized system, the, the, the owner, the operator of the database automatically becomes the owner of the asset because he has the ultimate control of how many copies of that digital object he creates. But if you can create infinitely many, uh, infinitely many digital copies, you can create infinitely um, large supply. And that means that the market price for these, for these objects is zero. So as we move into an increasingly digital economy, and the digital economy has outpaced the real economy over the past 10 years at, in, in, in every single year. Um, so as we move into this increasingly digital economy, having a register of digital objects will become increasingly important. Uh, once we figure out the privacy issue, which is not a trivial issue, but once we figure this out, we can do this for all kinds of digital objects and we create digital property rights. And this, I believe, really will be one of the main drivers of where we want to have um, tokenized assets um, that, that are being traded using distributed ledgers. So to facilitate this transition into this sort of new digital world, we need a payment system that is up to date and that is sort of um, in sync with the needs of, um, of this digital economy. So now I want to talk a little bit about the different sort of forms of central bank digital currencies that can facilitate this transition into a um, more digital uh, economy going forward. I want to start with the existing real-time gross settlement systems. So first, just to get the nomenclature out of the way. So when I, when I talk about a stable coin, I refer to a cryptocurrency that is designed to minimize fluctuations in value. How that stabilization happens um, is, is, um, is, is up for the design for the cryptocurrency and you, can, you have various different approaches. So stability can be achieved um, by backing this uh, cryptocurrency with a reserve asset that can be fiat currency, it can be gold, or it can be other crypto assets, or through algorithms. Um, there are various approaches to sort of this algorithmic stability. Um, there are various approaches sort of to the to the crypto asset as a as a collateral um, for CBDC. Um, and we when when we talk about central bank backed digital currencies, we usually talk about fiat currency and gold as a backing for, um, for the CBDC. One of the benefits of using stable coins is their programmability. So you can have stable coins that integrate automatically with smart contracts and other distributed computation mechanisms. That makes them particularly interesting as a new form of financial uh, instrument that completes our um, overall um, space of existing financial instruments um, and can lead to more efficiency. Um, you can do things with a smart contract that you cannot do with, um, with any other mechanism, in particular when it comes to using smart contracts as a commitment device, as um, a financial contract that cannot be renegotiated because the terms of the contract are set in code, are distributed over a large group of, of nodes, and unless you control a, like, the, the majority of nodes, you cannot just rewrite the terms of the contract. In many instances, this has significant advantages and, and is desirable um, for financial contracting. So it's also efficient, so there are low transaction costs, faster settlements. Um, we, can, we can address fungibility when you, when you talk about uh, sort of cash, for example, there is an issue of fungibility because for the lower denomination coins, um, you actually don't usually mint them because it's not worth minting very low value denominated coins. So fungibility becomes an issue, especially if you move into a realm where you have a large number of low value transactions. And if you have digital objects because of the nature of, of digital objects and the, the sort of low cost of copying and creating multiple copies of them, even if you can make them unique, you will end, uh, you, you will end up requiring um, low value transactions to a much bigger extent than what we have today. But also it's about accessibility. And I'm, I'm gonna revisit this point later because it's a key practical uh, consideration of many central banks, um, how um, a CBDC would be accessible. So if we, are, if you, if we design this properly, um, such a stable coin can be, can be used as a means of payment or as a store of value. And if I sort of try to sort of put the different approaches to, um, 
to CBDCs in, in sort of a, a simple matrix, um, you, you can sort of divide them up in a, in, in, in a scheme like this. So you can first di differentiate between wholesale tokens, those used between financial institutions. Um, think about interbank markets, think about securities payments, so including post-trade. Um, or you can have them as a retail token accessible um, to, to a broad number or a broad um, range of citizens and, and, and users, uh, not only institutions. Um, they can be either backed by central bank issued assets or by privately issued assets. Um, and I'm, I'm going to focus today on, on these three, on, on the utility settlement coin as an example for a wholesale token, um, on Libra as an example for a retail token that is privately issued, and on a central bank backed digital currency as an example of a, central, of a retail token backed by central bank issued assets. So let me, let me show you the, the world before um, any sort of RTGS payment. So this is the existing world as we live in today. And the, and the easiest way to think about this is to go back to the good old um, T diagrams and to have a central bank balance sheet and two banks. So this is the simplest possible economy that, that you can have, where the two, the two banks um, both have some reserves and the central bank has sort of borrowed reserves of an amount um, 100, which the, the bank one borrows from the central bank. Um, bank one then lends 50 euro in this case to bank two. So it's an asset for bank one, a liability for bank two. That liability is backed by assets which are held in the form of um, reserve holdings at the central bank. And so that the first bank's balance sheet balances, it also has to have sort of this reserve holding of 50. And because it borrowed 100 from the central bank, uh, it lends out 50 to the other bank. So you have an interbank loan worth 50 euros um, that is backed by reserves with a central bank. Now, when there is settlement of this interbank loan, all that happens is that the second bank repays the loan to the first bank so that the, the balance sheet position gets reduced by 50 here on the liability side, here on the asset side. And so that the balance sheet still balance, you have to reduce the asset side of bank two. So you have to transfer 50 reserves from bank two to bank one so that bank one's reserve holdings increase. And all that you that you see is that there's an that there's a swap in the reserves that bank hold with the central bank. This is the existing RTGS system where the central bank sees exactly who pays whom, how much. So after, after the uh, settlement has, has concluded, the new balance sheets have a central bank with 100, um, uh, 100 reserves um, uh, financed through the main refinancing operations um, borrowed by bank one. There's no more interbank loan. All reserves are held by bank one with a central bank. Everything is, is done easy peasy. So now let's have a look at how a wholesale token would change that. I, I, I use USC just as one example. There are many others out there, uh, some taking a stance on, on, on one over the others. In fact, if anything, I would have various concerns about USC that I wouldn't have with, with other uh, wholesale tokens, but it's a nice example um, because USC spent a lot of time thinking about sort of the institutional setup for a wholesale token. So, now let me go into, into the world with um, a uh, wholesale CBDC issued by a private participant, in this case, Finality. So the way that the system is supposed to work, um, to the best of my understanding, is that Finality would have a technical account with a central bank. This technical account is sort of separate from the central bank's other accounts, and it's a breach with existing policy where only banks and very few other institutions, such as central securities depositories, have accounts with a central bank. So usually the central bank only has reserve accounts for banks and very, very few other, um, other institutions. But other than sort of this additional technical account, before we have sort of any settlement, nothing happens. We have the same picture as before. We have the 100 and open market operations borrowed by bank one. 50 of which are held in deposits at the central bank, 50 
remaining are invested as an interbank loan to Bank 2. Bank 2 held, holds this in the form of reserves with the central bank. So nothing has changed from the, from the picture before, except that now Finality has its technical account, plus instead of um, only having accounts with the central banks, now each bank has an account on the liability side of Finality. Now, um, Finality therefore records the coin accounts of both banks, and when we have the on-ramping of funds, so funds, uh, when, when banks buy coins from Finality, what they do is they transfer reserves from their reserve accounts to the technical account of Finality at the central bank, which is reflected as an asset for Finality. And Finality, in turn, credits each bank with a certain amount of tokens, which are one-to-one -to -one backed, in this case, with the euro. So for each bank, you have a swap on the asset side between reserves and coins. And for Finality, you just have an increase in the balance sheet. And for the central bank, you have a liability side swap between reserves and the technical account. Nothing else happens. Now, if we have a settlement of claims, the interbank loan that Bank 1 has issued to Bank 2 is being repaid. Now, what this does is it looks a little different from before because the repayment still happens. Bank 2 reduces its exposure to Bank 1 by 50. So Bank 1 balance sheet is reduced by 50. Bank 2 balance sheet is reduced, reduced by 50. But instead of using their reserves, which they had exchanged for coins before, now they would use so the, the coins that they hold with finality. So the settlement of the claim is actually happening on the ledger of finality as opposed to the ledger of the central bank. As you see, the, nothing happens on the central bank ledger. And this is actually one of the, the key concerns that many central banks have, that so the settlement of, um, of these transactions happens outside their ledger. In a shared ledger system, you can have the central bank being a node, and in, in all sorts of situations, I know the central bank will insist on being a node on the shared ledger so that they actually have uh, read and write access um, to the ledger. Still, the control over so the settlement of these transactions has been moved from the central bank, from a public entity to a private entity. It's not necessarily good or bad, but it's a change, not just in the technical way the system operates, but it's a fundamental change from something that is, a, that is, that is the purview of a public entity moving into, into a private um, into a private entity. So, post the settlement, the central bank le uh, central bank ledger um, has a seventy five technical account. Uh, bank one still has the twenty five in, in normal reserves. Finality now has the the same balance sheet length as before seventy five, except that all the coins are held by the first bank. Bank two has a has a ledger of, of zero. So all this is a reshuffling on coins on on finality ledgers. Now let me contrast this. With, um, with Libra and the way that Libra has approached this. So in the Libra setup, you have uh, the non-bank sector with, um, uh, with a balance sheet. You have the banking sector. So here, this includes households and firms. You have Libra and you have a central bank. So to, to have the simplest possible system, we have uh, 10 open market operations borrowed by the banking sector. The banking sector has issued 90 in deposits in this setting. Um, and these deposits are held by the non-bank sector as assets, who also have 10, uh, 10 euro in banknotes, which is a liability of the central bank, and 100 as a loan from the banking sector. So now with Libra being introduced, what would happen is that there's a demand for coins from Libra. So let's say 50, um, 50 Libra coins. Um, these coins must come from somewhere. The only place they can come from in the existing system is if the non-bank sector says, okay, I would like to hold fewer deposits and more coins. So there's a swap from deposits into coins that is reflected on the banking sector balance sheet. In the first step, it doesn't matter. It's just a sort of a different account. It used to be the de deposit account of the non-bank sector. Now it moves into the deposit account of Libra. However, Libra is not necessarily likely to hold these deposits. So the Libra uh, reserve would change these deposits into loans 
So it would take some of these deposits and and buy claims on the on the non-bank sector. These can be sort of um, government bonds. It can be sort of high quality liquid assets, all kinds of, of good assets that Libra wants to purchase from the banking sector. The big problem is that Libra would gain a lot of bargaining power towards the banking sector um, because they know that they can, at short notice, change the deposits into any kind of claim on the non-bank sector. So they can force the banking sector in, by large liquidity outflows into a fire sale of the bonds that they hold on their balance sheet. And that is a huge risk. So to sort of address this issue, there's a, there's a lot of central banks that explore central bank digital currencies. And we start as before with the exact same balance sheet. Um, we have the notes, and now we want to re we want to sort of have notes uh, and coins that are issued by the central bank. So this is assumes that the central bank offers the non-bank sector access to its balance sheet. How much of that access is up for discussion? In the in the cases that I know best, there was always a discussion around should we give access to licensed service providers, to non-banks, but regulated, registered entities that would perform payment services. So in this case, what you would do is you can say, okay, these sort of um, coins that, that are on the, on the bank's balance sheet um, are now sort of represent a change from the bank's open, from the central bank's open market operations because the banking sector needs to reduce their deposit holdings, These, the flows that the, that the non-bank sector initiates by changing their demand from deposits to coins has, have to come from somewhere. So what this first does is it increases the central bank balance sheet and now the central bank needs to decide how to, how to create these claims. In the first uh, model, you could create more open market operations to provide liquidity to the banking sector. But if you do that, you require you acquire additional exposure vis-a-vis -vis banks. The alternative is that instead of doing this through the open market operations, central banks could engage into bond purchasing programs, for example, and then acquire claims on the private sector from the banks, which are initiated by a shift in preferences from deposits to coins. How large this shift is, is not clear. Initially, sort of the fear is that we will see a deleveraging of the, of the banking system and disintermediation, but the equilibrium effect is not clear because it could well be that uh, customers prefer to hold uh, more deposits because they are easily changed into central bank digital currency and this sort of motive to hold cash just doesn't exist anymore in this model. So, Instead of, sort of having a mixture of cash and deposits, which you always have because cash is cumbersome and difficult to get and expensive, you would probably have more deposits that when there is a crisis, you could initiate a run into, uh, into central bank digital currencies. And just to wrap up in, in, the last, in the last 30 seconds, I want to talk about the four pieces, the four missing building blocks um, for central bank digital currencies. The first is scalability. Uh, just to give you one simple example, if you have a country with 58 million users, your ledger needs to be able to handle around about 4,000 transactions per second. In a peak, you probably have to handle more, and this is if you have sort of 16 hours a day during which transactions happen, around about four transactions per person. It's just how many transactions per second you need to be able to handle. Right now, there are very, very few ledgers who can handle this, but for a retail central bank digital currency, this is the the scale you need to look at. Um, the second big issue that, says, that has come anytime um, we've discussed around CBDCs in a central bank setting is the issue of privacy. Cash guarantees privacy. Um, and it's important that it does because the, there should be limits to how much the government sort of can interfere in the, in the private dealings of its citizens. So what we want is we want to have low value transactions that need to retain privacy and high value transactions that need to be fully auditable. This trade-off in privacy within the same protocol does not exist in any protocol I know. And it's a huge challenge, especially if you combine it with um, the demand for scale. So this is one of the big open problems in, on, on, the, on the protocol level. The third problem is the one of inclusivity. In South Africa, for example, only about 50% of South Africans have a smartphone. How do we include the other half? How do we include users that don't have smartphones. This, 
this radical inclusivity um, is lacking from most crypto applications out there at the moment. And I've, I've seen way too little research and work being done on this particular issue. If there are good solutions out there, uh, I encourage you to contact me, come forward. There's huge demand from central banks in specifically this issue of accessibility for in a, in a low file setting. And then the very last point is sort of the interoperability in a future world where we have various central bank digital currencies. How can we ensure um, that uh, tokens in different uh, jurisdictions are interoperable? So there's still, there are some token bridges out there, um, but it's still not fully business ready, I would say. So when we had a look at a difference of token bridges out there, and I hope I'm sort of not offending anybody in the audience with this, I, I, th I think there's still work to be done on the interoperability um, issue, in particular for low value transactions. So these are the big four missing building blocks. If we can work those out, if we can get those right, um, I think there's huge um, demand among central bankers to better understand, evaluate, and eventually implement central bank digital currencies. And if we can move to, to this, to a point where, where we can have CBDCs and we can make them a reality, um, I think the sky's the limit and um, many new um, business models in the new digital economy will arise. Thank you very much. started simple, a token, a symbol of hard work, of skills, for trust between people. Money was meant to be exchanged for things created and services provided. It takes many forms, both plain and shiny, honoring leaders of the past and those leading us into the future. Somewhere we lost our way. People waged wars over it, big and small, concerned more with growing interest on $244 trillion in debt than growing communities. And many people are left out, 1.7 billion invisible, left behind and underserved. But what if money were more accessible to everyone? A universal symbol for essential needs, for empowerment, and connection. People, communities, entire countries prospering. What if money were all of this? What if money were beautiful? What? What? How? Why? Hey. Oh, it's B. B. For B. Always open. Trade where you want to, when you want to. For B. 
your trustworthy crypto exchange. Thank you, Pierre. That was a very interesting and definitely, you know, really in line with what we are seeing, a major, major increase in interest uh, in central bank digital currencies. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome another uh, professor who has been very actively um, in the implementation of blockchain project, Professor Marco Di Maggio from Harvard Business School. Um, Professor Di Maggio uh, was with us last year presenting findings from his work as a co-researcher at Terra Protocol. Terra is a stable coin based in Korea, very focused on payment. And we're welcoming back Marco this year to present his latest finding from the economics of stable coins, lessons from Terra. Marco, welcome. Okay, so it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to update you on um, Terra. We have so many developments and so little time, so I want to jump right in. Uh, I will share uh, some of my slides that highlight some of the latest updates uh, on, uh, on the latest developments on Terra. So I'm going to focus on uh, what I call sort of the economics of Terra. Uh, and so I will point out uh, a couple of uh, new things. So in particular, I want to start with those of you that haven't really experienced Terra uh, so far. And uh, I want to tell you basically what you are missing on. Uh, and so I will sort of explain a little bit of the uh, what's exactly Terra, what's the underlying technology, at least briefly. Uh, and then I will uh, talk about what are the news about the technology with respect to, for example, uh, last year. And then I will dive into two main topics that are close to my heart. The first one is uh, an update on Chai, which is the platform we use on the, on the payment system, because that's really what provides us with a lot of uh, data and information about users and how users uh, interact with uh, uh, Terra. And then I will, uh, uh, I will show you and discuss uh, a new product and a new alliance uh, that I think are going to propel uh, the future of uh, Terra. So let me start with what's really Terra. So Terra is a blockchain payment network uh, that is uh, mainly focused uh, in the Asian e-commerce market. It basically rebuilds completely the payment uh, stack on the blockchain. And the idea is to deliver uh, unparalleled efficiency to both merchants and partners, as well as to customers. Um, I will show you that uh, Terra basically uh, is able to address two of what I believe are the major drawbacks of uh, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies so far. One was price volatility and the other one is lack of real uh, world use case. Uh, the reason for this is because obviously price volatility, Terra is uh, uh, stable coin and the lack of real world use case, so we have basically had option to figure it out. Uh, in fact, basically, it's used as payment already across uh, several merchants uh, in Asia. So let me just uh, draw your attention to some of the mechanics that really are driving uh, the mechanism behind uh, Terra. And so to be a stablecoin, uh, in contrast to other stablecoins out there, and for example, also to the Libra project uh, that was basically based on reserves, what we are going to do instead is uh, uh, all based on algorithmically adjusting the money supply. It seems very complicated, but there's nothing more than what central banks do every day. And uh, it's very intuitive. In some sense, if we have a change in, uh, in Bitcoin demand, there is zero adjustment on the supply side. Instead, for Terra, as we experience a shift in demand, because, for example, there are more and more merchants that adopt Terra as a mean of payment, what we're going to do is adjust the supply accordingly. And so as the price of Terra increases, the protocol issues more Terra. As the price of Terra decreases, because, for example, we are experiencing a down, we might experience a downturn or a recession, the protocol also buys back Terra. And this makes sure of keeping the value of Terra constant across the business cycle. 
The other thing that uh, I want to point out is that uh, there, uh, there isn't just Terra as the stable coin, but there is another important component of Terra, which is really our sort of uh, uh, equity in the system, which is Luna. Luna is basically the uh, ecosystem collateral token. So the way in which we can think about this is every time a transaction with Terra takes place, a fee is directed to Luna. And this transaction fee is dynamic because it changes with the market conditions and is calibrated to ensure full collateralization. So that basically there is a consistent stream of transaction fees that go into Luna. And uh, the, these transaction fees are then rewarded to those who stake their Luna. The value then of Luna is used to collateralize Terra during contractionary uh, cycles. And so also provides another backdrop for uh, stability. What we believe is the main value proposition, and I will show you that uh, indeed there are many that uh, agree with us that this is super important for both customer and merchant, is that uh, uh, as Terra is used on the e-commerce platforms, new money is printed to maintain price stability, as for the mechanism that I just described. And this growth is then returned to users as discounts. This is super uh, important because these discounts are a way for us to both attract users as well as make sure that uh, the blockchain is significantly more efficient for the merchant uh, than, for example, existing payment options like, for example, setting up a POS with a, uh, a credit card company. So the, in, in the end, this discount model really serves as a way of providing uh, also fiscal policies or, you know, stimulus for the Terra economy. Because as there is more demand for Terra, because, for example, we onboard the new merchants, uh, we have the supply of Terra increases uh, and there, are, there is then a new money supply that gets reinvested as discount The fuel even more uh, a demand for Terra in the, in the future. And so there is growth that really drives growth. Okay. So this is basically the main uh, takeaway of uh, how the Terra uh, works and is, has been working since uh, last year. So now let me just highlight uh, a couple of news with respect to what uh, has been going on in the, in the last few months about the technology. The first one is the integration of smart contracts uh, uh, in, the, in the chain. And in, 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 um, Terra basically is going to be integrating a multi-chain smart contracts that are developed by a Cosmo Wasm team. So the important thing about these smart contracts is that uh, they can be run on multiple chains, making use of the inter-blockchain uh, inter communication protocol. They are secure because uh, they are secure with most of the known attack vectors that have been evidenced by Ethereum closed by design. And then they can also leverage the speed of Wasm and the power of Rust to perform any algorithm you desire. And so this is sort of the first uh, technological step that opens up the possibility for developers to come in and build on Terra whatever they want. We also sort of moved uh, one step uh, forward towards uh, uh, decentralization. And in particular, on June 5th, so just a few weeks ago, uh, Terraform Labs spun down uh, the uh, two validators, uh, Golia and Marine. And this is to basically continue the, to contribute towards a greater decentralization in the system. And so we are more and more uh, decentralized in this community. Now, uh, one more thing that uh, I want to highlight is that uh, from the point of view of the validators, uh, Terra has been a great deal. So just in the last six weeks, Terra has paid out $820,000 to the validators in the network in real non-dilutive rewards. So just to give you a sense of the growth rate of these rewards, so the rewards on Terra grew over the 58 weeks since the launch at an average rate of 17%. So, you know, growth rate is awesome, but what's the total? So even the total uh, is extremely high. In fact, this brings the total paid out network rewards to over 3.3 million. Just to give you a sense of how we compare with respect to uh, whatever else in the market, we are just number three. So Luna, which is the Terra native token, investment token that I mentioned before, 
is just number three after Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, with more than three and a half million dollars paid out to uh, validators. Okay, so now I want to shift gear a little bit and start showing you what has been happening uh, on, on Chai. So first of all, Chai users have reached 1.6 million users with 1 billion annual run rate. And more importantly, you know, one evidence that uh, Chai has been extremely successful in terms of uh, onboarding new and new users over time, uh, they are number, uh, Chai is number one uh, uh, app downloaded. In terms of the growth rate and the comparison between total users and active users, what we plotted here is just the last quarter, the last three months, from basically mid-April to mid-June. And we have basically total users going from 1.3 to 1.6. So we are basically adding 100,000 users every month. And also the active users are significantly increasing over time. So this is just to, uh, to, to show basically the success of Chai and uh, uh, Terra as a payment uh, uh, mechanism. So it's not just the users that have been uh, uh, more and more uh, excited about uh, Terra, but we also have seen uh, an increasing number of integration and uh, overall volume um, on, uh, on Terra. So we started a launch with just Timon, and then we added the 24 merchants over time, reaching $24 billion. So we just in the last couple of quarters, we added a few of the most important merchants. So for example, we added WeMakePrice, which is Korea's number two e-commerce platform. They just have you know, over $5 billion in volume. We also added uh, uh, Korea's number one hospitality app. They have around $2 billion in online volume and more than 10 million users. Um, and they have more than 400,000 hotels in, uh, all over the countries. And then we also added uh, one offline merchant, uh, so the number one convenience store CU, that now uh, you know, uh, integrated with uh, Chai as well. Just to give you a sense of how the payments are split among all these merchants, uh, Timon is a quarter of the overall uh, payments, but uh, what is uh, in, in, uh, incredibly good for us is also that uh, two of the more recently added merchants, Enolia and uh, We Make Price, also constitute a significant portion of the overall payments. And this obviously is uh, evidence that uh, the new users that we are onboarding are particularly active uh, on um, there. In fact, we are uh, adding more and more active users. So if we are uh, sort of looking at from the lunch to today, we are talking about almost uh, uh, 700,000 uh, active users uh, as, of the, uh, as of today. Now, one big question about uh, the acquisition uh, of these users is how expensive these users have been for us. And so one nice thing we can do is actually looking into the economics of uh, acquiring more and more uh, customers for Chai. And in particular, one, uh, um, one of the main costs for uh, customer acquisition is the promotion rate that we have to offer these customers to be, uh, to be uh, to basically to convince them to use uh, Chai. And here we are plotting these trends. We are plotting uh, the bold dash line is the transaction volume trend, and the gray dash line is the promotion rate trend. What we see is basically that the correlation between these two is declining. In fact, while transaction volume has been increasing significantly, especially in the last few months, what we observe here is the promotion rate uh, has tended to actually drop significantly. And so this means that uh, all the nice graphs that I showed you before in terms of uh, the growth in active users uh, in the last few months uh, is great not only because we have more and more people using uh, uh, Chai, but each one of them costs us significantly less. And in fact, if you also formally look at the correlation between uh, 
uh, the weekly promotion rate and the transaction volume have been, you know, has been uh, as high as uh, 24% in the past, especially at the beginning when we were trying to uh, attract as, as many customers as possible. But now it's actually lower and it's an even lower at uh, less than 14%. So this is also very reassuring of the fact that we are becoming more and more uh, profitable as we add the users that cost us less. In fact, overall, if you look at not only the promotion rate, but overall customer acquisition cost, uh, you see that uh, the customer acquisition cost has been trending down uh, significantly since the beginning of uh, 2020. Uh, while the customers acquired have seen no actually flattening, but has been actually significantly increasing over the last few months, which is the gray dotted line. Now, one more thing that uh, I want to show you is that since we have the opportunity to actually look at how users uh, integrate across different merchants, uh, we also point, use this information to actually understand a little bit more about the spending pattern of different users. And what we see is that the customers that are uh, particularly active across multiple merchants are also the ones for which we have to offer a lower discount to begin with. So the, here we are plotting basically the discount spending uh, per transaction over the number of merchant users used. And as you can see, basically, if I use just one merchant, it's probably because I'm responding to a particular and significant uh, offer. While uh, as soon as I start using two merchants, these uh, discount rates drop them dramatically uh, and they basically go lower and lower as I become more and more active across merchants. This is important because uh, this basically highlights the fact that there, is, uh, that there is a need and there is also value in cross-pollination of users across uh, different merchants. Because once they get used uh, to uh, use the same platform across uh, across uh, uh, merchants, they become also better uh, uh, users for us. And uh, the the good news is that uh, starting in the fall of 2019, the share of customers who use multiple merchants has been skyrocketing. So now more than uh, 25, up to 30 percent of uh, uh, customers are using multiple merchants at the same time. So this is good on one end for uh, um, the uh, discount for every transaction, which I showed you uh, before, that these customers basically uh, are experiencing lower discounts, but they use the, the uh, chai across multiple merchants. But uh, this is also good news for us in terms of retention rate. In particular, uh, one other thing that is very different across uh, users once we compare how they behave across different merchants, is that the ones that use only one merchant are also the ones that are the toughest uh, to retain. We are sort of a, a little bit over 50% one month retention rate for those customers. But uh, we are significantly higher for, uh, uh, we are significantly higher for uh, the ones that use uh, multiple merchants. In fact, uh, once you use more than uh, three uh, merchants, you are a retention rate above 80%. Now, one more thing that I want to show you is that uh, if you look at the retention rate across cohorts, so how they look, how the customers that we acquired at the very beginning compare to the customers that we acquired over the, the next few months, uh, basically, we see that uh, still the retention rate is uh, pretty high because it goes from uh, 60 to 70 percent. Uh, and so that's also good in the sense that uh, that reassures us that the customers that we're acquiring right now, they are not worse customers than the ones that we acquired at the beginning. Obviously, the ones that we acquired right away are the most enthusiast and they are easier uh, to retain, but the differential is not uh, um, so worrisome. The other thing that uh, I want to mention is that uh, now we allow for top-ups, so the possibility to basically put money uh, into your account with uh, WeChai, and uh, there are more and more customers that do this. So they are not just uh, one uh, transactions customer, but they basically use the account uh, significantly more. And in fact, over time, we have uh, nowadays we have uh, 500,000 customers that use the top-ups, so they actually put money into their account. 
Now, this was basically an overview of what's going, what's going on with uh, Chai. I want to mention uh, uh, one more thing, which is a new alliance for uh, Terra and what that means in terms of, for example, the next products. And in particular, I will focus on one particular product called Anchor. So what's this uh, alliance? So the, there is a, have been formed a new interchain asset association. This is a collaborative uh, effort uh, to help research, fund, and create similar type of assets between Cosmos, Polkadot, and Terra. And this consortium of uh, uh, ecosystem participants research deeply on the potential economic possibility. They want to create new applications and also educate uh, on the new monetary primitives dedicated to POS, proof of stake. And so this asset association will provide stewardship of the technical projects and standards and will promote the adoption of interchain technologies and foster the development of standard processes. So this is basically linked also to the new technologies that I mentioned at the very beginning in terms of the smart contracts that are working also across multiple chains. One product that will be announced very, uh, very soon is Anchor. This is aimed to be the gold standard for passive income on the blockchain. This is how the UI will look like probably for Anchor. And I want to sort of mention uh, uh, sort of what it is and how that, uh, that works. So, but before doing that, let me just uh, uh, pause for a second and state what we believe are the weaknesses of the current DeFi decentralized finance system right away. So while DeFi, DeFi have been revolutionary in creating uh, uh, fully decentralized uh, crypto money markets, there has been one big drawback uh, which, is, which has been the volatility of the interest rates. And the volatility of the interest rates have been, have been basically the big obstacle uh, to be used uh, as to make these uh, money markets be used as an household savings product. And so the, what we believe is that the DeFi mass adoption needs the creation of a fully decentralized uh, saving account that offers a dependable and stable APR. What is Anchor? Anchor is exactly a DeFi protocol that leverages the block reward of every major blockchain to power heels on stable coin deposits. So let me dive in uh, how this actually works. So as I said, basically Anchor is a savings protocol that accepts, for example, Terra deposits and allow instant withdrawals and pay depositor a low volatility interest rate. To generate yield, Anchor lends out deposits to borrowers who put down liquid stake, proof of stake uh, uh, assets from major blockchains as collateral, what we call the B assets. So these B assets are basically the same as the assets that uh, you stake, uh, but are fungible and can be traded. Anchor then stabilizes the deposit interest rate by passing on a variable fraction of the B asset yield to the depositor. It guarantees the principle of the depositor by liquidating borrower's collateral via liquidation contracts and third-party arbitrageurs. So if this reminds you of something, this might remind you of basically a bank. You have depositors who come in and deposit uh, their B assets, and you have borrowers uh, who borrow uh, Terra, and in the middle, you have Anchor, who offer basically an interest rate and make sure that the, uh, the collateral is enough in order to uh, sustain an interest rate that is stable across cycles. And so we believe that the provision of this stable interest rate uh, to depositor is a necessary feature of any savings product that won't achieve actually broad appeal. Now, one... Uh, one uh, uh, main limitation of the existing products that have been out there, like Compound and uh, Maker, has been the highly cyclical nature of uh, uh, the highly cyclical nature of the uh, uh, deposit uh, interest rates. And so, behind offering low volatility yield, Anchor is an attempt to give the main street investor a single reliable rate of return across all blockchains. And the plethora of staking products, each with varying terms and yields, make DeFi very confusing, inaccessible, and unappealing to the average investors. Instead, 
anchored by aggregating these block rewards from all the major blockchains, is able to offer what we believe will be a benchmark interest rate. Just so that uh, sort of the, it, everything is clear in terms of how this works, for example, if I'm uh, uh, depositing uh, Biluna, um, uh, I'm getting an interest rate and uh, I'm, uh, pro, I'm stack, and um, I'm, uh, if I'm borrowing, uh, if I'm borrowing uh, uh, Terra, then I'm actually paying uh, this interest rate, and the mechanism makes sure that uh, the ones that uh, are borrowing uh, put down enough collateral to make sure that the interest rate that Anchor can offer to the depositor is uh, high enough and is stable uh, over time. So, the in, in particular, the interest rate is determined algorithmically, as you know, exactly very similar in the same spirit as the algorithm that uh, uh, propels the monetary policy underlying Terra, and is really a function of uh, the borrowing demand and supply, or what we call the utilization ratio, which is the fraction of Terra in the pool that has been borrowed. And so the interest rate will adjust automatically in order to meet uh, demand and supply and make sure that uh, offering a, a stable interest rate. Why we believe this is superior, as I said, basically, uh, hills on other DeFi protocols are mainly driven by short-term speculative demands for the underlying tokens. And we believe this is something that cannot really be stable. In particular, when speculative interest dies down, the APR will collapse, and with it, will bring down all the demand for uh, the savings product in the first place. While the fact that Anchor Yield uh, is powered by block rewards by the entire universe of the chain, this also allows us to be more diversified, and uh, uh, I also offer a more dependable uh, APR. Now, let me conclude since I am uh, out of time. Overall, we think that uh, you know, cryptocurrency adoption has been measured with uh, as many changing goalposts as there have been with uh, decentralization. Uh, however, I think Terra has proven a path to broad adoption via e-commerce, and we expect to see many more applications to contribute to Terra growth. Let me mention uh, that we recently also published a Narvar Business Review article on the future of stablecoin and what that might, uh, uh, that might entail for the e-commerce together with uh, 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 Nicolas Platias, who is the head of research at uh, Terra, where we actually take a broader view of what's happening in the market and what is likely to happen uh, in the near future with the interaction of stablecoins and uh, e-commerce. Overall, I think a lot of exciting news, and stay tuned. Thank you. Marco, that was 
very interesting. And again, we look forward for another update next year. Um, it is my pleasure now to welcome Professor Garud Iyengar. Uh, professor Iyengar is a professor of operational research at Columbia University in New York. And he recently uh, co-authored a white paper on the economics of partition blockchain adoption, thinking about, again, um, the um, uh, challenges, but also opportunity of getting adoption in permission enterprise networks. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Inigar. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Garud Iyengar. I am a faculty member in the Operations Research Department at Columbia University. And before that, I used to be the Associate Director for the Data Science Institute at Columbia. Blockchains and the way blockchains are revolutionizing all things data had been a central part of what the Data Science Institute was doing. And I, my particular interest in uh, this aspect is not so much from the computer science aspect, but also but looking at it from the economic aspect of why do blockchain solutions sometimes do not get adopted and what can we do to make them adopted at scale? So what I'm going to be talking about today is a step in that direction, a simple model to understand why permission blockchains, not permissionless, but permission blockchains are not getting adopted and identify the reasons why they're not getting adopted and try to see if there are ways that we can mitigate them. All right, the, the paper that I'm going to be presenting today is called Economics of Permission Blockchain Adoption. This is joint work with my colleague at Columbia, Jay Sethuraman, our joint PhD student, Benjen Wang, and a collaborator from Wake Forest University, Fahad Saleh. So blockchains are an ideal data structure for information sharing. Um, they provide immutable entries, which means that there is an audit trail for everything that has been done. And in particular, permission blockchains are better because the entities that are providing the consensus are in fact connected to uh, physical entities, which means that you can actually put a name to them. Uh, there are privacy preserving operations that you can do on the data, which such that only certain part of the data is visible and often only certain functions of the data is visible. And this can be very useful in setting up all kinds of rep reputation metrics, trying to make sure that various participants in the blockchain are only able to see the data that is relevant to them. Um, it's also distributed, which means that from a, from a security perspective, it cannot be attacked and brought down. So all of, for all of these reasons, blockchains can be game-changing for cross-firm collaborations. But what we've been seeing is that although from a computer science perspective, from a perspective of the underlying consensus mechanism, all things are great, they are not being adopted in many industries. And one of the things that we wanted to investigate was what are the industrial organizational aspects that are preventing blockchains from getting, in, getting adopted in some industries. And what we do in this paper is provide a very minimal network infrastructure that is able to adopt, identify such an adoption failure, that's able to figure out why these things do not get adopted, and then we provide a very simple resolution for it. So think of this paper as a stepping stone towards understanding what happens in larger networks. Here we are trying to bring the problem down to its simplest essence. So before I get down to the actual problem, I want you to think about a very toy example. The game consists of three agents, but only two players, meaning there are only two players that make decisions, but there are three agents that get welfare out of them. So that's player one, that's player two. If player one and player two adopt, they both end up paying a cost of one unit. That's the one unit there. But player three, or agent three, sorry, I correct myself, it's not player because they don't take decisions. Agent three ends up getting a payoff of four. So the net societal payoff is of two units. Similarly, in this particular cell, if neither of the player adopts, then neither of the players actually ends up paying any cost, but agent three does not get any benefits either. And if you just stare at this matrix for a moment, you can convince yourself the unique equilibrium here is going to be don't adopt, don't adopt. Both players do not adopt or take the don't adopt decision, and society ends up losing 
two units of social welfare that they could have gotten from here, which is the social optimal action pair. And they move to this cell where nobody gets anything. So this is sort of a uh, where our discussions began about looking at blockchains. Because what was happening was the cost of the blockchain was coming from one set of entities, but the benefits were being externalized in some sense. And unless you're able to in, endogen in or internalize some of those network benefits that were coming, the chances are that people will go to the equilibrium which is not socially optimal. For this particular toy example, we can solve the problem by transferring welfare from the third agent, the agent that basically gets all the welfare to the first two agents. So what I've done over here is I've taken three units of welfare. This cell was four units. So I took three units of welfare and distributed them to 1.5 to player one and 1.5 to player two. So therefore, now their trade-off becomes 0 0.5, 0 0.5, and the payoff for player, sorry, agent three becomes one. It's still positive, but it's lower than what it was before. But, and similar things have been done in the other cells. The transfer are budget balance. That means you do not have to inject any more cash. But what this transfer does is move the equilibrium from zero, 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 which was the earlier equilibrium, but not socially optimal, to making this socially optimal equilibrium of both players adopting the, uh, the solution to become socially optimal. And in fact, it becomes the unique equilibrium. So what I want you to take away from this basic example is there are often situations when the social welfare is coming from a third agent who is not the decision maker, who cannot influence this, the decision makers of player one and two. Player one and two end up financing the social welfare. And so there is a possibility that the equilibrium, in equilibrium, they do not adopt uh, the solution that could be socially optimal. And one way to solve this problem is to do transfers. And we'll, we'll now what we're going to do is take this story over to a more realistic supply chain network and see how this essence can be uh, almost represented in that network. So we're going to be looking at a very simple business setting. It's a simple supply chain. There is a single vendor. There are a bunch of manufacturers and a bunch of consumers. And the network that we're thinking about is of this sort. A, a single vendor that serves all manufacturers. In this particular example, I'm only showing two, but pretend that there are N different manufacturers. All of these manufacturers are competing for a bunch of consumers. And there is what we are showing is that when, if there is a blockchain, there is information sharing across manufacturers. That is the layer at which information sharing happens. There's a single vendor, and so there isn't really much information sharing that's happening between the manufacturer and the vendor. We have these edges called product quality displayed over here, and implicitly what we are assuming is that the consumer makes decisions of which manufacturer to buy from based on the quality of this manufacturer. And we'll get down to the details of this in a moment. So vendors, uh, vendors just produce the goods and ship them to different manufacturers. There's a single vendor, so every manufacturer effectively is buying from the same vendor. So the story here is that the, the way manufacturers differentiate themselves is on the basis of quality. And we'll get to quality in a couple of slides. Right now, what we want to look at the situation is why in such a setting, blockchains might be useful. And one canonical example that I want you to keep in mind while you're going through these slides is that of a food supply chain. The vendors here are farms. They potentially supply food or food items. Let's, you want to keep some item in mind, think of spinach. So they supply spinach to all kinds of grocery stores. More often than not, things are fine, but food can get contaminated at times. And these contaminated items can go cause serious illnesses. And even if uh, the cause is often known, trying to do uh, recalls can become expensive because you don't often keep track of exactly which vendor this bunch of spinach came from, what other grocery stores was the same spinach sent, and so on. So the blockchain enables efficient tracing of these defects and thereby saving costs. 
And this is, this is the kind of motivation that I want you to keep in mind, that vendors sometimes produce defective goods. When the defective goods are not recalled in time, you end up getting, you end up getting serious reputational costs and manufacturers want to avoid this cost. And one way to do that is to get information about the defective goods early. All right, so before we talk about manufacturers, we're gonna jump further down the network and look at con uh, consumer welfare. Consumers want to purchase from the highest quality manufacturers. And quality here does not mean defect. It does not mean, um, because if there were defects, the manufacturer would have not sold that item at all. Product quality here includes information like packing dates, transportation times. So some manufacturers might be better at keeping fresher fruit. Identity of the source that can determine whether ethical standards are met. So some are able to provide you this information better. Others are able to provide you information about processing standards and so on. So that's what we mean by quality. And what consumers want to do is purchase from a manufacturer that has the highest quality. And like I said, Quality does not help determine defect because if that was the case, the manufacturers would have not uh, sold that item at all. One thing that we've been seeing is that even though information about quality is welfare enhancing for the consumer, manufacturers often resist sharing this information. And what we see through our paper is that the sharing could be beneficial for all parties. Uh, however, there is a transfer that is needed. And the reason a transfer is needed, as you can start imagining here, that the social welfare of the consumers in, is enhanced and that has to be somehow fed back to the manufacturer. So I'm sort of looking forward a little bit in what the modeling is, but that's the kind of direction that we are going in. All right. Now let's try to understand manufacturers. So manufacturers sit between vendors and consumers. These are the people that buy from vendors and sell it to consumers. And again, just to conceptualize the food chain, so food supply chain story, grocers sell to consumers. Grocers fail reputation costs if they sell contaminated food. If we know that a particular grocer has sold contaminated food, perhaps I don't want to return to that. And so at least there is a short term dip in their revenue. Identifying contaminated shipments expediently reduces costs. Costs. Uh, reputation cost, because then you know that this firm has picked it up, picked up the information quickly, and then handed it over to potentially the, uh, the recall people, and the consumers are not going to be hurt as much. An immutable audit trail from the farmer to consumer can help. Uh, often, there is a negotiation that happens around food recall as to who was at fault? Where did it happen? Did it happen at the time of actual growing? Did it happen during the transfer from the vendor to the grocer and so on? And so having an immutable audit trail that is able to keep track of the food as it passes through the supply chain is going to be useful. Immutable in the sense that they can it cannot be changed after the fact. Already, I'm sort of laying down the groundwork for why a blockchain could be very useful in this setup. The cause can be identified early and recall can be implemented. And now the reason why blockchains can potentially allow the cause to be identified early is that if all the grocers in the market are on the blockchain, then anyone discovering that particular fault or defect can get communicated to all the grocers. So instead of each grocer relying on their particular time to discovery, they all get to see it at the minimum time to discovery of all the manufacturers, that is all the grocers that are on the supply chain. So the difference is either it's my time or everybody else's time, the minimum of everybody else's time. And you can show that as you increase the number of grocers in the blockchain, this second piece, which is the minimum of everybody's time, ends up being much, much smaller than my own time. And this cost saving serves as a motivation for the blockchain. All right. So let's set it up to a little bit more general model. So the, the food supply chain was a motivation and it's a very strong motivation for our work, but let's abstract it away a little bit. The manufacturer's welfare consists of three components. Revenue, and you increase revenue by attracting customers by signaling quality. I'm going to put all my transactions on the blockchain. Consumers can potentially verify it. Well, they're not going to directly verify it, but maybe there are third-party 
players that come in and set up uh, some sort of apps that customers are able to see what my past transactions are, what my record is in terms of quality and so on, uh, ratings and things of that sort. Reputation cost, I want to minimize reputation cost by detecting defects early. And adoption cost, I have to pay for adopting the blockchain. So the first two things are unequivocally good for me. Uh, there is an issue with the attracting customers part that I'll come in a moment. But on the face of it, the first two terms look like good for a manufacturer when they adopt blockchain. And the third one being the bad part. And as we have paper progressed, we found that even the revenue part can end up being a reason for not adopting the blockchain. So this is a repeat of what we are saying that we brought the single vendor in to simplify the story. So when everybody adopts a blockchain, you see the, contam the contamination is identified uh, at the minimum of the two detection times. Here we are looking at an example of two manufacturer. If there are N manufacturer, then it's going to be the minimum of N detection time uh, without, and as you can also see, uh, this is not clear from a simple analysis, but a little bit more detailed analysis, you can see that the benefits increase with the market share of the adopting manufacturers. The blockchain also helps higher quality manufacturers because it reduces the error in the quality signal. And the way we model this is by saying that the manufacturers put their past interaction data on this blockchain, consumers are able to view it, and as a result, get a better signal. And this potentially can lead to concentration of demand. And that has bad implications for detecting defects because now everything is being done by very few manufacturers and potentially this diversification effect that you were getting from blockchains may not happen. And that's another reason why um, blockchains may not get adopted. All right, so that's the context. And now we're gonna go through and show you various results that we've been able to obtain in this setting. Just to fix ideas, let me just go and remind you of the network. Here's the network, single vendor, N different manufacturers. We're trying to understand when and why manufacturers adopt or do not adopt the blockchain. There's a consumer downstream. The consumer gets better quality information if the manufacturers happen to be on the blockchain. All right. So going back to the results section now. First thing that we find in this simple model is that blockchain always enhances consumer welfare. Uh, this is not very surprising. Consumers incur no cost, but you receive useful information. Consumers are able to select higher quality manufacturers on, order, on average because the blockchain improves what happens to their quality. And by the way, um, I should have mentioned it right in the beginning. There's a paper that goes with it. it. The title of the paper is Economics of Permission Blockchains. It's available um, online if you just search for it. And that, that's where all the mathematical model has been made clear. Here, I'm trying to give you uh, the, the main messages without getting too much into the details of the mathematics. Uh, the consumer enhancement, consumer welfare enhancement result is true even if the blockchains do not fully reveal manufacturer quality. Uh, even if it just improves manufacturer quality, welfare goes up. So here, there are no ifs and buts. Consumers always benefit. Now we want to understand what happens at the manufacturer level because those are the guys that have to decide whether to adopt the blockchain. Consumers cannot do anything about it. They might love that manufacturers go onto a blockchain, but they can't make that decision for them, right? Now what we find is that blockchain is welfare enhancing for the manufacturers only for intermediate detect, defect detection rates. That's sort of surprising. One would have thought that this should be a uniform result. And the reason this result ends up happening is that at low defect detection rate, Investing in the blockchain is no longer profitable because the rates are so low that you're not able, no manufacturer is able to detect soon enough to avoid significant reputation costs. If the defect detection rate is high, then manufacturers don't care about blockchains because they can detect it early on their own. So it's really the middle part 
where it's not so high that I can detect it on my own or so low that even going out of the blockchain doesn't help me. That's the sweet spot at which manufacturers are going to be interested in a blockchain. Okay. So let's say that we are in that intermediate domain where manufacturers are indeed interested in the blockchain. What happens there? Well, it turns out that blockchain may reduce welfare even when there are no adoption costs. We are in the regime where detection rates are decent in the intermediate range so that a potential manufacturer is interested in being on the blockchain. And even then, and there are no adoption costs. So we remove the component of the cost. So we can't say that they are not adopting because it's the cost is too high. Even then, it turns out that adopting blockchains may it may not be very good for the manufacturers. And the way this happens is through the quality angle. Blockchains improve the quality signal. Because of this, manufacturers that are ex ante sort of more comparable end up becoming more separated in the minds of the consumers. As a result, consumers start putting more and more weight on the higher quality manufacturers. So you end up concentrating demand more. And as a result of this concentration of demand, the detection, the early detection part gets hampered. You have fewer. So the way to think about this is that if, if earlier the demand was spread out, then there were, let's say, N different manufacturers that were independently looking for faults. Now, because of a concentration of demand, that number has dramatically reduced. As a result, when you're taking the minimum of the detection time, you're taking a minimum over a much reduced set. And as a result, if the reputation costs are large enough, you end up actually seeing a worse behavior. So it has to be, again, these are all stories that we are trying to develop as to see why X, when you look at the dy dynamics of these, this market, it seems obvious that blockchain should be welfare enhancing for the entire society why things can go bad. And even at the societal level, things are beneficial, and we'll see in a moment under what conditions. Even then, it will happen that the manufacturers lose and the consumers benefit a lot. Think back to the toy example that we had in the beginning. The two players lose, but the third agent benefits dramatically. And we need to figure out how to do that, how to get that solution back into this setup. So. Here's, a, here's an interesting and tricky part. So the fluid blockchain adoption depends on beliefs unrelated to fundamentals. Uh, and I'll, I'll unpack this statement in a moment. So first of all, in equilibrium, if you want blockchains to be adopted, then all manufacturers must prefer adoptions when others adopt. That's just a basic statement. Now, when... When a manufacturer is trying to compare two decisions, whether to adopt or not to adopt, we are looking at a situation where everybody else has adopted and there is a manufacturer that's trying to understand whether they should adopt or not adopt. Not adopting is an off-path action, meaning that this is not part of the equilibrium. So one has to understand what happens to this off-path action. And in order to understand the impact of this off-path action, you need to uh, think in terms of off-path beliefs. And the adoption decision actually does depend on these off-path beliefs. And we will see that these off-path beliefs end up becoming important. And we'll not get into the details of it in this talk, but in the paper, it's all special, spelled out. So under certain belief structures, an adoption equilibrium is particularly unlikely. And in other belief structures, an adoption equilibrium is likely. And the point that I want you to take away from here is that even after you have put in all the conditions necessary for the manufacturer to potentially adopt, there is an education aspect or a PR aspect that has to be done with the customers to change their beliefs so that this equilibrium can be sustained. So that's another one of the messages that we want to get. Blockchain, as we said, that blockchain adoption may not arise even when total wealth, it's when total welfare is enhanced. And this happens because consumers always benefit, but they do not play a role in adoption. Manufacturer bear costs, but do not gain from adoption. 
And that's what we call a market failure. And we, we have designed in the paper uh, a system of transfers that can be charged to consumers and paid to the manufacturers to make this happen. So whenever all the economic conditions lead to blockchain adoption at a societal level, we can design a transfer that can make this happen even at the individual level, that manufacturers are happy and consumers are happy. So the key insights from this particular supply chain example was that blockchains can provide valuable information to consumers, but consumers don't detect determine blockchain adoption. It, blockchains have ambiguous value to manufacturers. And one may have to, one not may, but in most circumstances will have to define transfer mechanisms that can take consumer benefits and transfer it to the manufacturers that are incurring costs. Just a few conclusions. Blockchains has value in business settings. Almost always societal benefit goes up. This adoption may not arise due to misaligned incentives. And one has to look at the economic structure of the incentive carefully to design right mechanisms of intervention. Sometimes it has to be in terms of transfers, and sometimes it may also be in terms of changing off-path beliefs, changing beliefs about the various players. And both of them is necessary in order for us to get blockchains adopted in various markets. Thank you very much. What? Oh. How? Why? B. B. Oh, it's B. 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 Always open. Trade where you want to, when you want to. B. Your trustworthy crypto exchange. Computer science and the progress that has happened in the last century and the, has given us this huge computational surplus and a great set of protocols and capabilities for creating this security in a new and more comprehensive way in cyberspace. Truth, on the other hand, is sort of taking matters into your own hand. Like with truth, it's all about interacting with the world directly. Markets are about story. Great bubbles happen around stories that are really appealing, but also around stories that really do change the world. Right? The internet bubble in the 1990s uh, got way, way ahead of itself, but the internet really changed about everything we did in the world. And so we had the same thing with crypto. Thank you, Professor Inigar. Um, we look forward in hearing more in your further research on this topic. Um, it is now my true pleasure to welcome the first presentation uh, ever that we know of uh, from a member of the economic team at the Federal Reserve Board, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Garth Bagman. Uh, Dr. Bagman, together with Dr. Jean, uh, Jean Fleming, has recently uh, published a paper on the global demand for basket-backed uh, stablecoins, um, looking at you know uh, uh, basket-backed stable, stablecoins such as you know it was the first incarnation of Libra, um, and we welcome Dr. Bagman uh, presenting the paper now. Welcome. So hello, uh, my name is Garth Boffman. I'm an economist at the Federal Reserve Board. And today I'm going to be presenting a paper called Global Demand for Basket-Backed Stablecoins that I've written with a colleague of mine named Gene Fleming. I just want to take a moment to thank the organizers. It's a really great uh, program that you guys have put together, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. 
I should also say that uh, you can find the full paper on my website, which is uh, www.garthboffman.com. And I also welcome any comments or questions at my email, which is garth.a.boffman at frb.gov. So one more housekeeping thing, I have to make a disclaimer, which is that the analysis and conclusions set forth are gonna be mine. Uh, they do not indicate concurrence by the other members of the research staff, the Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System. So there's this big new thing in payments, which is uh, stable coins as a new payments uh, means of payment. So what are stable coins? Well, they're gonna be crypto assets whose value is tied to one or more other assets. So this could be gold or diamonds, but the ones that we're gonna be interested in are gonna be tied to some currency. So most are tied to a single currency. For example, Tether is tied to the US dollar. At the end of 2019, it had a market cap in excess of 4 billion, but there's many others. So MakerDAI tries to keep its value stable by following an algorithm of, of a certain kind. Uh, there's TrueUSD, which is a competitor to Tether. Paxos, Gemini Dollar, the list continues to grow. There's many, many of them out there these days. We're going to think about a particular class of stable coins that have been proposed, which instead of tracking one single currency, are going to try and follow a basket of, of several currencies. So the most prominent example of this is going to be Facebook's Libra, which was, when it was proposed last summer, uh, was going to follow a basket of, of different currencies and had a mission to enable a simple global currency and financial, financial infrastructure that would empower billions of people. So subsequently, Libra 2.0 has added uh, single currency coins alongside the basket. They, so far as I understand, are still uh, talking about the basket. Another prominent proposal came from a governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney. Uh, and his proposals for the uh, artfully named synthetic hegemonic currency. So uh, he suggested that such a, a global basket coin could dampen the domineering influence of the US dollar on global trade. More recently, uh, just a month or so ago, there was a proposal for an Asian digital currency backed by a basket comprising the yen, yuan, yuan, and Hong Kong dollar. And this was proposed at the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference just a month ago. So when you're thinking about stable coins, there are lots and lots of questions that can come up. And I imagine a good portion of this whole week is, is, gonna, is uh, dedicated to these various questions. So for founders of a, of a coin, there are questions about technical design and implementation. Once you start thinking about uh, coins that you're trying to keep at a stable value, you need to worry about liquidity management and transaction pricing, how you're gonna custody the reserve fund if you keep one, and many other questions. From regulators, you tend to get a different set of questions. So they're worried about various risks. So risks if the stable coin were to scale widely, they're worried about risks to the payment system, to transmission of monetary policy. Regulators are often concerned about consumer protection, anti-money laundering, and counter-terrorist financing, um, among others. So I'm not gonna talk about any of that today. Uh, instead, I'm gonna focus on a much more basic kind of uh, question, which is just what are the fundamental economics of a basket currency? I'm gonna break this into a few different parts. I'm gonna ask how does basket backing affect demand for a currency from the public? How would a basket currency affect welfare? So does it make people better off if they use it? And what is the effect on both of these demand and welfare of the basket's composition, the weights of uh, how you design the basket currency? So just to step back for a second, what are some of the intuitive reasons that people have proposed as to why a basket backed stable coin would be beneficial? Well, looking at Mark Kearney, uh, the question seems to be about political economy concerns. So he thinks that having a basket backed currency would reduce dependence on any single country, specifically the United States, economic policy. So monetary policy and trade policies. There's also a question of having broad attractiveness. So if people have a behavioral preference for a currency that's close to their domestic one in some sense, 
that a basket currency might have a broader appeal across the globe. There's an important knock-on effect in payments economics when one thinks about adoption, which is network effects. So if one has a global audience, the more people that use a currency, the more people are going to accept it, and so the more useful it becomes. There's a whole separate consideration of portfolio theory concerns as to why you might want a basket currency. And that's gonna be uh, that the basket currency might have less volatility than its components through something like a law of averages. In this paper, we're not really gonna think about political economy or behavioral reasons. We're really gonna focus on this last one, which is the portfolio theory explanation for why a basket currency might be desirable. But we're also gonna think a little bit about the network economics. And we'll leave the other uh, uh, questions for future research. So I've given you a little bit of an introduction. Let me just summarize the big takeaways of what we're gonna do and what we get out of it. So what we're gonna do is build a micro-founded model of money and trade and currency choice. In this model, we're gonna have trade shocks that are gonna drive demand for a basket-backed currency. We're gonna calibrate up the parameters of that model and numerically solve it. When we do this, we get four basic findings. So our first headline finding is that holdings of the basket currency in our preferred calibration are gonna be relatively low, comprising less than three and a half percent of world currency holdings. Our second major finding is that despite these low holdings, the welfare benefits are not insignificant and they're gonna be on the order of about 2% of GDP. So how can those two things jive? How can it be that people don't use a currency much, but it is substantially beneficial to a world welfare? Well, it's gonna be that people hold this currency and spend it in cases where marginal utility is really high in cases where they really wished that they had that little bit of extra value to buy things. After we think about those two first order concerns, we're gonna consider the composition of the basket. And we're gonna find that the composition of the basket is not terribly important for welfare. It doesn't have big effects on welfare. I'm not gonna actually show you this exercise today. I don't really have time but all the details are in the paper and you can look at exactly why that happens. But briefly, there's a disagreement um, among different parties, that for the, the consumers from different countries, as to which way they want the basket to go, whether they want it to be like their currency or a different one. And this disagreement leads the overall welfare effect to be relatively small of changing the basket composition. Finally, we're gonna do an exercise where we think about these network effects. And specifically, we're gonna think about whether low demand for the basket would incentivize, is sufficient to incentivize sellers to actually invest in the technology to accept a currency. And we're gonna find that it may not. It's kind of a suggestive calculation, and I'll walk you through it at the end. If I was to summarize in a phrase what we find in this paper, it's that various fears of basket-backed currencies may be overstated for these reasons that I'm highlighting, that their holdings would be relatively low and that they may be beneficial. So let me talk to you about this model that we've built. I'm not gonna show you any math today. If you go look at the paper, you can see all the gory details and all of the equations. I'm just gonna give you the building blocks that go into the model. So the academic predecessors uh, are gonna be uh, these two papers, one by Lagos and Wright and one by Shang. Lagos and Wright is a workhorse monetary model. And the model from Kathy Zhang is gonna be a model of uh, international currency competition. So this is, this is where we're getting our inspiration for the competition between the various currencies. So in the model, I'm gonna have two countries. I'm gonna call these home and foreign. And I'm gonna suppose that home is a larger country. So we're thinking of the United States in our calibration. Within each country, I'm gonna have two kinds of agents. 
I'm going to have buyers and sellers. The model is going to have a timeline. It's going to be discrete time. I'm going to have discrete periods. And it's going to go on forever. People have long horizons that they're planning for. And each period is going to be broken into two subperiods. First is going to be a decentralized market. That's the first subperiod. And then a centralized market. That's the second subperiod. In the decentralized market, there are one-to-one -one random meetings between buyers and sellers. This is going to be the retail exchange part of the economy where people are going to need money. The second subperiod, the centralized market, is the international market with general consumption goods where people can trade currencies on a foreign exchange market. And that's where they're going to do their portfolio balancing. And all agents are going to discount the future at a standard rate. So drilling down into this decentralized market, I have buyers and sellers. They're only going to differ in this decentralized market. In this decentralized market, buyers are going to receive utility from consuming, but they can't produce. Sellers are going to produce at some cost, but they don't want to consume. And I'm thinking of the good that's traded in this market as being a retail good, something that you go out and, and physically search for, uh, such that it's going to be specialized. You couldn't uh, it's not always the case that any two buyers and sellers could trade. It is going to be the case that the good is divisible. So it's not a lumpy thing. You can, you can divide it up. That's going to have people uh, buying different quantities based upon their currency holdings. And then finally, I'm assuming that the good is non-storable. So you can't use this good as an asset to finance purchases. Trade is going to be subject to certain frictions. Buyers may travel from their home country to uh, the opposite country. I'm gonna suppose for simplicity that sellers don't, that they're gonna stay put. Meetings in the decentralized market are gonna be anonymous and temporary. There's not gonna be this ability to commit that would allow me to give you goods on a promise that you pay me back later. So I'm ruling out credit in this economy. This is all to motivate the need for a medium of exchange, which is gonna be money. It's gonna be our three currencies. But then within a meeting, we're gonna have buyers and sellers bargaining over price and quantity, subject to the limitation that a buyer can only transfer the money that they already hold. So trade in the centralized market is gonna be in a general good and then money. People are gonna rebalance their money holdings. And this is gonna be a competitive Walrasian market. So prices are set according to normal supply and demand. Buyers are gonna to work to produce this general good and they're gonna use that good that they produce to get money that they're gonna carry into the next decentralized market. Sellers are gonna take the money that they had from the previous central, uh, de decentralized market and sell it in the centralized market to consume this general good. There's an important technical assumption that comes from this Lagos Wright paper the agents in the centralized market have quasi-linear preferences for this uh, 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 general good. The importance of this is going to—it's going to remove the history dependence, and therefore wealth and, and wealth effects. So I'm not going to have to carry around histories of individual agents. That's all going to get wiped out each period. So in the decentralized market, trade is anonymous and there's no commitment. So I need some medium of exchange. That medium of exchange is gonna be currency issued by governments. So I have a fiat currency issued at home, a fiat currency issued uh, in the foreign country. And I'm gonna have both country, both currencies growing at some constant equal rate, funded by lump sum taxation. Importantly, I'm gonna have kind of dumb central banks here that don't respond to anything. They just keep the currency growing at a constant rate. So this is a purely monetarist uh, central bank. Then the third currency, the innovative part of this model is the basket currency. So what is the basket currency once you drill down into the details of the model? So it's gonna be a technology that in the centralized market combines some kappa units, nominal units of the home currency with one minus kappa units of the foreign currency into one unit of the basket. Once that unit is assembled, it can't be broken apart until the next centralized market. So this 
Currency really is a separate currency. It's not the same as carrying around a Forex portfolio. So I have this further assumption that in each centralized market, all previous issuance of the basket currency is redeemed, meaning they trade it back to people, trade back the underlying currencies to people. This is going to have an important implication in terms of pricing of the currencies. It's going to force an arbitrage condition such that every period in the centralized market, the value of the basket is just going to be a straight uh, weighted average of the two underlying sovereign currencies. So this assumption rules out bubble equilibria and speculation and anything else. So this really is going to be a stable coin. It's important to remark at this moment that besides uh, the composition of the currency, there is no fundamental difference in between the fiat currencies and the basket currencies. It's not the case that the basket currency is cheaper to use or uh, uh, can be used electronically, whereas the sovereign currencies can't. I don't have any of that in the model. This is really just about the portfolio value of having a basket at first exchange rather than individual sovereign currencies. So I'm going to have trade shocks that are going to create demand for this basket. Specifically, I'm going to have these per persistent trade shocks that affect the frequency of interna international meetings, the probability that you travel from home to foreign and vice versa. For simplicity, I'm just going to have two states. I'm going to have a trade state where there's a positive probability of travel and a no trade state where there's no probability of travel. But because of these different possibilities, portfolios of individual buyer, of, of buyers in each country are going to adjust depending upon the state. So if you think there's a high probability that you're going to travel, you might want to hold some of the other country's currency. This fluctuation in demand is going to create fluctuations in the value of currencies affecting those countries, those currencies purchasing power. Because currencies purchasing power fluctuates, there's demand for a more stable unit of, of value, uh, medium and medium exchange. And that's what's going to be served by the basket. I'm going to refer to this value of the basket as the insurance motive for holding the basket. If a currency is expected to depreciate upon the arrival of a trade shock, you would rather hold the basket because that currency would depreciate less. There's another, another motive for holding a currency, which is going to be spendability. So for, for me in this model, spendability is going to be how many sellers accept a given currency. And let me turn to that now. So sellers are going to differ in each country based on their type. And what, is, what do I mean by type? Type is going to dictate which currencies you're set up to accept. So in, for now, I'm going to assume that this is exogenous, but I'm going to consider several different cases for the composition of the population of sellers. For timing, just to reiterate, at the beginning of a period, nature is going to draw the trade shock. So whether you move to the trade or the no trade state, then the decentralized market is gonna open. This is my retail market. Buyers may travel and agent, then agents trade bilaterally. And the amount that they can trade is gonna depend upon the buyer's money holding and the seller's type. After the retail market, this decentralized market, then I have a centralized market which opens. An outstanding basket currency gets redeemed, agents produce, they rebalance their portfolio with sovereign currency. They may buy new basket currency and they consume that general good and move on to the next period. So I get some theoretical results out of uh, this, this model that I wanna talk about before I turn to the numerical simulations. So the first point that I wanna make is about the composition of, not of the basket and its relation to sovereign monetary policies. So the result that we get in the paper is that if you have a nominal, nominally fixed basket, so if the basket is 50 euro cents and $50 cents, then existence of a stationary Markov equilibrium is going to require that both of those currencies 
grow at an equal rate. That is, both countries have to have the same monetary policy. They have to have the same long-run inflation target in order for me to construct an equilibrium. So what's the intuition for this? Well, suppose that one currency had higher inflation. If each period that currency depreciates relatively, then that currency comprises less real value of the basket. Well, then eventually the basket currency is not going to have any value coming from the high inflation currency. All of the value of the basket is going to come from the lower inflation currency, which rules out the existence of a stationary equilibrium. So this crucially is a result of these constant nominal shares. And it raises questions as to how basket weights should really be determined and indicates that fixed nominal shares are probably not a good idea. I have a conjecture that instead uh, fixed real weights would provide a, 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 um, a better system, but we're going to leave that for, for future work. Most of the proposals that we've seen for, for these currencies either haven't explained how they're going to fix the basket or they, they explicitly say that they're going to rely on these fixed nominal shares. And, and so that's what we're going to model today. The second theoretical result that I want to talk about is the feedback effects of the basket currency on the value of sovereign currencies. So to reiterate, trade shocks are going to affect the demand for currency and therefore its value. In a high tr a trade state, demand for the other country's currency, local demand for the other country's currency goes up uh, because the probability that I'll need it to trade is increased. When countries are of different sizes, like we're gonna assume here, there are differential effects of this state transition. So importantly, the small country's currency is gonna be more volatile in response to these uh, trade shocks. In this environment with volatile currencies, the basket is gonna have two, two kinds of effects. There's gonna be direct effects of the basket, uh, kind of partial equilibrium effects, and there's gonna be some indirect effects, uh, feedback effects, general equilibrium effects. So the partial equilibrium effect is that the basket's movement is always gonna be between uh, the movements of the two sovereign currencies. And this provides insurance. That has a direct effect on portfolios through a substitution effect. I like the insurance value of the basket, so I'm gonna uh, decrease my demand for other currencies. There's also a general equilibrium effect that's gonna go in the other direction. So when demand for a basket varies across states, the value of the component currencies is gonna be more volatile. This is gonna reduce the insurance value of the basket. And the indirect effect of, uh, is going to have, this is an indirect effect on portfolios through prices. Okay, so now let me turn quickly to these numerical exercises that we've done. So the different exercises are going to depend upon different assumptions about seller's acceptance probabilities. All of the other parameters of the model, we calibrate to match the United States and Mexico. And you can go see the paper to, to see the details of how we calibrate the model. The five scenarios that I'm gonna uh, uh, think about differ in the, the, which sellers accept which currencies. The first scenario is gonna be a national currency scenario. So sellers in each country are gonna only accept their local currency. In the international currency scenario, this is gonna be a dollar dominant scenario. H sellers, the sellers in the home current country are only gonna accept their own currency, but two thirds of the sellers in the foreign country are gonna accept uh, the home currency, while only one third only accepts F. Then we have three cases uh, with the basket. First, I'm gonna have a foreign adopts scenario. So no H sellers are gonna accept the basket, but a large share of F sellers are gonna take it. The home adopts scenario is the reverse. And then in a both, I'm gonna have a both accept scenario where about two thirds of both H and F sellers accept the basket alongside their domestic currencies, with the remaining third of each sellers only accepting their domestic currency. And I'm gonna think of these as the government. Uh, the government's never gonna take uh, uh, some exotic stable coin to be used uh, to pay taxes. So there's always gonna be some uh, agents that hold out. I talked about how trade shocks affect uh, um, currency demand. This shows up 
in the relative values of the currencies across states. So this zeta is going to be the value of, the, of a given currency in the trade state divided by its value in the no trade state. And you can see that these values differ significantly between the, across the five scenarios. But importantly, the basket is always in between the two. All right, let's, think, let's look at currency demand in each uh, of these scenarios. So first in the national currencies example, if you travel, your only option is to use the local currency. Nobody accepts uh, other people's currencies. The key thing to take away from this picture is just that buyers are gonna hold some of each currency in both states. Why do they hold it in the no trade state? Because there's some chance that they'll transition to the trade state and need to use this currency. Of course, demand for, uh, foreign, for the opposite currency is gonna be higher in the trade state than it is in the no trade state. In the international currencies case, so this is the dollar dominance case, home buyers only demand their own currency, while foreign buyers demand a little bit of, of, of both. Uh, so I should say demand for both currencies is somewhat lower in this economy. Why? Well, because dollars are substituting for foreign. In the national currencies case, we always both needed both. Now home only needs home and foreign can also use home for lots of its transactions. So when I compare things to the basket cases, I need to think about these partial versus general equilibrium effects. So the hot colors here are gonna be partial equilibrium. The cool colors are gonna be uh, uh, general equilibrium. And the thing that I really wanna point out is that in partial equilibrium, the insurance value of the basket currency is much higher. So this is the foreign accepts basket uh, equilibrium. I should also point out that in this case where only one kind of buyer accepts the currency, you only demand the currency in one kind of state, one state, and that's to ensure against the state where a given currency would depreciate. So in the both accepts, all that I wanna point out here is that the difference between partial and general equilibrium kind of washes out and that's because both buyers are moving in and out of the currency. So just to get a takeaway, in both of my one country accepts scenarios, you uh, have much higher uh, demand, whereas in the both accepts, it's about the same. That said, there really is significantly higher welfare under the both accepts relative to the uh, international currency case because money demand is much higher because the basket currency is serving a stabilizing role. If you think about basket composition, people are gonna end up disagreeing and the result is that welfare is not that important. I'm running out of time, so I'll just say, if you calculate seller's willingness to pay to accept the currency, you get relatively low numbers. So in everything that I've showed you, I fixed seller's uh, acceptance profile but given that fixed behavior, I could calculate their willingness to pay. And it's not as much, it's really not that high. And so there might be some concern about getting sellers to actually accept these currencies. So in conclusion, uh, what did we do today? I built a model of decentralized exchange with trade shocks to study demand for basket-backed money. Abstracting from many risks and costs of such an asset, we find that general equilibrium effects on component currencies volatility limits the basket's value. The presence of the basket, if, both, if sellers in both countries accept, can greatly improve welfare. Optimal basket weights are gonna depend upon where the, country is, the currency is accepted, but they don't matter that much for welfare. And low demand on the part of buyers for the basket currency is gonna limit sellers' willingness to pay to accept the basket. So thank you guys very much. I uh, hope you have a good day. And I uh, welcome your questions.
Thank you, Dr. Bachman. Uh, we look forward in uh, seeing more papers uh, published by the Federal Reserve Board as you guys focus on issues regarding blockchain and cryptocurrency. It is now my pleasure to welcome from UC Berkeley, Professor Barry Heiking Green. Uh, Professor Heiking Green is going to talk about Libra and its discontents and present a different view on the Libra uh, coin. Welcome, Professor Heiking Green. I'm Barry Eichen Green. Uh, I'm a professor of economics and political science at the University of California at Berkeley. Maybe I should start by uh, explaining why I'm here, um, how and why I got here. I'm not a technologist or a blockchain enthusiast. Uh, I'm actually an economic and monetary historian by profession. Uh, much of my work has been on the classical or 19th century gold standard. You all will probably know that there's something of an affinity between gold bugs, enthusiasts of the, uh, of the gold standard, and uh, stablecoin blockchain bugs. Both have something of a libertarian streak, I think. Both believe, not entirely accurately, that the gold standard operated like a private money with limited government uh, involvement. And they see an analogy between a dollar that was once pegged to gold and a stable coin that might be pegged to the dollar or to another uh, major currency. So the fact that I've worked on the gold standard led me to be invited to lunch, actually to uh, a series of, of lunches at excellent San Francisco restaurants with the funders and founders of uh, prospective stablecoins. I first thing I noticed was that I was the youngest person at the table. I was the oldest person at the table, sorry about that, by like 30 years. Looking at the program for this conference, I see that um, history repeats itself in, in, in that respect as well. Uh, I explained that I was skeptical about the stablecoin idea. I was skeptical that uh, uh, a private label stablecoin, a private label dollar would be uh, viable. Uh, my conclusion was that my luncheon companions knew all about blockchain, but they didn't know very much about monetary economics, uh, which is what I do. Uh, if you know monetary economics, you'll be familiar, for example, with the literature on currency crises or on speculative attacks on pegged exchange rates, including successful uh, speculative attacks on gold standards, on gold exchange standard systems. So I asked my luncheon companions, are you familiar with the literature on speculative attacks on, on pegged exchange rates? And they responded, What's that? Uh, so, and hence my skepticism then, which uh, I, I uh, retain now. Uh, I think uh, this more accurate historical an uh, analogy between speculative attacks on currencies and gold standards in the past with stablecoin schemes today leads you to the conclusion that uh, stable coins are either fragile, they're prone to attack and collapse if they're only partially backed or collateralized with actual dollars or, or uh, dollar bank balances, or they're prohibitively um, expensive to scale up if they are, in fact, fully or over collateralized. So um, that brings me to uh, Facebook's private label stablecoin, uh, known to us all as Libra. I was skeptical about the viability uh, of Libra when the original proposal was floated more than a year ago. And as I said uh, a few moments ago, I remain skeptical. Now, uh, there is a new Libra white paper 2.0 that was issued uh, back in April of 2020, and it, it filled in many of the blanks in the original uh, white paper. But I think blanks and ambiguities remain that, again, 
uh, lead me to the conclusion that this scheme is never going to get off the ground. So the problem with uh, Libra 1.0 was pushed back from regulators, financial regulators around the world who worried about whether it would uh, create financial stability risks, whether it would undermine the effectiveness of national monetary policies. Uh, a few of those concerns have been addressed, others not. But even the ones that have been addressed, the way that uh, um, Libra's architects and backers have attempted to, to address those problems, I think raises as many questions as it answers. So what does uh, White Paper 2.0 uh, say? Uh, number one, it replaces uh, the original Libra, which was essentially pegged to a basket of different national currencies with a, a, a set of separate stable coins, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the euro, one of which would be pegged one-to-one -to, -one to the yen, and so forth and so on. That does address the issue of who would ever want to use this thing. Nobody actually wants to do transactions in a basket of currencies. If there were a demand for such a thing, some clever investment bank, J.P. Morgan or someone like that, would have uh, uh, constructed and marketed the basket long, long ago. But there could conceivably be an interest in, in, in using a stable coin uh, that is widely used by other people and pegged one-to-one -to, -one, uh, to the dollar among residents of the United States and other people who presently use uh, U.S. Treasury issued uh, dollars. So uh, I, I, I think that's a small step forward in, in, in terms uh, of viability. We're also told that uh, Libra will be uh, fully backed. Uh, its reserve, made up of cash and short-term securities, will be held by a, quote, network of well-capitalized custodian banks, and there will be designated dealers who will commit to making markets with tight spreads. In other words, buying and selling Libra for, in our case in the U.S., actual dollars uh, at a price that barely deviates uh, from one-to-one, -one, and they will interact both with retail customers like you and me and with the Libra uh, Association, which will uh, burn and uh, issue uh, the Libra uh, units. Um, so I think that uh, in, in, in principle solves, the, uh, addresses anyway, the take-up problem. Other problems, uh, not so much. Um, previously, uh, it w so the, the white paper, um, let, me, let me put it this way, uh, a, a, a problem with these uh, single coin uh, units is that they will circulate in the countries in question. Uh, Libra dollars will circulate in the U.S., but they can also circulate in, in other places as well. So the danger of what monetary economists refer to as currency substitution, I think, is very real that people in Argentina will move out of pesos and, and into Libra dollars if the regulators there, if the Central Bank of Argentina allows them to do so. So you can see where this is headed, faced with the danger of loss of monetary control, inability to conduct monetary policy, inability to use the resources of the central bank to help finance the government when governments do, in fact, need finance. Uh, the regulators there will try to prevent uh, uh, shifting into uh, Libra dollars. That's problem number one. Problem number two, I think, has to do with uh, uh, the source and the structure of the backing for Libra. So now Libra is supposed to be 100% plus backed. Who's going to pay to accumulate all the dollar bank deposits that back Libra? Uh, people who 
purchase uh, Libra units are going to have to give uh, the Libra Association a real dollar in return for a dollar's worth of Libra. But this thing now is going to be more than fully backed, more than 100% backed. Somebody is going to have to put up the residual, whatever is over and above that 100%. That may be uh, financed by the fees that the Libra Association finances uh, for its transactions. But as you know, the higher the fees, uh, the less the use. So the fees are going to be kept low, and I think that will raise questions about the adequacy of the capital buffer. And there are lots of technical details that financial regulators worry about having to do with capital buffers. Do they uh, move in a pro-cyclical or counter-cyclical way? Do they amplify or moderate the business cycle, the financial cycle? The Libra Association, they're learning monetary economics as fast as they can, but they don't address these issues in their new white paper, I think because they haven't really uh, absorbed their importance yet. Um, there is the problem that uh, uh, Libra doesn't have a forward market. So the idea at the moment, I mentioned it before, is there will be these entities called designated dealers who will be responsible for intervening in the market, buying and selling Libra, so that its price doesn't deviate from one dollar. The problem is that the designated dealers, think of them as narrow banks, will only have so many resources, so many actual dollars to use in those stabilizing arbitrage transactions. If there was a forward market where you could um, say, if the, if the price of uh, Libra U.S. dollar rises above $1, uh, uh, the dealer would uh, um, be able to uh, sell Libra U.S. dollars on the spot market for $1 and buy it back at the forward price tomorrow. And if the forward price is exactly $1, as it should be if this thing is stable and credible, then this arbitrage, this spot market, forward market arbitrage, will push the price back to $1 where it belongs. Moreover, if th this forward market existed, other people besides the designated dealers could engage in these profitable stabilizing transactions. So every currency that is successfully pegged or kept stable around some target level uh, that's done through operations on the forward market, and uh, the Libra bros haven't figured this out yet. Finally, I think there is the problem that there is no Libra lender of last resort. Um, the Libra Association talks about smart contracts in Libra dollars and, and, and so forth. What that means is they anticipate correctly, I think, that an ecosystem of derivatives, uh, other types of securities based on Libra, will grow up around the actual uh, token or currency unit. Uh, the problem with derivatives markets is that uh, they can be illiquid. Everybody can line up on one side of them, and things can go wrong financially. And the way actual uh, currency markets deal with this, actual financial markets deal with it, is by having a central bank that acts as a, a security buyer of last resort in times when liquidity is lacking, as the Fed did in the early stages uh, of the pandemic, when it bought everything that moved that was denominated in dollars. Libra needs a central bank, in effect, if it's going to... Um, if the, the markets that grow up around it are going to be stable and uh, national governments are going to be queasy about the creation of a private Facebook uh, owned and, and operated central bank. Um, there is talk hidden in the Libra white paper about instead using gates 
rather than having a lender of last resort, they're just going to prevent you from selling your Libra or selling your Libra-related derivative securities, your smart contracts, at those times when everybody lines up on one side of the market. And who exactly, uh, Calibra or who, is going to make those decisions that you're not going to be permitted to sell what you own for actual dollars is not clear either. So uh, there are some very big uh, uncertainties, I think, that would have to be resolved in order for this uh, creation to get off the, the ground. And my conclusion remains, some of those problems are insoluble. Libra is an interesting idea that will never see the light of day. So what will uh, see the, the light of day here? That brings me to the uh, official alternative, which is a central bank digital currency, uh, a, a digital unit, a digital account, a digital wallet, a digital token that would be issued by national central banks like uh, the Federal Reserve System or the European Central Bank or the People's Bank of China. A first observation about this would be that the Fed already has digital dollars. It already has digital accounts and does digital transactions with the private sector, but it limits who can open those accounts and who can do those transactions to regulated commercial banks. Uh, so the CBDC debate is about whether the Fed should provide those accounts to other entities whether, for example, it should provide retail accounts to others, including to individuals like uh, you and me. So uh, I think the most likely scenario is one in which we all would be allowed to have a pro an individual account with a Federal Reserve Bank. This idea came up again in the early stages of the pandemic. You may recall that the U.S. Treasury had great difficulty in actually getting $1,200 checks to individuals, not all of whom uh, had a file with the Internal Revenue Service, not all of whom had a bank account. So how would they figure out how to actually get a check to everybody else? And it took them many weeks in the midst of serious economic and financial distress for them to be able to solve that problem. If we all had an account at a Federal Reserve Bank, they could, could have just credited all our accounts with a $1,200 deposit done. Um, so I think this idea is going to come back. Uh, I think it's less likely that the Fed in particular will move in the, in, in, the uh, in the direction of doing transactions in digital dollars with e-wallets, uh, issuing tokens, and the uh, the like. Um, here too, I'm skeptical about whether and how quickly uh, the Fed will move in this direction. So the Federal Reserve System, like almost every other central bank on the planet, uh, is studying uh, the possibility. And what a lot of those central banks are concluding, if you read what they write, is that it's possible that there might be modest benefits of moving in the direction of a central bank digital currency, greater uh, convenience in transactions for some people, more financial inclusion for other people who find the fees and conditions attached to private bank accounts too costly. Um, but those modest benefits are dominated by the uncertainties and risks. I think the fundamental problem from the point of view of the Federal Reserve is that uh, a, a Federal Reserve digital dollar a, a payment system where people were using digital dollars to clear all their payments through Federal Reserve banks 
would be a rich target for hackers and for terrorists. What we have now in the United States, what most countries have, is uh, a, a, a more decentralized payments and payment system where we clear our payments through thousands of different banks using debit cards. They're using our credit cards through uh, the credit card companies, using a growing variety of online platforms that you will be familiar with. So hackers and terrorists can conceivably take one of those down. But there are many others that are still up and running, presumably. And uh, that means that a, a hacker can't take down the entire U.S. Uh, uh, payment system by uh, uh, going after an, uh, uh, an individual target. So my conclusion is more likely than not this, this uh, ain't going to happen in the United States. China is where it very much uh, uh, will happen, I think. The People's Bank of China, the central bank there, is confident about its ability to maintain the security of its central bank digital currency. Uh, it's already... Uh, overseeing the two big online payment systems, Alipay and WeChat Pay, which now have to route their payments through the central bank, which therefore has oversight over uh, all those payments. The PBOC is planning to roll out its own digital wallet or token maybe as soon as this year. Will it uh, work? It's not clear that if folks have the choice of transacting with Alipay or transacting with uh, the new People's Bank of China system, they'll prefer the latter. Maybe the PBOC can regulate Alipay, if not of out of business, then maybe out of luck and cause people to shift toward the central bank system. We will see. Another question is whether this kind of thing will work internationally. So one of the advantages of the dollar is that everybody uses it in a wide variety of different countries for cross-border transactions. That's what the Chinese want to do as well, encourage cross-border use, use in other countries of their currency, the renminbi. And they see the digital renminbi as a device to that end. Um, I saw a survey, and on this observation I will conclude, of merchants in South Korea who were asked, would you consider using a digital renminbi, accepting it for, from your customers from China and whom, whomever else wanted, had it and wanted to use it. A lot of them said, we already accept Alipay, but we worry about a digital renminbi. Would it have a back door? Would it have an ID? Would it uh, be subject to the prying eyes of the PBOC? I think the answer here is that uh, a digital renminbi will be widely adopted in other countries only when China addresses those security concerns. And at the moment, China is moving decidedly in the wrong direction. So uh, I started on a note of skepticism. I end on a note of skepticism. I wish you uh, a pleasant conference. This basically allows every coder to also be a businessman. And it's a self-sovereign, autonomous, economically strong business. You heard the phrase like, the pen is mightier than the sword. Well, you know, the keyboard's gonna become even mightier than the pen pretty soon. The world in some sense belongs to coders.
started simple, a token, a symbol of hard work, of skills, for trust between people. Money was meant to be exchanged for things created and services provided. It takes many forms, both plain and shiny, honoring leaders of the past and those leading us into the future. Somewhere we lost our way. People waged wars over it, big and small, concerned more with growing interest on $244 trillion in debt than growing communities. And many people are left out, 1.7 billion invisible, left behind and underserved. But what if money were more accessible to everyone? A universal symbol for essential needs, for empowerment and connection. People, communities, entire countries prospering. What if money were all of this? What if money were beautiful? Professor Eichengreen, uh, that was a very interesting presentation. Um, it is now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, Professor Diksha Gupta from Carnegie Mellon University, the Tepper School of Business. Uh, Professor Gupta is going to present our paper on initial coin offerings as a commitment to competition. Welcome, Professor Gupta. Hi, everyone. Welcome to CESC. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to talk about my work um, at this uh, really incredible conference. So I am, um, my name is Diksha Gupta. I'm a professor uh, of finance at Carnegie Mellon University. And the paper that I'm going to talk about is co-authored with Itai Goldstein and Ruslan Cherkov, uh, who are both at the Wharton School. And we're interested um, in this paper in initial coin offerings. And we're going to talk about a mechanism where tokens that are sold in initial coin offerings are essentially a way for entrepreneurs to commit to competition and giving up monopoly rents. So there's um, an open question of what the future of initial coin offerings is going to be. Um, the ICO market really um, grew rapidly from 2016 through the beginning of 2018. There was a lot of excitement about this market. Um, proponents of ICOs were wondering if they were going to replace the big technology giants of the time, if they were going to disrupt the venture capital market. And we saw a lot of activity in the ICO market. Um, so this market really grew rapidly from 2016 through the beginning of 2018. Um, to give you just a sense of some numbers, in 2016, 52 initial coin offerings raised about 283 million, so a very small market at the time. And in 2018, really less than two years later, um, over 3,800 ICOs raised close to $30 billion. It was almost 90% of the size of the initial public offering market that year. So there's this huge flurry in ICO activity and it was really exciting. But then in the beginning of 2018, the activity started slowing down. So here I'm just showing you a graph um, from the Token Alliance, which is um, 
uh, essentially graphing the number of successful ICO projects or the number of ICO projects that raised at least $25,000 in funding. And you notice that, you know, there's this big increase in activity from 2016 to 2018, but starting in 2018, we see almost as dramatic a fall in the number of ICOs and the market virtually disappears in 2019. So the future of initial coin offerings is quite uncertain. Um, so they are, um, some people are incredibly negative about the market. They have been labeled as scams. The 2017-2018 period is described as a bubble. Um, so there's this question of, is there any future for this market? Is there a use case to be made for initial coin offerings? Or was this simply just a bubble? And in this paper, we're going we're, um, we show that utility tokens, which are essentially the bread and butter of initial coin offering markets, can improve the efficiency of two-sided marketplaces with network effects. And essentially, this is because tokens or utility tokens, the type that are typically issued in initial coin offerings, can actually help entrepreneurs commit to giving up monopoly and oligopoly rents and to um, competitive pricing of services on their platforms. So what do I mean when I say two-sided marketplaces with network effects? Um, essentially, I'm thinking about here about marketplaces which can match buyers and sellers. So you essentially have buyers who are looking to purchase a good or service. You have many sellers who are looking to sell that good or service. And this is a platform that matches the two. The idea is that to make this matching really efficient, you ideally want a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers. Right? So these are natural monopolies and oligopolies, the matching kind of matching the two because they're network effects of having sort of a large number of buyers and a large number of sellers. And a lot of sort of big companies and applications that probably we all use can be characterized as being two-sided marketplaces with network effects. So think about Uber, Lyft, Airbnb. So what is generating monopoly power here? Essentially, for matching kind of buyers and sellers, it's quite efficient to have a single platform that does this. So think about ride sharing apps. If you're looking for a ride, um, you don't want to download 100 different ride sharing applications and open up all of them when you need a ride, comparing the prices and waiting times across them. You might open one or two, maybe three, but you really don't want to look at many more than that. Um, also, it's efficient to have everyone on the same platform, right? If you have a large number of drivers and a large number of riders, when a rider is looking for a driver, it's going to allow you to match them with the closest driver and optimize their wait time. And it's going to help your drivers have constant business. They're not going to have to drive around looking for customers that often if you have a lot of riders on your platform. So ideally, in these types of marketplaces, we really want all users on the same network. The problem with this is obvious. If we have a single platform, it's going to generate monopoly power and rents. So if you only in a world in which you only had Uber relative to a world in which you had Uber and Lyft, the prices are the prices you're paying per ride are probably going to be higher if you only had Uber and you didn't have Lyft. Right? So competition is going to benefit users of products in terms of getting better pricing. So ideally, we want a single platform so we can maximize network effects of everyone being on the same platform. But we also want some competition. So we also want competitive pricing. And what we show in this paper is that this can actually be achieved through utility tokens. And the basic, um, so there are going to be three features that are important for something to qualify as a token, which can help solve this problem. It needs to be the sole currency on the platform. So if you think again about a ride sharing platform, essentially you would have a token where tokens are going to be exchanged for rides, right? So it would be essentially the currency on the platform. We require a secondary market for token sales. So again, if this is a ride sharing platform, someone who is looking for a ride is going to be able to go to an exchange, exchange their Bitcoin, Ethereum, USD, whatever have you, for that token, then take that token, pay it to the driver, 
And the driver then should be able to go back to that secondary market and exchange that token that they received as payment for their ride for whatever currency they're going to be able to buy other goods in. And the third thing we require is that these tokens are issued in a fix, in fixed supply. All three of these are um, sort of typical features of utility token and easily implementable through blockchain technology. So what I'm going to do is just run through, um, the to give you a sense of the basic mechanism, I'm going to run through an incredibly simple example, um, thinking about how tokens can help improve efficiency in a ride-sharing platform. So let's say we have two potential riders um, who are valuing the same ride, so both of them need to go from point A to point B the same time every day, and they, so they both value this ride, but they value it differently. So the first rider really cares about being able to take the ride and they value the ride at $15. But the second one cares a little bit less about the ride, so they're only willing to pay $10 for the same ride. So these two potential riders who are looking for rides, and then we have many drivers who can each provide this ride at a cost of $10 um, per ride every day. So the cost of providing the ride is $10. Now let's think about it this for a second. If we don't have a matching problem and we just had a competitive market, what would happen? Essentially, in a competitive market, because we have two people who are looking for drives and willing to pay at least the cost of what it costs the drivers to provide the ride, and we have many, many drivers, where essentially the cost of a ride is just going to be $10, right? The drivers are gonna compete with each other um, and they're gonna offer their ride for $10. At this price, both riders will be willing to buy a ride and they're going to get a ride every single day. Now, what if the drivers and the riders can't directly match with each other? So let's say we have a hypothetical ride sharing platform, RideX, which can essentially match riders who are looking for rides with drivers who can provide the rides. Now, because RideX um, is sort of handling the matching, the idea is that ride X here is going to be able to determine what price it wants to charge for each ride. So ride X could think, okay, let me charge $10 a ride. If I charge $10 a ride, which is the competitive price, I'm going to be able to sell two rides because both the riders are going to buy the ride. But then I'm going to have to pay the drivers $10 because that's their cost of providing the ride. I can't pay them anything less. They won't agree to provide the ride. So my profit in this case is just going to be zero. Alternatively, RideX could think, well, I can charge $15 a ride. In this case, I won't sell two rides. I'll only sell the one ride to the rider who values it at $15. I can pay my driver $10 and I can profit five. I can make a profit of $5. Of course, RideX is going to choose the second option. They're going to prefer to make a profit of $5 every day instead of making no profits. Um, and so they're going to charge $15 a ride, sell one ride a day, and make a profit of $5 every day. But there's an, an inefficiency here due to the monopoly power relative to what we saw in the competitive market, where remember the price was $10 and two rides were sold every day. So we essentially have a higher price per ride because of the monopoly power and less rides are going to be sold every single day. So how can a utility token help increase the increase efficiency in this scenario. So let's say right, we have a ride X token. And the idea is that uh, this is going to operate like a utility token in initial coin offering markets. So riders can buy ride X tokens on an exchange. They'll then take those tokens and pay a driver one ride X token in exchange for the ride. And the driver who gets this ride X token in exchange for the ride should be able to go to the exchange and sell their ride X tokens. Now, if ride X creates two tokens, um, let's think about what happens on the first day. Ride X has created two tokens and it owns all the tokens. So it could choose to charge $15 for its tokens on the exchange on day one. Remember, RideX is the only person who owns any tokens, so they essentially get to set the price of tokens on the exchange. If they charge $15 for a token on the first day, 
only the rider who values the ride at $15 is going to buy the token. So Ridex is going to be able to sell one token. One rider is going, the, the rider who values it at $15, they're going to go and buy this token. They're going to pay their driver the to, in the token and they're going to take their ride. Now what's going to happen on the second day? Ridex still has one token to sell, but the driver who was paid in the token on the first day also has a token that they would like to sell on the exchange. So Ridex and the driver are essentially going to compete with each other. And that means Ridex will no longer be able to charge $15 for their tokens because there's competition. The exchange price will up for each token is going to drop to $10. At $10, both of the potential riders are going to be happy to buy the tokens. They're both going to take a ride. They're both, um, and they're each going to pay their driver in the token. On day three, Ridex now has no, men, has no more tokens. It spent its two tokens. The two drivers who receive tokens on day two as payment will both sell their tokens on the exchange. Again, because there are two different riders selling their tokens, there's going to be competition and the price is going to stay at $10. So the idea here is this is different from when Ridex, remember when Ridex was working as a monopolist, it was able to charge $15 every single day for a ride. Now, Ridex can only charge $15 for a token once. So it can profit on day one, but on day two, that token is now in the hands of a driver who's gonna compete with Ridex on the exchange, so Ridex can no longer keep charging $15. The price is eventually just gonna to fall to the competitive price. The key idea here is that tokens are going to create a limited stock of market power. Each time Ridex wants to sell some tokens to monetize them, it's essentially, um, it's essentially guaranteeing that it's going to face subsequent competition. Because each time Ridex sells a token, that token is eventually going to make its way into the hands of a driver who's then going to go on the exchange and compete with Ridex. And Ridex, because of this, is only going to be able to profit from each token once. Not every consumer is going to be able to buy a ride immediately. So in the simple example I walked you through, um, the consumer who valued a ride at $10 wasn't able to start buying rides until the second day. So not every consumer is going to be able to buy a ride immediately, but eventually surplus is going to be maximized and equal to the competitive level. With everyone who values a ride at at or more than the cost of providing that ride being able to get a ride. Obviously, the full model, which is in our paper, is much more complicated. It's a lot more general. But this example really captures the key intuition of why tokens generate a commitment to eventually getting to a competitive price. Um, and so the last thing I really wanted to talk to you about is, well, why choose an initial coin offering? So the example I walked you through, it sort of makes sense that an initial coin, as if you have an initial coin offering, you might be able to disrupt a marketplace which has a monopolist. But let's say an entrepreneur has a new technology. Would they ever choose to have, should they ever choose to have an initial coin offering rather than simply operate as a monopolist? So we talk about this question in the paper quite a bit. Um, and the basic idea is that an entrepreneur may actually prefer to commit to competitive pricing through having an initial coin offering rather than operating as a monopolist. And there are a few different reasons that this might be true. Um, so again, if you think about um, you know, the example of Uber versus Lyft, um, if we have two platforms that are competing, um, users are essentially going to be split across both those platforms, right? And the fact that Uber and Lyft compete with each other likely is going to lower the price of a ride, but we're going to have this split of users across different platforms. Ideally, we'd all like to be on the same platform, but if we all chose to only use Uber or only use Lyft, in all probability, the price um, that we would be paying for rides would increase, which is why that's sort of not going to ha happen. 
But if you have this token as an entrepreneur, it's essentially going to allow you to commit to keeping the price of your service low. It's going to allow you to commit to competitive pricing, and this could credibly help you build a bigger network. Um, so this might be one reason that an entrepreneur might actually prefer to have an initial coin offering because it can help discourage entry since you've already committed to lowering the, the price of the service or good on your platform, there's not really a reason why an entrant is going to be able to get market share from you. Another potential reason, um, even if only one big company could survive, is that essentially because having tokens is gonna to allow us to get to the competitive equilibrium, total surplus um, with tokens is much higher than the surplus without tokens. Um, under a simple monopolist. So consumers may actually prefer to, they may want to try to incentivize the entrepreneur to operate with tokens by compensating the entrepreneur by sort of overpaying for tokens during the initial coin offering. So essentially, because we prefer to have competitive pricing going forward, that we want to think about creating incentives for the entrepreneur to actually choose to have an initial coin offering to begin with by sort of compensating them by you know maybe overpaying a little bit for tokens initially to essentially compensate the entrepreneur for the lost rents um, for the rents that they would lose by operating as a monopolist okay um so let me just conclude um in our paper we showed that Initial coin offerings might actually be very useful because their mechanism can help improve welfare by generating a commitment to competitive pricing. Um, we're really motivated by the fact that network effects, which is true of so many applications that are widely used these days, give rise to natural monopolies and oligopolies. And potentially, um, we think that potentially our mechanism has big applications and can help entrepreneurs with market power commit to competitive pricing and improving consumer welfare going forward. That's all I have for you. Uh, thank you so much. Professor Gupta, we look forward to having you again next year uh, at the conference. It is now my pleasure to welcome back um, uh, Professor Rod Garrett from the University of California Santa Barbara, where he's a professor of economics. Uh, professor Garrett uh, what is going to present his latest paper on why fixed costs matter for proof of work based cryptocurrency, um, which uh, has several interesting findings compared to previous paper um, on the same subject. Uh, welcome, Professor Garrett. I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present this work. My title is Why Fixed Costs Matter for Proof of Work Based Cryptocurrencies. My name is Rod Garrett from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and this work is joint with Martin Van Oort from the Bank of Canada. This paper is motivated by an event that occurred in May of 2018 when a spin off of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Gold was hacked in a rare 51% attack. Now, this was surprising to me because uh, when I was working at the New York Fed uh, several years earlier, I had written a blog post that uh, basically argued that Bitcoin, that was very unlikely that, that uh, attacks would occur on Bitcoin. I, and so I was very curious as to why this happened. And, and uh, I was uh, working at the Bank of Canada at the time uh, uh, on leave from, from UCSB and, and was speaking with Martin Van Oort. And we decided to investigate this. And we looked into what exactly happened in this attack on Bitcoin Gold. 
So just a little bit of background on Bitcoin Gold. Bitcoin Gold was born as a hard fork of the Bitcoin blockchain in October of 2017. It used a proof of work protocol that disabled the use of specialized equipment, uh, in particular uh, application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, chips for mining operations. And the goal was to achieve higher level of resilience through decentralized mining structure. Essentially, this was in line with uh, a, a comment that Satoshi Nakamoto made in, in the white paper, which is that every CPU is equally important. And this is articulated in, in, in BitcoinGold.org, which says that the goal was to bring Bitcoin back uh, to the people. So there was this general idea that uh, by having ASICs chips, mining was becoming too specialized that, that the average person couldn't mine and that we should uh, reinstate this essentially sort of somewhat democratic aspect of mining in Bitcoin gold. Well, what happened was there were several 51% attacks uh, in May uh, that occurred through May uh, 16 to 19 um, and uh, of 2018, uh, and they double spent around $18 million worth of Bitcoin gold. Now, this resulted in a loss of confidence in Bitcoin gold and uh, a large decline in the exchange rate. In fact, uh, currently, it's only one sixth of what it was at the time of the attack, and the number of transactions has declined to less than one third. So, if we take a look at this chart, uh, what we're doing here is, is time zero is when the the attacks on Bitcoin Gold began, and so you see that in, in the in the uh, days following the attack, the price fell uh, precipitously. In particular, it fell around fifty percent. And what you're seeing in the chart, by the way, is is the uh, uh, gold line is in terms of dollars, but then something might have been happening to cryptocurrencies in general. So the blue line is showing the price drop in terms of Bitcoin. So, so you can see that this wasn't uh, a general decline in, in, in cryptocurrency prices, but that it was specific to Bitcoin gold. So the question uh, is, why was Bitcoin gold subject to a successful 51% attack? Well, Bitcoin itself has not been. And what we argue in this paper is that understanding the role of fixed costs in cryptocurrency mining is crucial to answering this question and, and, and others. Uh, and so to introduce this analysis, I want to do a quick tutorial on mining. I, I believe that many people in this uh, audience will uh, know some of this, but it's, it's good to have a quick review and it's useful for articulating some of the aspects of, of what we do. So let me begin by just uh, talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, they store transactions in blocks. And what I'm showing, so here I'm showing a sequence of blocks. Uh, and these blocks represent the history of all transactions that have occurred. And here we see a new block that includes a, a payment from Alice to Bob. And in the future, new blocks will be added. Uh, and now suppose that it occurs to Alice that she would like to use the coins that she paid to Bob uh, in order to buy something from Charlie. Well, she can't because the history uh, shows that she already spent those coins. So what she would have to do in order to respend those coins is to rewrite history. So she would have to go back in time before that transaction to Bob occurred, and she could consider paying the coin to Charlie or maybe just to, just to herself, say A prime. Well, there are two obstacles to this. The Bitcoin rules uh, say, one, is that in order to create a new block, you have to solve a crypto a graphic puzzle, uh, and this requires mining power, and it's uh, uh, very difficult to do when there's a lot of mining uh, power associated with the network and you have only a small amount of that mining power. It's very difficult to be the one that successfully solves this puzzle. Uh, and secondly, the protocol says that, that uh, miners should follow the longest chain. Now, there's a literature on whether or not strategically they have incentives to do that, but we'll take that as given. Uh, so they have an incentive to follow the longest chain. So even if you're able to solve a block uh, and embed this new transaction, it, it, it will be it won't be followed. Okay. So the only way to get make it be followed is that you have to uh, uh, solve a successive number of blocks on top of that until your chain length matches the existing chain. In fact, it has to beat it. And once it does, your chain will become active, and the old chain uh, will no longer be valid. So the question is. Is it worth it? And so the uh, what we do is we look at the benefits of doing uh, this double spend. So essentially, that's going to be measured in terms of how many coins you're you're able to double spend, uh, and then also the costs uh, associated with this double spend attack. Now, what are the where do these costs come from? The costs come from the fact that miners 
Uh, when they validate blocks, they're paid uh, rewards uh, in terms of new coins uh, in, offered by the protocol, and also some uh, rewards that come from transaction fees paid by users. And so if there is a uh, impact on the Bitcoin price as a result of the attack, as I showed, or sorry, the Bitcoin gold price, perhaps, as I showed earlier, uh, then the revenue that you're going to earn from your existing mining equipment is going to drop. So there's going to be a potential loss both during the time of the attack, which I'm showing here, and there's going to be a, a potential loss that occurs after the attack. So what we have to do is we have to balance the uh, potential cost of the attack to the potential benefits. Now, there's a literature that has looked at Bitcoin mining uh, uh, in the past, and this literature doesn't capture much of what we're going to say because this lit literature has not captured the importance of fixed costs. In fact, it's focused ex exclusively on uh, variable costs. So what I mean by variable costs uh, of mining is the electricity cost, or some people have uh, factored in depreciation of equipment as a flow cost, but they don't look at the actual fixed cost of, of setting up the mining equipment. Uh, and starting the mining operation. There are some exceptions. There's a paper by uh, Eric Budish that, that um, models uh, Bitcoin mining in terms of a flow cost, but, but there's a discussion, a verbal discussion, where, where he talks about some of the implications of uh, fixed costs, and, 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 and he's correct in what he suggests. Uh, and then Pratt and Walter, uh, they do look at fixed costs in fact, there's only fixed costs in their model, but they don't uh, consider the implications for double spending attacks. So this, just by way of interest, is uh, an example of a spreadsheet used to create uh, a, a mining unit for, for Ethereum. Uh, and what it basically shows is that, you know, the cost of, this, of, the, of the graphics cards and the cost of all the other equipment add up to a total that's pretty significant relative to the electricity costs of operating the rig. And, uh, for example, uh, Pratt and Walter estimated that two-thirds of the costs of Bitcoin mining are fixed costs. Okay, so once we incorporate fixed costs into the analysis, here are some of the results. So the first result uh, uh, is this basic idea of whether or not miners make zero profit. So e economists typically uh, think of, a, of a equilibrium. And so in, in an equilibrium in a market, profits should be driven to zero by uh, uh, entry and exit. And if there are only variable costs, then that will be true. Miners will make zero profits. If the price falls, then miners will simply leave and stop mining. Uh, and so they'll always be making zero profits. Now, if we introduce uh, fixed costs, then that's no longer true. Uh, in the long run, equilibrium miners make zero profits, but exchange rate fluctuations are going to cause them to make short-term gains or short-term losses. So miners, uh, do miners lose when the exchange rate drops? Well, no, if there are only variable costs. Again, if the exchange rate drops, some people just exit. In the case of fixed costs, you don't exit right away. Uh, so some people do uh, bear losses. Uh, does mining power exhibit downward rigidity? False in the case of variable costs. True in the case of fixed costs. That is, you don't leave right away if you have uh, fixed costs. Essentially, this is the idea that once uh, the price drops, you may not be covering all your costs anymore, but as long as you can cover some of your variable costs, you continue to mine. And then this idea of what's the cost of double spending attacks. Well, the fact that you invested in a large amount of mining equipment in order to conduct your mining operation, and the fact that a double spending attack uh, lowers the value of that mining equipment makes attacks more costly. So that's another aspect that changes, and we'll talk, or I'll talk a fair bit at the end about the implications of that. Okay, so uh, before I go on into the formal analysis, I just want to say a little bit about an extension with uh, two cryptocurrency groups with transferable mining power. So I'm gonna talk it, essentially, given it, provide an analysis that treats a cryptocurrency in isolation. But of course, uh, people will realize that the mining uh, technology, the mining rigs that you build to mine uh, some cryptocurrencies can be transferred to mine different cryptocurrencies. And so we have to take that into account, whether or not that's possible. So that's very difficult with things like Bitcoin, but it's it's much easier with the type of mining rigs that are used to mine Ethereum, for example. And what we show when we consider uh, groups with transferable mining power is that re the results are unchanged when the exchange rates co-move perfectly of the different cryptocurrencies in the group. But for tiny currencies with low exchange rate correlation, uh, transferability can eliminate the protection that fixed costs provide. Okay, 
Uh, oh, also, we will will I'll provide you with some empirical results that uh, support the theory that I present. So let me now get into the theoretical model. So the main variable, or one of the main variables, is the exchange rate. So we denote that by S. So that's measured in terms of dollars per Bitcoin. Uh, and we abstract from other determinants of the exchange rate, uh, except for the fact that the exchange rate will change in the event of a successful uh, attack. There are a large literature that looks at what determines the value of cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin. I've contributed to that literature. There are many others. The mining benefits per block solved, we're going to denote by B. So that's the, that's the reward you get when you solve a block. As I mentioned, that it includes new coins, newly minted coins that you get from the protocol and transaction fees. There's a peer period cost of mining, of operating a mining unit, that's epsilon, so that's the variable cost. There's also a fixed cost F. And crucially, there's also an, an alternative use value. So th the alternative use value is what you can sell your mining equipment for if you decide to stop mining. So think about something like Bitcoin, which is uh, mined with specialized ASICs chips. In that case, if you're not mining Bitcoin, those chips are not good for much else. And so the, the V, the alternative use value, would be close to zero, whereas some uh, uh, cryptocurrencies can be mined with graphics cards. Those are typically used for gaming, so they have a, a reasonably high alternative use value. And then some cryptocurrencies could be mined with a standard CPU, so those have an uh, alternative use value that's very high, close to the original fixed cost. Uh, mining power is denoted by the variable Q. That's the total mining power that's being uh, implemented on the network at, at, at any point in time. Uh, the mining capacity is QL. That might be different from the amount that's being used at, at the moment. And then we call the mining difficulty QD. That's the total amount, in, amount of mining power that's uh, required to deliver one block uh, per, per period. Finally, the cost of capital is R. That's, that can be thought of as the discount rate. So what we do is we model the arrival of solved blocks. So remember, everybody's mining. There's a certain amount of mining power out there. They're trying to solve a process that essentially has a random success rate. And so we're going to model this as a Poisson process where the arrival rate solved by one mining unit equals one over QD. So all the mining units are equally good. N of cap T denotes the stochastic number of blocks that are solved by a single mining unit that's operating for T periods. Uh, TK denotes the arrival time of the kth block. So the uh, we can compute the expected present value of a single mining unit that lasts until period T, and that's the formula at the bottom of the slide. So the idea there is that this is uh, what's capturing the mining reward. So if you mine for, two, for, for T periods, N of T, as I mentioned, is the number of uh, blocks you're going to solve. TK is the, the arrival rate. But an expectation, um, if we uh, arrive, mine for T periods, we're going we're gonna to be successful, basically one over QD uh, times per period. And so this whole formula collapses to something quite, quite simple, right? This is just standard discounting, by the way. Um, so we get this formula, which gives you the expected present value of, uh, of operating a mining unit for two periods. Okay. So we make one simplification in the main text of the paper, which is that we just imagine that the mining unit lasts forever. So we just take T to infinity. So then that then the mining revenue that you get as B over Q minus the cost epsilon, uh, this is just a perpetuity. So it's just divided by the discount rate R, and then we subtract the fixed costs. This uh, simplification is easy to um, undo. And in the paper, we actually show exactly what happens to these calculations if we allow the mining equipment to only last for a finite number of periods. But for this presentation, I'm going to do the infinite life because it's just a little bit simpler. So it's profitable then to install new mining units until uh, the mining power in the network hits this level. So basically, the idea is that profit should be zero. And so we can solve for the optimal amount of mining power in the network that, uh, that, that, that sets these profits equal to zero. So that's our Q star. That's the equilibrium amount of mining power in the network, which depends on the fixed costs. So the standard formula that ignores fixed costs would just be missing this term. So after an adverse shock uh, uh, to the exchange rate of L percent, so we think about a so if we think about if the revenue used to be S times B, so that's dollars per Bitcoin times Bitcoins or whatever the cryptocurrency is. 
um, then we're imagining that if L was say 10%, that that uh, revenue is now only 90%. So if there's a, a 10% drop in revenue, we get 90% of the revenue. So after a shock, we're going to be out, that equilibrium condition is no longer going to, going to hold. We're no longer at zero profits, but miners will continue mining so long as they're still covering fixed costs or sorry, variable costs. So mining is still positive. Mining profits are still uh, uh, the, the, the revenue exceeds the, the, the uh, variable costs and it's not better off just scrapping the equipment and selling it for the alternative use value. Okay. So suppose we're in an, e an equal equilibrium, then we can actually solve for a critical loss, a critical percentage drop in the exchange rate, uh, at which point, at which point someone would abandon mining. And that's theta. So it depends on, uh, F through the overall type of amount of mining, and it depends on the alternative use value. So if we were to look at that in terms of a graphical picture, the idea is that let's first of all look at the case of, uh, of general purpose hardware. So you can just use your CPU to mine. That's, that's essentially the same thing as there being no fixed costs, because any equipment you have, you can just instantly sell for what you paid for it. So in this case, mining just responds immediately to any loss in exchange rate. So if the exchange rate uh, if the exchange, if there's a, if there's any kind of a loss, this is a percentage loss on the horizontal axis. Mining power just drops proportionally. Um, in other words, if the uh, the other extreme, if we look at something like Bitcoin mining, where the alternative use value of the mining equipment is zero, then there's no response to a, to to a, a, a drop in the exchange rate. So the percentage loss has to get all the way up to the point where. Uh, you're better off just stopping. You're no longer covering your variable costs at all. And then there's an intermediate case where you could sell your mining equipment for some alternative use value V that's between zero and F. So in this case, you don't respond when, when there's a loss, but once that loss brings you to the point that you're better off selling your graphics cards to gamers, you go ahead and do that. And so that same thing can be shown in terms of what's happening to the present value of your mining equipment losses in the, the drops in the exchange rate have no effect on you if you're using a CPU. The present value of your equipment is, is always the same. You can always sell it for what you paid for, for it. Uh, otherwise, it can drop as low as V or it can drop all the way to zero in the case of an ASICS chip. Okay, so what are the implications of this? Well, the implications of this picture, if I go back to here, it says that when we see drops in the exchange rate, we expect to see immediate responses in the case of either no fixed costs or cases where there's fixed costs but high alternative use value, say chips that are mined with uh, CPUs. Uh, and we expect, expect to see very little response uh, to drops in the exchange rate for chips that are mined using uh, uh, ASICs chips, for coins that are mined using ASICs chips. So we can test this empirically. And that's what we do. So uh, what you're looking at here is a regression that we ran. So uh, we, we want to look at the relationship between uh, changes in mining power, Q, we do this in logs, and changes in the exchange rate. The uh, panel unit root test suggests that the levels are, are integrated of order one, but first differences are stationary. So we run this in terms of first differences. And what, we, what would we expect from this regression? So this is the change in um, the amount of mining power that's used in the network. This is the change in the exchange rate. This is the change in the in the max. So this is looking at this is zero unless we we reach the new max during the current period t. So in the, in which case uh, um, we we see that change, and then we also include a dummy variable for whether or not there are halving halvings in block rewards. I won't go into what that's all about, but many people will understand that that the block rewards that are that are assigned by the protocol tend to uh, drop. They tend to have every certain number of uh, blocks that are awarded. So we control for that. So what would we expect according to our theory? Well, if, if, only variable, if there are only variable costs, so there are no fixed costs, or there are fixed costs, but the alternative use value is equal to fixed costs, so something like CPUs, then we would expect delta Q to move perfectly with delta S, and this term would, would be insignificant. On the other hand, if fixed costs matter, then we would expect, we would expect that, that, that the change in Q would not be responsive to changes in uh, mining power, but, the, but it would only be responsive if the changing in, changes in mining power 
sorry, the changes in mining power would not be responsive to changes in the exchange rates, but the changes in mining power would be responsive if the change in exchange rates brought you to a new, a, a new max above the old max. Okay, so he, here's what we see in the regression. So what did we do here? We look at uh, these five different cryptocurrencies. What was the criteria? Well, the first criteria was that there's at least uh, $5 million in market cap for the coin. And if there was more than one, we picked the largest coin for this analysis. We wanted a three-year history uh, of both price and mining data. No significant change in the algorithm that was used. And we also wanted to span a variety of different protocols. So the protocols that are used here are SHA-256 for Bitcoin, uh, ETHash for Ethereum, Script for Litecoin, uh, CryptoNite for Monero, and X11 for Dash. And Bitcoin is the one that uses the ASIC chip, which is the most specialized. And uh, Dash uses a, a crypto a protocol, which is a combination of a number of protocols and I think is most conducive to, say, mining with something like a CPU, whereas Ethereum and some of these others are more intermediate. Ethereum can be mined, uh, is optimally mined well with graphic cards. So this would be the intermediate case. And so the results are pretty consistent with the theory. So as I mentioned, if fixed costs matter, we only expect the coefficient on the max, on the max change in the uh, changes in the exchange rate that bring you above the max to matter. And that's exactly what we see. The, uh, the changes in the exchange rate that aren't above the max have no effect, or at least an insignificant effect. Likewise, at the other end of the, spe of the spectrum with Dash, we see that there is a, a significant variation in just the regular changes in exchange rate um, uh, with the change in mining power, and, and changes above the max are insignificant. And then, and then Ethereum is somewhat uh, mixed, but that makes, makes sense because uh, Ethereum, again, has a protocol that has uh, a, a reasonable alternative use value. Okay, so now I can move on and talk a little bit about uh, what this all has to say about double spending attacks. So the formula I have here is showing you the per mining uh, unit cost of an attack that is successful after T periods to the attacker. So uh, what we have here is we have the two components that I mentioned early on in the talk. So first of all, there's going to be impact on the mining rewards during the attack. So again, the idea is that you're going to uh, do a double spend. So you're going to send a bunch of coins to an exchange and transfer them into something else. And then you're going to begin this process of trying to solve uh, a sequence of blocks so that you can construct a chain that's longer than the existing chain that followed after you made your original transaction with the exchanges. So now during that time, there's going to be a number of blocks that are that are solved and and had you just continued mining uh and not done an attack you would have been collecting rewards for the for the blocks that you would have, would have uh solved during that period but instead you're doing all this in secret so you're not collecting those rewards and you're going to cash them all in afterwards when you have a uh when you've created a new longer chain that you can amend to the to the cryptocurrency uh blockchain but you're going to get those at a lower at a lower price because the attack will be public so there's this loss that occurs during the attack, and this is the, the loss that occurs from, from then on. So if you've done, say, in expectation, you will have done some permanent damage to the currency. And so all the mining equipment that you have that's going to mine Bitcoin from that period on is going to earn a, a lower return. Okay, There's the loss multiplied by the turn in this formula. So there's the loss that occurs during the attack. That depends on how long the attack takes. And then there's the loss that occurs from then on. Okay, so then what we have is we have a simple economic formula which determines whether or not we should undertake an attack. So on the uh, uh, left, what we have is we have a D, which is the number of coins that the attacker is able to spend. And essentially, this is just saying that, that the amount that they, they can earn by double spending coins has to be greater than the, than the cost of the attack. Okay, and then this is just that formula uh, uh, written out in long form, and this is useful because you can take a look if you if you go to the paper, you can take a look and you can see how whether or not this threshold is met. That is, how many coins you want to spend to create a double spend attack depends on the other parameters in the model. So that's interesting for thinking about, say, comparative statics or just the likelihood of a double spend of different coins. 
So th this table is the, in some sense, the summary table for this presentation, which which shows you what to make of this. What what does introducing fixed cost? How does it, that impact the way we should think about the likelihood of a double spend? And so what this table does is, if you think about moving uh, uh, horizontally, uh, so things basically in the table, they're they're getting. Um, the attack is more costly as we move to the, from left to right and more costly as we move from top to bottom. So what we're showing in the top here is the percent drop in the exchange rate. So the bigger the drop in the exchange rate that results from your attack, the more costly it is for you to attack. Again, you have also this mining equipment. If you kept using it, you would be earning an exchange rate for forever in the simplified model. But because you attack, you're, you're going to lower that exchange rate. So you're going to earn less. And these are just three possible estimates for what that drop is, 15%, 30%, 60%. So the bigger the drop, the, the, the more costly the attack is going to be on that dimension. And then on this, on the vertical dimension, it's, it's how valuable is, the, what's the value of the alternative use of the mining equipment? So if you can sell your mining equipment for 100% of what it's worth, then you don't really care if you damage the, the value. You can just sell the equipment. Um, at least you don't care in terms of the long run because you'll sell the equipment after the attack. Uh, this is equivalent to there to there being no fixed costs. If there is an intermediate use value, then you're going to take a, a hit, and then if there's no alternative use value for the mining crew, you take the biggest hit. So what we're showing in this table are the number of coins that you would uh, need to be able to double spend, and so you could think of this in the context of say Bitcoin. Um, well, we show what the parameter choices are here. So you can ask yourself whether or not those are reasonable. And in fact, there's a PDF, excuse me, PDF spreadsheet in the paper that you can use to type in your own parameter values that you think apply to a particular coin and see what the, the results are. But this is showing you the number of coins that you would have to spend in order for it to be worth it, to be able to successfully spend in order to be worth it uh, to engage in a double spending attack. So the larger this number is, the harder it is to do an attack. So for example, uh, according to the values we've chosen here, uh, in this sort of best case scenario where you're using, say, CPUs and there's only a small impact on the coin price, you would only need to use 60, spend double spend 60 coins. But in, say, something like Bitcoin, where there's a, a zero alternative use value and maybe there's a large drop, a 60% drop, you'd need to double spend 530,000 coins. So most people don't have 530,000 coins. And even if you had 530,000, uh, say, Bitcoins, you would have to find an exchange that was willing to take those from you. Uh, and if an exchange took an order from you, a sell order from you that large, it would have lots of uh, implications. They might uh, require a, a longer uh, confirmation period. It would probably have an impact on price, immediate, immediate impact on the exchange rate price and so on. So it'd be much di more difficult to do a double spend of that size. Now, what we show in the bottom table is what happens uh, when Bitcoin uh, rewards have gone to zero. So the only thing you now get from the protocol, so the only thing you now get are transaction fees. And the reason we think this case is interesting is because many people have talked about whether or not Bitcoin is doomed once rewards fall to zero, once block rewards fall to zero. And so there is a, a BIS study, for example, that, that said once rewards are zero, it could take months before Bitcoin payment is final unless new technology is employed. So the idea is that once rewards fall to zero, because Bitcoin will be so susceptible to attacks in their analysis, which ignores fixed costs, they believe that exchanges and people who accept Bitcoin will have to set the confirmation period to be incredibly long in order to protect themselves. So in other words, what we find in our analysis is that if Bitcoin rewards drop to zero, so you only get transaction fees, then in this case, where there are no fixed costs and a low impact on the exchange rate, you would only have to be able to double spend four Bitcoins in order for an attack to be profitable. In other words, attacks would be very profitable. And so you would need to extend the confirmation period drastically. Well, what our analysis says, however, is that, well, no, Bitcoin uses specialized ASICs chips. So the alternative use value is zero. So we're down on this bottom row. And so if there is a 15% or even a larger uh, uh, drop in the exchange rate, so I think if Bitcoin was successfully double spent, there would be a bigger drop in the Bitcoin price than 15%. But in any event, the idea is that 
you need on the order of, of 10,000 uh, Bitcoins in order to be willing to uh, engage in a successful double spend, even when the block rewards are zero. So this is really one of the big punchlines of the paper. And we think that there's, you know, it's, I think maybe a little bit of irony here that, that in some sense, many people have criticized uh, this movement towards ASIC mining in Bitcoin. Again, for the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that, that there's a sense in which this is, is, is not very, uh, you know, I use the word democratic. What I mean by that is that it, it, not everyone is able to participate in the mining process. But in fact, we're arguing that this special feature of Bitcoin uh, makes it safer than virtually any other cryptocurrency, more secure. So now to conclude, uh, let me just point out that what we did in this paper is we accounted for fixed costs, or we, point, we showed that accounting for fixed costs and alternative use value of that equipment is crucial to understanding both mining behavior, that is how changes in mining power vary with uh, changes in the, mining in, the, in the cryptocurrency price, uh, and we showed what the implications of this are for double spending attacks. Uh, what I call the basic truth, or what we call the basic truth, which is that ASIC mining, which involves fixed costs and a low alternative use value, reduces the profitability of double spending attacks, makes the currency more secure. Um, properties of mining hardware and the historical exchange rate path have important implications for the number of block confirmations one should require for accepting cryptocurrency payments. So that's uh, some guidance that comes out of the paper. And as I mentioned early on, our analysis extends to transferable mining power. So, so we look at this and other robustness checks in the paper. And so I would invite you to look at the paper to, to, to discover more uh, about what we have to say. So thank you uh, very much for your time. Professor Garrett, that was indeed very interesting and we look forward to further research on the matter. Uh, it is now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, uh, connecting from Sydney, Australia, Professor Richard Holden, uh, who is a professor of economics at the University of New South Wales. Um, Richard is going to be presenting his paper on the law and economics of blockchain and we welcome him back to CSC. Welcome, Richard. All right, thanks for joining us for CESC this year, uh, not in person, but remotely, as is the case uh, around the world at the moment, unfortunately. Uh, I'm an economics professor at the University of New South Wales uh, after spending about a decade in the US. And I'm gonna to present to you today a paper uh, with Anoop Milani, who's a former colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. Uh, and it's a bit of an unusual paper for this kind of talk in a sense because it's a survey paper about a relatively nascent or emerging literature on the law and economics of blockchain. Um, but it's going to provide an overview of a number of different areas of law um, and how they're grappling with, if you like, the economics of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. So the starting point for this, and I don't need to press this point too hard, I expect, with, with this audience, is that blockchain or DLT um, has a really wide range of commercial and practical applications, and that's becoming clearer and clearer over time. Um, that also creates uh, both opportunities and challenges for a number of legal doctrines that were set up and established without, those, uh, without this technology being in mind for obvious reasons. Uh, and as I said a, a few minutes ago, uh, this talk's based on a forthcoming paper which should be coming out next year in the Annual Review of Law and Social Sciences. And we want to look at a number of different subfields of law and think about how they adapt or need to adapt or are adapting to blockchain and how designers of uh, technology that utilises DLT uh, might want to be mindful of various uh, legal doctrines. So... 
Our overarching perspective is that legal rules create economic incentives that govern behaviour and economic activity. And with our economist hat on, uh, we're ultimately interested in uh, what form and uh, what level of economic activity takes place as a result of that and, and whether those legal rules and institutions can be designed in a better and more effective way to, to, to lead to more, more economic output. OK, um, now, since the technology itself is relatively new, the legal rules are playing catch up a little bit. And so some of this stuff is very much emerging. Now, I'm not going to provide references to many papers during the talk, um, but obviously the uh, actual paper itself uh, is going to be as a re as a survey paper is going to be littered with, you know, 100 odd references. So they'll be contained there. Um, I'm going to cover a few different areas of law as I as I just uh, mentioned. So the first is blockchain and the rules of evidence, uh, which is in itself a building block for thinking about the implications of blockchain for another a number of other areas of law. The second is to think about blockchain as a new contracting technology, uh, potentially a superior in some ways contracting technology and what the implications of that are in particular for an old but very, very important literature on the boundary of the firm. The third thing is to think about tokenization, ICOs, and some of the issues to do with securities law around that, which have seen, received a lot of practical attention. Uh, that leads to a related topic, which is thinking about tax law in the context of DLT. And then the last two move a little further afield, but are overarching and important areas. Uh, the, the penultimate one there is voting and election law and thinking not only about mobile voting, voting on uh, utilising blockchain technology, but also some of the broader areas around security and election law that are very important. And obviously in the United States with a very consequential election coming up uh, not too far away. And in the context of COVID-19, we're voting in, pres in uh, you know, with one's physical presence involved is dangerous and potentially impossible uh, in a lot of circumstances. That's gained increased interest for obvious reasons. Uh, and the last one is thinking about digital currencies. And I'll just touch on that really briefly. Uh, you know, there are people who are uh, far more expert in that than I, but uh, uh, there are some sort of interesting issues there about how regulatory agencies around the world are grappling with thinking about the potential for digital currencies to, to have an impact on the way that they regulate. So I'm starting off with blockchain and the rules of evidence. So if a fair, what should be a fairly uncontroversial statement is the blockchain tracks facts. Uh, now, an important and threshold question is whether those facts are admissible in a court of law, okay? And if they're, if they're not, um, that's going to have very different implications for, for instance, what can be contracted on uh, th than if they are admissible in a court of law. So the federal rules of evidence in the United States, and I apologise that even though uh, I'm recording this in Australia and uh, am an Australian, this is a rather US-centric talk. So I have a few things to say about other jurisdictions, but uh, I sort of ask for a blanket exemption for being US-centric up front. Uh, the federal rules of evidence state that non-testimonial evidence has to be authenticated, so documents and the like. Uh, and that implies that one has to show that uh, blockchain evidence is, is authentic. There's also um, a, a, another rule under the Federal Rules of Evidence, sometimes called the Best Evidence Rule, which says that you have to provide the best available evidence. Okay, and typically that's going to be interpreted as being original evidence. Okay, and so there's a real question about whether blockchain evidence is original evidence or not. There's also the issue of hearsay. So anyone who's you know a big fan of Law and Order or the Good Fight or these kinds of um, things will, will, will hear these things coming up all the all the time. And there's um, a, a famous and important test um, uh, in making determinations as to what's hearsay. Um, and the implication here is whether electronic records make an assertion by a human or whether they make it by a machine, and whether or not that's going to be hearsay or or not. Now. There's a, an, exemption, an exemption for regular business records that helps, but notwithstanding that, many states um, have passed legislation relatively recently 
to try and clarify matters and provide some some certainty. So in Illinois, for instance, uh, there, there was an act called the Illinois Blockchain Technology Act that took effect at the start of this year that permits the use of blockchain in uh, transactions and proceedings, but it needs to be accurately reproduced for all parties. So the uh, anonymity that comes with certain kinds of um, distributed ledger technology would, would run afoul in general of um, the Illinois law there, and that's got important implications, which I'll discuss later on. Um, Vermont has passed legislation. Arizona has is we as well to include blockchain records. So has Ohio and Delaware, given its uh, very important status as, as a state where many uh, businesses are incorporated is obviously important and it allows organisations to maintain business records using what it describes as distributed electronic networks or databases. Okay, so when blockchain evidence is allowed, it opens the door to some interesting possibilities. And speaking as an economist, I'd say what it allows is for more states of the world to be able to be verified. You know, a lot of what contracting is from a, an economist perspective is thinking about allocating uh, actions to be taken and payments to be made in a state contingent way or depending on what's happening. Um, you know, and an insurance contract is perhaps the canonical example of something like that. If there's an accident uh, and a loss is incurred, then um, who pays what to whom and so on. Okay, so this is going to impact on contracting opportunities, which is the next topic. Now, this, this, um, these next few slides are based on a paper that Anoop and I wrote a few years ago uh, about blockchain and the holdup problem. So that, that paper does exist. Um, uh, and uh, it makes the follow, it starts with the following observation, which has been made uh, by far more distinguished scholars before us, which is that roughly speaking, half of all of economic activity happens in markets and half takes place in firms. Now, the modern theory of the firm, which is known as property rights theory, for which Oliver Hart won uh, the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, um, highlights the value of importance of asset ownership. Okay, and what asset ownership does under property rights theory is it gives the owner of those assets residual rights of control. Okay, and what that does is encourage uh, investment that's relationship specific and it reduces haggling costs. Okay, and that for property rights theorists uh, and for the modern understanding of the boundary of the firm determines the boundary of the firm. Okay, it's about the uh, relative incentives that are provided for asset specific investments or reducing ex post frictions like haggling uh, that come from allocating the asset to different, different owners. So that's very important for determining whether firms are vertically integrated or not, or in what direction they're vertically integrated and things like that. Now, smart contracts on a blockchain like Ethereum, for instance, um, raises the prospect that more contracting tech, more, more states of the world might be able to be contracted on. If you think about that for just a moment, an immediate implication of that or corollary of that is that that's going to all else equal shift some activity, economic activity from firms to markets. If roughly speaking, one takes an economic transaction outside of the marketplace and performs it inside a firm, so it gives up on the magic of the price mechanism, but uses the virtues of the authority relationship inside a firm, then if you can do it better in a market, at the margin, some activities going to become more attractive in markets rather than firms is going to shift there. Um, now, the holdup problem to which I just referred uh, speaks to the issue of the... Um, the kind of opportunities people can, or the opportunism that contracting parties can take advantage of when some states can't be contracted on, okay? So when some contingencies like the quality of a good might be known to the contracting parties, but are hard to describe to a court of law, then um, there's going to have to be renegotiation after the fact. Now, once there's renegotiation after the fact, um, there's the possibility for haggling. And when that haggling goes on, that's going to lead um, to the benefits being split in some way and underinvestment by the owner of the asset. Okay. Now, 
Maybe it's the case that smart contracting technologies can come, go some way um, to making more states of the world contractible and therefore alleviating the holdup problem. So changing the boundaries of the firm and potentially increasing the value of total economic output. So we go into that in more detail in the paper, but at this point what I'd say is that the observation is basically this. A bunch of clever economic theorists some time after property rights theory was developed said, look, you can, instead of using a firm and asset ownership, you could write a contract that uses really smart, what are known as revelation mechanisms. If the contracting parties know, say, the quality of the good, then it'll be in neither of their individual interest to reveal that, or it won't be in one of their individual interests typically, to tell the truth to a third party like a court. But if you construct a game form or a mechanism in the language of mechanism design with just the right sequence of announcements and penalties depending on exactly what's said by both parties, then you can end up having truth-telling being a result because people fear lying because of the consequences of the punishments they'll they'll receive. Um, now, those are very, very clever mechanisms. They're not, or at least they typically haven't been seen in reality, which raises a number of puzzles. Um, and one of those um, puzzles might potentially be resolved by blockchain technology. So this commitment up front to uh, have these punishments is not what economists will call time consistent. Once a punishment is called for by the mechanism, it would be in the interest of both parties to say, why are we, why are we paying a big fine to some third party? Let's renegotiate and, and not pay the fine and keep that money for ourselves. And there should be a way to renegotiate that makes us both better off. But anticipating that, the punishments no longer serve their purpose. Um, and that's a bit of a conundrum. Now, one of the things that smart contracts can do is obviously provide both anonymity and therefore commitment power, okay? So you might not be able to renegotiate a cleverly designed smart contract as long as the parties can't make side um, payments that are verifiable by the code of the contract. Um, so it might lead to the situation where a court can't reverse uh, penalty payments um, or penalty clauses. Now, those penalty clauses are often unenforceable by courts of law. They're sometimes called liquidated damages or stipulated damages. Um, but uh, if there's anonymity through a smart contract, then those things actually may work. Now, there's lots of issues about what happens if you get the code a bit wrong and you want to suddenly reverse things and, and lots of things like that. But as a thought experiment, it's an interesting one because it raises the possibility that there may be the possibility um, of these clever mechanisms that economists introduced actually being able to be uh, used in reality. And the big implication of that is that more, trend, more economic activity might play take place in markets, in arm's length market contractual situations rather than inside firms. Moving on to tokenization and, and ICOs, there's obviously been a real proliferation of ICOs um, of, of many different types in recent years, utility tokens, asset tokens, payment tokens. The key issue for securities law is whether tokens are securities or not. If they're securities under the relevant definition, and I've extracted that here from the Securities Act of 1933, um, if they are, then they have to be registered with the SEC unless an exemption is, is provided. It also means that the inter intermediaries that deal in them need to be registered with the SEC or receive an exemption. And even the place where the tokens are sold has to be registered. So there's a, there's a large incentive for um, people involved in, in ICOs and related transactions to do with tokens to get around this and, and not have them be viewed as securities. And that's an ongoing practical debate. There's a long definition there that I won't read, but the bolded type there uh, refers to a carve out to do with an investment contract. And that becomes a very important term for figuring out uh, whether tokens are securities. So what is an investment contract? Well, the, the, um, the uh, courts of the United States decided this a long time ago uh, in a case in 1946, 
uh, all to do with something seemingly very mundane but now has broader implications, the sale of land and contract to pick oranges, sell the juice and share profits. Now, um, the Securities Act says that unless a registration statement is in effect as to a security, it's unlawful for any person, either directly or indirectly, to make use of any means or instruments of transportation or communication in interstate commerce um, or, or the mails to sell such a security uh, through the use of a medium prospectus or otherwise, okay? So the real question is, what is an investment contract? And there's many elements to the test, okay? There's uh, what the contract looks like, whether um, there's money being invested, whether it's a common enterprise, uh, either vertically or hori- horizontally, whether there's an expectation of profit or whether there's a fixed return, so whether it looks more like debt or equity in some sense, um, and whether it's done solely through the efforts of others. The key thing to note here, and it's a recurring theme that I want to come back to drawing together many of these different aspects that I'm talking about, is that the US courts, but not so much courts in other jurisdictions, typically try to look to the ec- what they call the economic reality, what has been termed the economic realities of the transaction. And that, that's very important both um, in, in terms of thinking about what is going to be in this fairly narrow instance deemed an investment contract and hence a, hence a security or not um, in the US uh, and also whether um, various other instruments are going to be going to be seen one way or another relative to existing legal doctrine. So the substance, the economic reality is very important in the US, but not um, quite so much in other jurisdictions. Okay. Um, Now, so the point that I just made there on that bolded bullet point is that design choices here are interacting with legal rules. People designing tokens, people designing ICOs uh, with tokens naturally involved in them, Um, are making design choices for economic reasons, but they're also changing or affecting at least how how their tokens are going to be viewed by the court. So if you make things more decentralised than they might otherwise optimally be, um, that might be, be good in one sense in terms of something not being considered a security, but it may be economically damaging. So there's a trade off there. Okay, so might one want to, in a sense, damage the functionality of utility tokens in order for them not to be seen as a security? Uh, Moving on to tax law, um, Anoop and I wrote a a piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago um, just pointing out that with the rise of cryptocurrencies, if they were to um, come to replace cash, which, you know, may well be the case uh, in some meaningful way, then that would give rise to a whole lot of issues to do with how things are taxed. And so, um, you know, Stephen Mnuchin, who's Treasury Secretary of the United States, said some time ago that Bitcoin could become what he termed the next Swiss bank account. But here's a slightly more sophisticated tax tax dodge, which it would be very hard for the IRS to prove. So suppose A, B and C are hypothetical electronic addresses that you own, uh, and you let the IRS know that you own A, but not that you own B and C. Okay, and you buy one, say, Bitcoin, or pick your favourite cryptocurrency at $15,000, and you park it in vehicle A or address A, expecting the price to go up. And then just a few hours later, suppose Bitcoin's gone up in value to $15,500. You'll see this can be made to work either way. You, set, you send that Bitcoin to B, and then B sends it to C. Now, down the track, when your Bitcoin, you know, say is worth $25,000, you can send it back to A and tell the IRS, uh, if you're an unscrupulous type who uh, doesn't mind lying to the IRS, I sold a Bitcoin to an anonymous counterparty B back at $15,500 and just now bought a Bitcoin from another anonymous counterparty that's got nothing to do with me. Um, unbeknownst to the IRS it does, at C for $25,000. So as a result, you owe taxes on capital gains of just $500 rather than of $10,000. And now um, the IRS can observe all the transactions between A, B and C on the blockchain, but it can't disprove that B and C are um, arm's length counterparties, okay? And so the rules in the US... Uh, that require financial institutions to verify the identities, the 
um, you know your customer rules and such, um, don't solve the problem. As far as the IRS knows, B and C could have been set up by a foreign institution that doesn't comply with those rules. So that leaves you with a bit of a conundrum. You know, do you try and ban cryptocurrencies, which might be hard and unappealing for other reasons? Um, another way of thinking what the implication of this is, it could spark a move away from income and capital taxes to more consumption or value-added taxes, for instance. So that's a live debate along with the rest of the, the tax debate. Um, moving on to the penultimate topic I want to touch on, voting and election law. Um, distributed ledger technology has already begun to be used for um, security purposes in, in online voting. So online voting is permitted under some circumstances in 32 US states now. Um, and West Virginia was the first state to permit mobile voting in a federal election in 2018. Um, now, this has the potential to increase voter turnout and also have a meaningful effect on election outcomes, but it raises important questions about security and hacking and paper trails and the very important issue of the overall integrity of elections. Now, on a slightly different topic that had nothing to do with blockchain per se, but everything to do with voter registration, a paper that I recently published um, with Roshana Bhatt and my UNSW colleague, Jenny Dechter, um, we used a natural experiment in um, Massachusetts in litigation under what's known as the Motor Voter Act, the National Motor Voter Registration Act, um, which basically requires uh, states to allow people to register to vote easily when they get a driver's license. And Massachusetts was found for a period of time to not be, not be adequately complying with that. And they had to do, serve a little penance for that by going on essentially a voter registration drive. And we were able to utilise that random event uh, alongside uh, it not occurring in nearby states to use a, a, what economists call a difference in differences and, in fact, a differences in differences in differences strategy um, to find out what the causal effect of lowering voter registration costs is on voting. And we, we found that it leads to much higher registration, which is not surprising, but the magnitude is, is large. The conditional on being registered, people turn out at the same rate. But these people um, who were not previously registered, even though this is randomly done, so it's not a, a democratic voter drive, but it does skew towards lower socioeconomic status voters um, or potential voters, they're much more likely to vote Democrat. Now, mobile voting doesn't work so much on the registration margin, but on the turnout margin. But um, one might speculate that a similar thing uh, could, could occur. And certainly that is arguably behind some of the lawsuits being pursued and that have been pursued by uh, Republic, the Republican Party and, and, um, and some of their affiliates. Uh, who have been wanting to ban even things like vote by mail and so on. And that's going to be a pretty live issue going forward. And you can see uh, why distributed ledger technology might be a, an interesting defence against the idea of there being fraud with uh, vote by mail, although there doesn't seem to be any real evidence of fraud in, in vote by mail, um, as Judge Posner uh, ruled uh, in a Seventh Circuit Court ruling a few years ago. But... Um, uh, distributed electric technology could in principle be even more immune to those considerations. So it's going to play a very important role going forward. And because it has a potential political skew, not by intent, but uh, just by implication, um, th th that's going to be a very charged issue and, and one can expect more of that going forward. And election law will have to adapt to those circumstances. The final thing I'm going to touch on is digital currencies and international law might be a bit... Uh, of an overstatement there, but aspects of uh, conflicts of laws and, and other things of an international nature. So uh, as many people would know, uh, th there's been a real movement towards the idea of private digital currencies in recent times, um, starting with the idea of uh, stable coins, um, you know, that were, were fiat back like Tether, although, again, there are issues, <laughs> uh, to put it politely, there that I won't go into here, um, and, and, and other um, commodity-backed, uh, potentially stable coins. 
But, you know, I'm thinking here of something like Libra, which would be if it were to, um, you know, reach its full potential, be obviously uh, a, a dramatically different kind of thing. I like to think of those things, something like a potential Libra as having two different components, a payments component and a currency component. So the payments component is essentially competition for Apple Pay and Google Pay. Um, you know, maybe they don't charge anything for it, but they hold on to your cash, which has value even in a very low interest rate environment. Um, uh, you're going to get zero interest, zero basis points in interest on that. They get something about the opportunity cost of it to them, which is probably positive. So that's valuable as a business uh, endeavor. There's also the currency component. Um, and this thing would have an exchange rate with, say, the US dollar or the euro or the Australian dollar or the Japanese yen. And you could imagine that that would lead to um, the, 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 if you like, the governing authority of that digital currency having the ability to dump a country's currency. And that would give it potentially significant power if it were to, to do that and the potential to extract concessions in other related businesses. Okay, so... This relates to, to a current paper of mine with Robert Akalov, who's at Warwick, and Luis Reyes at Northwestern, uh, used to be a colleague of mine at Chicago, um, uh, that's under, under revise and, and resubmission at the Journal of Political Economy. And um, there, what we show is in markets with network externalities, um, so think of the platform markets, obviously something like Uber or Amazon or Facebook or many, 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 many others where the more people are on it, the more attractive it is for you to be on it, uh, potentially on both sides of the, the market, um, can lead to a situation where you have in firms and out firms where you can have somebody with very, very high market share. They may not have a great deal of market power in that market, but they may have power in auxiliary markets. And that's very relevant for thinking about these things. Um, the regulatory implications of that are um, that the whole transmission mechanism and therefore functionality of monetary policy could be under threat from this. There are questions about what reserve requirements might be required, whether something like Libra would be considered a deposit-taking institution and subject to that, that um, type of regulation, whether there'd be tax leakage, uh, you know, what powers the SEC might have, whether a, one of these proposed digital authorities might have power to regulate. So many implications which many people have discussed. And in, again, in the paper, we'll go into that in a lot more detail and really just giving you a flavour of the topics here. So I think the perspective that we take is that there's a meaningful and important interaction between legal rules and distributed ledger technology. The design choices that affect, um, that are made affect the legal position of these, uh, of these contracts and instruments and objects and vice versa, the legal design affects how, how the instruments are designed. Um, what uh, distributed ledger technology does and how it's treated by the law essentially co-determined, and that's important to keep in mind. Now, uh, in the US, uh, the general approach is to look at economic substance. Uh, that's in no small part a consequence of the law and economics movement, which people like um, Guido Calabresi and Dick Posner really pioneered uh, in a sense, on the back of Ronald Coase's very important contributions um, for the last, you know, over the last four or five decades. Um, that's very far from the general approach in other jurisdictions like in Western Europe or my home country of Australia. That presents its own challenges and its own opportunities, but I think this is an area where this co-determination of the design of these technologies and the design of legal rules and instruments is going to be terribly important. Thank you for your time.
Richard, um, it is now my pleasure to present our last speaker for this year, this year economic stream at CSC, uh, Professor Hannah Halaborda. Uh, professor Halaborda, uh, she's a professor at New York University Stern School of Business, and she's going to be presenting our paper on smart contracts, IoT sensors, and efficiency. Welcome, Professor Halaborda. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present my research. My name is Hannah Halaburda. I'm from NYU Stern, and I'm presenting a research joint with Yanis Bakos, also from uh, from NYU. Uh, we, uh, we, we talk about smart contracts, uh, connected uh, internet sensors, and efficiency of contracting. Um, the... Uh, the interest in blockchain technologies has been closely tied to the promise of smart contracts to change interaction, business interactions, and making the business landscape more decentralized and democratic. Uh, smart contracts themselves uh, go back earlier than Bitcoin's blockchain. They go back to uh, the concept was de defined by Nick Shabo in 1996, where he presented now seminal Carly's example. In that example, a buyer or um, a buyer of a car who is paying in installments or leasing a car, when a payment is missed, smart contract will automatically lock the car and uh, transfer the control rights to the bank. With uh, that automated um, control, uh, uh, control transfer, the bank may be willing to make uh, loans to population that uh, can we start over? Ariel? Yes, yes, we can, we can, we can. Um, yes, hold on. Oh, I... Sorry, I... okay. Thank you very much for opportunity to share this research. I'm Hannah Halaburda from NYU Stern, and this is joint research with Yanis Bakos, also from NYU Stern. Uh, the uh, huge interest in blockchain uh, is closely related to the promise of smart contracts to change interactions and uh, make the business landscape more decentralized and democratic. The concept of smart contracts uh, themselves is uh, comes from earlier times than Bitcoin's blockchain because it goes back to 1996 to Nick Chabot Shabu's definition of smart contracts and the uh, uh, first example, the mo now most seminal example of a car lease, uh, where a, a buyer of a car, uh, upon missing, if uh, the, the buyer of the car misses a payment uh, on a car, uh, then the smart contract automatically locks the car and transfers the control over the car to the bank. This uh, automation of uh, automation of uh, of control transfer may uh, change uh, the relationship between the uh, the bank and the and the uh, lenders. Now, the the examples of how smart contracts can be implemented and implemented and how they can change the business relationship have multiplied over the past uh, decade. And it has been said that the smart contracts will make contracting complete. They may allow us to get rid of courts because of the automation. They may allow us for, uh, allow us to get rid of costly escrow and other trust trusted uh, enforcers. And they may uh, enable complete decentralization, for example, through decentralized autonomous organizations. So there is a great promise in smart contracts. What we have set out to do is to analyze what are the benefits of smart contracts really. And for that, uh, we built a model where we distinguish the benefits of smart contracts from other technologies. So a smart contract is a, basically a computer program where upon a trigger, it automatically executes an agreement between the two parties to the contract. And the key characteristic that we are going to draw upon is that it does not allow uh, a reneging because it is automated. So once the contract is smart contract program is set in motion, then the parties cannot uh, withdraw from it and they cannot change their uh, their actions. <clears throat> One of the most important um, 
limitation is that the trigger and the agreement in the definition of the smart contract needs to be uh, well-defined and they need to be digital because the both the trigger and the execution of the smart contract is digital, so at least digitally controlled. So that means that not every agreement lends itself to smart contracting. We are going to focus on the, the ones that, that do lend themselves to smart contracting, but the fact that the, there is a that smart contract needs this digital input is crucial to our analysis. Very often, the digital inputs come from sensors that only need to be installed. They are not readily ever available. So this is where the connected sensors or Internet of Things sensors come into play. And in many examples, in fact, in most uh, prominent and most promising examples of application of smart contracts, there is a, the, the effect of smart contracts and the sensors have been confounded. So even in the example of the car lease that comes from Shabo, what we need for the smart contract to work is a, a sensor or a, 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 an automaton in the contract that is going to control the control over the car. You can't just write a program without a connection to the car that would make uh, that, that would uh, transfer the control rights to the bank. There needs to be a sensor to do that. So we recognize that the sensors and smart contracts are different things. There are different technologies. And uh, we set out to, uh, by building a simple model, to separate the effect of smart contracts and sensors to see which technology brings how much benefit in different situations and whether we need both of them or just one uh, in different circumstances. What we realize is that sensors, when they are implemented, they expand the space, the state space, which means we can write more detailed contracts over many more variables because now those variables are very visible and verifiable. Smart contracts restrict the strategy space. They restrict certain actions that the parties can take. Those have very different consequences on the efficiency of a contract. So we are going to uh, use a, a, a simple model of a simple um, example of a fruit shipment. So we are going to have two firms, a fruit firm and a transportation firm, that contract over transportation of a perishable good, fruit. So uh, fruit, if it's uh, shipped in properly refrigerated conditions, uh, brings a high value to the fruit company, but it also costs um, a lot to, uh, to ship it in refrigerated conditions. When the fruit is not refrigerated, when it's shipped, then it brings lower value to the fruit company, but the transportation company can do it at a lower cost. We, uh, we assume uh, that it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it, it brings higher value to uh, refrigerate the fruit and, uh, and ship the fruits refrigerated, so the difference between the value and the cost is larger than when the fruit is not refrigerated. But it is still worthwhile to trade and to ship the fruit even if it is not refrigerated. Now, what is important what, and what we are going to draw upon is that the fruit company does not see immediately upon delivery of the fruit whether the, uh, the fruit was refrigerated or not. It often turns out a couple of days later when the fruit goes bad on the shelves because before it was sold or, uh, or needs to be sold at a discount, uh, but it's not visible right away. Uh, when the fruit is not shipped, both par parties obtain zero. This is a benchmark case. An important element of our model is that once they have an agreement, if uh, something goes wrong and the, uh, the dis a dispute is brought to a court, then both parties have a cost of taking the legal action. We are making uh, simplifying assumptions uh, here that the cost is going to be the same no matter who's, uh, who initiated the action, no matter who wins. And we're going to also assume for simplicity of the argument right now that the courts are always fair and, uh, and that they, can, they always have the ability to enforce the, the contract terms in full. 
uh, the model can be modified to uh, incorporate other uh, uh, other uh, uh, mod uh, other modifications or other aspects. But we want to bring out the main idea of what is the difference between the smart contracts and sensors in this uh, situation. So in this initial situation, before bringing any additional technology, smart contracts or um, sensors, the refrigeration is not observable uh, to the firm company, nor is verifiable to court. Therefore, the contract cannot be written, uh, taking into account whether the fruit is refrigerated or not. What is visible and verifiable uh, is whether a payment has been made and whether the fruit was delivered at all. So we are going to assume that the, there is already some information that is available and uh, we would need sensors to bring in more information. So the game in an, its extensive form uh, is represented in this tree. So what, uh, what we see is that the transportation company upon um, assigning the contract has a choice of, uh, the, of providing low quality delivery, which is without refrigeration, high quality delivery with refrigeration or no, no delivery. If the fruit is delivered, now the uh, fruit company can pay according to the contract or they can renege and not pay at all. If they do not pay, the transportation company can bring the, uh, the case to court and uh, either, and, and if it takes the, the, uh, the case to court, then incurring the cost lambda, after incurring the cost lambda, the terms of the contract are enforced. So in this initial, uh, uh, initial case, without any additional technology, what we see is that trade, trading is never efficient. So one thing is that if the legal costs are really large, then there is no contracting. And this is because the transportation company, if it shipped the fruit and it did not uh, receive the payment, will not find it worthwhile to, to go to the court because the payment they are going to receive will be lower than the legal costs. If so, they are not going to go to court if they are not being paid, knowing that the fruit company is not going to pay upon delivery, knowing that the transportation company is not going to deliver the fruit and they are not going to sign the contract. And even when contracting is occurring, uh, then if the legal costs are low enough that the contracting is occurring, because the fruit company cannot pay more for uh, high quality delivery and less for low quality delivery, then the quality of delivery always will be low. Uh, now, in this situation, if we add smart contracts, we uh, would hope that maybe smart contracts would solve the problem. It turns out that they solve a problem, but only partially. So let's assume that we are adding smart contracts to the situation we already have. So a smart contract is going to uh, automatically uh, uh, create payment uh, from uh, the fruit company to the transportation company upon delivery, because both delivery and the payment is verifiable. So now the fruit company no longer has a choice between pay or not pay upon delivery. So the, the, trick, the, the game tree looks differently because now these strategies are removed. And if these strategies are removed, now every time it is beneficial to trade, there will be trade. However, so we, we gained some, uh, we gained some, uh, uh, some, some space where the contracting is happening and it would not have been happening before. Now, what does not happen if we just add smart contracts is the uh, higher quality of delivery. There is no reason for the, uh, sh for the transportation company to provide a refrigerated delivery just because the payment is done uh, automatically. So that the, there will be all, still only low quality delivery provided. Now, if we add sensors, but only sensors, without smart contracts, then the sensors may allow us to dis distinguish between refrigerated or not refrigerated uh, shipment. So what we imagine here is a type of temperature sensors that are, uh, are put in uh, within a transportation, uh, uh, transportation package or close to the fruit or in the, in the container, and they 
register the uh, the temperature, and they can show upon the uh, delivery or maybe even earlier whether the, te the temperature has exceeded the limits, the uh, the accepted bound. And if it has not accepted, uh, if it has not uh, exceeded accepted bounds, then it is considered to be high quality delivery. And it, if it has exceeded, then it is a low quality delivery. With that, uh, we are, now we are able to write a contract that is going to pay different price uh, if the delivery is high quality and a different price if the uh, quality, the delivery quality is low. With that, uh, in equilibrium, we are going to get a high quality delivery when delivery occurs, because there is, it is possible to write a, a, a contract that gives proper incentives. So this is a nice improvement. But just having smart contracts is not uh, taking away the problem that if the price that the transportation company is going to receive for high quality delivery is exceeding the legal cost, then again, the transportation company is not going to seek legal action if it's not being paid. Therefore, fruit company is not going to pay. And therefore, transportation company does not want to um, uh, sign the contract in the first place. So why the sensor, while the sensors are increasing the quality of delivery, uh, they are not improving on the region where contracting is not happening because legal costs are too high. Uh, so they make trade efficient when the trade occurs. Now, if we add both the smart contracts and the sensors, then we can write a more detailed contract that is distinguishing between the refrigerated and unrefrigerated uh, delivery. And at the same time, we can uh, eliminate the possibility of fruit company reneging and not paying, because now the payment can happen automatically upon the reading of the sensors. With that, we are uh, achieving efficient, uh, efficient trade for all parameter regions. So while each of the uh, technologies could not fully achieve this efficiency for any parameter, uh, par parameter set, then uh, together they can achieve this efficiency. So there is some there is complementarity. So what we have shown with this simple game is that uh, the, the fact that smart contracts and sensors affect the interactions in the contracting differently, they have different effects on the outcome of the contracting and whether the contract is signed in the first place. So sensors increase the state space over which the parties can contract because they give more information. And smart contracts reduce the strategy space. They eliminate certain actions that the parties can take. So they can be... Uh, what is important is that they can be implemented separately. They don't have to be implemented together. And implementing each of those, those technologies bring different benefits. And of course, they have separate costs. So what we are seeing from this, uh, uh, from this summary table here is that smart contracts, when we implement smart contracts, we are extending the possibility where extend, extending situations in which the contract is signed at all. But if we add sensors, then we are going to uh, improve the quality of the service when the contracting happens. So they have, those two technologies have different uh, results, different effects on the, on contracting. Now with that, we actually can say more about whether it is beneficial to adopt one of the technologies, the other technology, or both of them together. And they may, it may not always be uh, best to implement both, and may not always be beneficial to implement smart contracts or to implement uh, the sensors. So um, what, uh, what is beneficial depends on the cost of implementing uh, smart contracts, cost of implementing the sensors, and the legal costs. The legal costs are the driving force here because this is where smart contracts are, the automatic execution in smart contracts is playing uh, a big role. So what we find is that under some conditions, 
adding second technology brings no benefit. When we have smart contracts, then uh, Internet of Things is not adding anything. And if, the, uh, if we have sensors, then smart contracts are not adding anything. And in other times, it is beneficial to implement one technology only if it makes sense to implement both. So one of them uh, in itself is not adding benefit, only together. So it is uh, important to see uh, under what conditions we get different, uh, different results. Um, so first of all, if the legal costs are relatively low, are actually medium uh, in this graph, if the legal costs are very low, it never makes sense to implement smart contracts if the smart contracts uh, are costly to implement because they do not bring additional ef uh, efficiency in contracting. However, if the smart contracts are um, medium between, then it may, may sense, make sense to implement smart contracts, but only without the sensors. Whereas for region, when it makes sense to implement the sensors, then uh, adding smart contracts is not adding any more value. So bearing the cost of adding smart contracts uh, would actually be detrimental to the, to the surplus because it would be bearing the cost without any additional value to the, to the trade. Whereas if we have large, legal, uh, large cost of legal action, then there are regions when it makes sense to implement smart contracts only. But if implementing sensors is not too costly, then it makes sense to implement sensors, but only if we can do it together with smart contracts. Only if it makes sense to bear the cost of implementing both technologies together. For large legal costs, implementing just sensors is actually not adding any, any value. It's not improving and improving the trade. So this is for social efficiency. This is when it would be best for the for the trading benefit, overall trading benefit, to implement one or both technologies. But it may be different than the in, individual incentives to adopt. So while it while the the, the surplus created by uh, implementing these technologies can be divided between uh, the two parties. How the surplus is divided depends on their bargaining power, relative bargaining power. So now it turns out that in some cases, like for example, for smart contracts, when the transportation company has low bargaining power and we have low legal costs, the fruit company will have incentive to impose smart contracts, which are not necessary. They would bring no overall benefit to the, to the trade surplus. There would be an additional cost of implementing smart contracts. But by implementing smart contracts, the fruit company can extract more surplus from the transportation company. So they will have incentives to go for a social less efficient uh, uh, action, and in fact, to implement more technology that, than, is opt uh, than is socially optimal. And also, if uh, transportation costs has low bargaining power, they may be worse off with implementation of sensors. So, uh, so, so it will increase the overall social surplus, but it will decrease the price uh, or the, 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 the price versus the quality of the service provided uh, that the surplus that the transportation company uh, gets. And if we account for the fact that the individual incentives to adopt may go contrary to the social incentives, especially in the context of sensors, we may understand the incentives to sabotage sensors if they are implemented, even though uh, sabotaging sensors could destroy the uh, the social surplus. So uh, the the last point is actually the subject of our next project. And to summarize this project, uh, we have uh, right here we have built a model to carefully separate the effects of smart contracts and uh, connected sensors, uh, and. Uh, 
uh, we recognize that sensors increase the state space over which we can contract and smart contracts reduce the strategy space. So the actions that the, that the uh, parties can take. And with that, they have different effects on the efficiency of the contract. Uh, and as they have different effect on the efficiency of the contracting and they have different costs of implementation, we derive conditions where it is socially optimal to adopt one of the technologies or both of them together. And later, we also analyze the incentives to adopt. And we show that even though the technologies may be socially optimal to adopt, there may be one, uh, one party that will either oppose or will lose on the implementation of, uh, of the technology, which may lead to sabotaging it. So with that, let me thank you. Uh, and I look forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Laborda. A very interesting topic and definitely something that a lot of enterprises should think about. And with that, uh, we are concluding this year CSC 2020 economic stream. Thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we look forward to hosting you again next year at CSC 21. Thank you everybody. Good night.